I'd like to call the meeting to order, please. Good morning, Mayor Bertina, morning. council members, members of the public and staff. Um, I have to read this first. Members of the public are advised their meeting is webcast live by the City of Hamilton, temporarily archived on the City's website. Other individuals and the media may also be audibly and or visually recording this meeting. Mr. Clerk, any changes to the agenda? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, there are two added delegation requests, one from David Adames and uh, one from Sarah Mayo, uh, respecting item 5.1, Rapid Ready, Expanding Mobility Choices in Hamilton. We have a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Councillor Ferguson, Councillor Pearson, all in favour? Thank you. Any declarations of interest? Seeing none. Delegation requests. We have a motion to approve a request from David Adames. Uh, respecting 5.1 5 rapid ready expanding mobility choices in Hamilton PW 13014 citywide for city, today's meeting and the rules of order be suspended in order to allow the opportunity for presentation be provided at today's meeting. Okay. Councilor Pearson second by Councilor Ferguson. All in favor? Thank you. And 3.2 may I have a motion to approve the agenda request from Sarah Mayo respecting 5.1 rapid ready. Rapid Ready Expanding Mobility Choices in Hamilton, PW 13014, citywide for today's meeting and the rules of order be suspended in order to allow the opportunity for the presentation to be provided at today's meeting. Moved by Councillor Collins and seconded by Councillor McCaddy. All in favour? Thank you. We now have before us item 5.1, Rapid Ready. I'd like to invite staff to come on down and present before the committee. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And Don, if I may, for one moment, please, could everybody shut their little uh, trinkets, toys off, uh, electronic gadgets to, so they don't operate or make noise, please? Serves the meeting. So, Don, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, members of council. Um, I'll start it with, uh, with an apology. This is a very long presentation. It's about 83 slides, but I think given the, the uh, significance of the topic, uh, it's uh, hopefully time well spent, Mr. Deputy Mayor. The, 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 the day will be broken down, at least the presentation, into four segments, and if you wish, we can stop after each segment and take questions. The uh, first segment will come from our city manager, Chris Murray, who will give uh, a regional and corporate perspective on uh, what we're here to talk about today and how uh, transit and transportation fits into not only the broader context of, of Council's uh, strategic, uh, strategic priorities, but also into the, uh, the broader context of the region overall. And then following that, we'll come back to uh, Hamilton and Christine Newball will provide a presentation on how, again, this initiative fits into the broader planning uh, context of the overall city of Hamilton. And then Dr. Tran is here to speak about the connection to public health. We've long acknowledged the connection to social and environmental well, with respect to transit uh, and, and public transportation. Uh, more recently, uh, we've seen the connection of public transportation to uh, the success of economic development, and even more recently, we're seeing the connection between public transportation, how it could mitigate the uh, uh, potentially mitigate the uh, the cost of public health. So without any uh, further, actually maybe one thing before I turn the mic over to, uh, to the city manager, Mr. Deputy Mayor, a lot of people have set aside uh, time and uh, aside from their regular work plans and, and, and frankly uh, have done double duty or uh, set their work plan aside entirely. We really only have one and a half staff dedicated to this file, but it took uh, 15 or 20 folks to, uh, to pull this together. Our, Head of, uh, of Mobility and Special Programs, who really was the project lead on this, uh, Christine uh, Lee Morrison. Justin Redman is our Rapid Transit um, Manager. Uh, Jim Doms is uh, Head of Planning at the HSR. Jo George Brovac is uh, heads up our Specialized Transit Program. Andy McLaughlin, who works in the planning at the HSR. Kathy uh, Milijanovic, who is a, uh, an analyst at the, uh, is an Applications Analyst at the HSR. Doug Murray heads up uh, the HSR fleet. Uh, Carol Wilderman heads up our IT. Uh, Daryl Bender, our cycling program. Uh, Trev Trevor Holson Horlsenberg, uh, our active transportation. We'll hear some more about his work later. Carla Ap Ippolito splits her time between um, the, uh, this initiative and the Pan Am Games. Peter uh, Topolovic heads up our transportation demand management program. That's kind of a new terminology for us. We'll hear a little bit about more, that more later in the program. Uh, Larissa Skripniak and Al Kirkpatrick head up our transportation planning. That's one of the, the newest programs that, that's been consolidated with the, uh, 
the rest of the public transportation program. Uh, Steve Malloy heads up our, our um, a pedestrian mobility plan. We're going to hear a lot more about that in the coming months. And Christine Newbold is here to talk about uh, this initiative in context of the overall city planning. And then Dr. Tran is here to talk about the integration of uh, public transportation with public health and how that can mitigate the costs on an ongoing basis for public health. With that, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor, I'll turn the mic over to Chris Murray. So well, I have Councillor Collins and Councillor Marilla, but we discussed this previously. We've got four presenters here today. Uh, do you want, as you go with at each slide, ask questions? Or do you yeah, want to? I was going to ask, Mr. Chairman, we have a number of documents and there, there are going to be a number of presentations. I'm, I'm not sure how you want us to treat the, the questions because there's a lot of information in front of us. Do you want to wait till the very end until everyone has concluded or do we go speaker by speaker? We're going to do speaker by speaker. I that's think it? that's the proper way because we can get lost because a lot of information be exchanged. Yeah. Council Marula? You're good? Okay, thank you. Thanks, hey, Chris, the floor is yours. So you, Deputy Mayor, and certainly have to, uh, aside from just the staff that have been named here, obviously Don Hall has taken on a responsibility uh, to shepherd this thing to this day and uh, have to thank Don for all of his efforts here. And as Don said the other day, uh, the last 18 months have been a tremendous learning opportunity for him. I mean, if you met the Don Hall of 18 years ago and compared him to the Don Hall of today, uh, there's a, there's a, a remarkable uh, a progress that he has made. And he's done such a great job serving this community and trying to promote transit. And, uh, and to hear Don on the radio talk about you know, the health of our community and the importance of our neighborhoods and the role of transportation and the role of transit and everything he's been doing, uh, you know, I have nothing but the greatest respect for what he's done for us. And so have to thank him. Um, with that, um, I'm very pleased to be here. As Don has pointed out, we have a, uh, an action-packed agenda here to present to you, and, I, and it is important to ask questions at the end of each presenter's uh, presentation. Uh, I'm here, obviously, as your city manager, but I'm also here as, a, as an urban planner. Uh, I'm also here as someone who has spent many years in the transportation field, and for those that know or don't know, uh, in my consulting days, I was seconded to go transit. So uh, I've got a sense of what transportation planning has been and what it needs to be. I certainly have a, a better sense of uh, how our community can benefit. And, and really, this is, a, uh, I don't know if there's excitement in the room. There should be excitement in the room. This is an important milestone for the city of Hamilton, not just in terms of what's going to happen in the next few years, but for the next several decades. Uh, what we're going to present to you, I think, is uh, uh, some very specific ideas as to what it is that's going to help us uh, become uh, even better than what we are already today. So with that, I'll be providing the introductions and the, uh, uh, or the regional and corporate strategic perspective. As pointed out, Christine Newbold will be setting the planning context. Uh, Dr. Tran, in terms of, will give you some information about public health and the importance of it and as it relates to transportation. And then Don will come back and get into the specifics of, uh, of the Rapid Ready report that you've seen. But let's remind ourselves why we're here today. Uh, you'll recall the meeting that we had back in October 2011 where essentially what we asked you was to give us the green light to complete our homework. And so to complete uh, uh, the, uh, the, the requirements that are outlined in the contribution agreement, so agreement deliverables, project benefit and costs, as well as additional technical, uh, technical studies and complete the nodes and corridors planning work that we had commenced. And that uh, as well, you wanted us to come back with, uh, you know, with all the details that uh, were required to complete and uh, be able to talk to you about what does this mean from a capital cost and operating perspective. And, and that's what we're here to do today. And as we said back then, we were going to complete all of our work as it related to LRT, but also look at this as an opportunity to talk about other transit initiatives that uh, should be given uh, as much importance uh, to help us grow this, this great community of ours. So just, uh, I know you and you appreciate when we give you timelines uh, or we give you milestones and uh, some sense of what kind of decisions we need to make. And so uh, with that, this chart here, uh, we're here today to uh, hopefully uh, present and receive direction uh, to submit the Rapid Ready report to Metrolinx as a comprehensive transportation funding package as well as to direct 
uh, direction to use the Rapid Ready work plan as the basis for future budget submissions. So that's what we're hoping we will we'll be able to uh, uh, convince you of today. Uh, in March 20th, you're going to have a report from um, uh, Mike Zagarek uh, regarding the uh, Metrolinks funding tools. As you know, uh, there's a number of meetings that are going on right now where Metrolinks is talking to municipalities right across the GTA in Hamilton uh, about uh, options for, for funding the $35 million, billion dollars, sorry, that uh, remains outstanding. And, uh, and so that that's work is going on and Mike will be presenting um, uh, results of that and his thoughts on March 20th. All of that, though, leads to what's going to happen, hopefully, in May and June, uh, barring any election or anything else. But we're hoping that the province is going to make a decision uh, at that point in time in terms of all the, uh, uh, the major projects that are in front of it, uh, and not uh, least of which will be ours. And uh, they'll review our submission and start to make some decisions as to whether or not they're going to support what we put in front of them. Um, and so after that, uh, there may be, subject to what happens in May and June, uh, there may be a requirement for us to start to look at our own capital program and what might have to fit into that uh, in order to support the work you're going to hear about today. So everything has a context and uh, not least of which our strategic plan, which was approved last year, Priority One, Prosperous and Healthy Community. I've highlighted here, improve the city's transportation system and interregional connections as a, a direct connection to what we're going to talk to you today about. But really, if you look at some of the other points here, they all relate to what we're talking about. This is about building healthy neighborhoods. Kid yourself not. Uh, this is about the, the future of our economy. Uh, transportation has a direct link to our success. So uh, it's more than just simply putting a transportation system in front of you. It is about the way in which we grow this community of ours. In terms of uh, another direct connection to the strategic plan under priority three leadership and governance, very clearly we said in terms of government relations that we we're going to focus on a number of things, one of which was going to be transportation. And again, there's a need for us to focus on interregional, be it go transit, as well as within the city of Hamilton, how we move people around. So that's what we have in front of you. And so it's going to be important that we uh, communicate very clearly to the province what our needs are. Challenges. Now, you know, there's a song by the Bare Naked Ladies that goes about, you know, if I had a million dollars. Well, in this case, if I had a billion dollars. And, uh, you know, if I had a billion dollars, you know, how would I spend it to create the greatest amount of benefit for the city of Hamilton? And certainly we all know that we have aging infrastructure. So we could be spending an additional $200 million a year for the next 10 years just to get caught up and have our infrastructure in some kind of sustainable repair. We all know that aging population is, uh, is a critical issue for us. We know that we have to do more in terms of seniors care and programming. And so there's, uh, that's another area that we could certainly invest heavily in. Affordable housing, uh, the condition of our buildings, our housing stock, as well as the amount of it, uh, the, in, the needs are going to increase, we know that. And uh, so certainly uh, a national program on affordable housing is uh, long overdue. We've talked about living wage and what it means to give people the dignity of being able to make their own choices as to how they spend money, but certainly having enough to cover their, their basic needs is important. Healthy neighbourhoods, as you know, we're all well on the way in terms of uh, uh, sitting down and understanding the needs of our, of our residents that uh, find themselves uh, in neighbourhoods that they would like to see improved upon. And then, of course, the, uh, as we heard actually just the last week, late last week, Don, uh, his presentation uh, to, uh, to the committee about uh, uh, you know, the investment or lack of investment that's been made in public transit. Don McLean, I think, was quite... Uh, clear in terms of uh, his concerns and I know many of you share those same concerns in terms of uh, what it is that we need to have a successful transportation system. So there are a variety of things here but we're here to talk today about the offer that the provincial government is making in terms of help with transit. So that's an important offer and one that I think we need to, uh, uh, to seize uh, and, and make sure that we get our fair share. Just want to show you a few things here just to stress the point of uh, of uh, the demographics. So in 2001, 14% of our population was 65 and over, 2011, 16%, and by 2031, which is our planning horizon, 21% uh, of our population will be 65 or older. 
Um, I enjoyed the presentation that we had last week, I think it was last Monday, uh, when it was Ryan that was talking about uh, the, you know, the younger generation, the generation of entrepreneurs that are coming along and their transportation needs are, are really fundamentally different than maybe mine was. I, I couldn't wait till I was 16 to get my license. Uh, kids these days aren't so much concerned about getting their license, they're expecting a transit system that works and works for them. Um, and we're going to be hearing about bike share and a bunch of other things, but I mean, clearly there's a, there's a different view in terms of how people get around uh, from, from that generation, but also from those that are 65 and old, older. Uh, increasingly, we are going to have to make sure that the service that they receive, whether it be in the lower city or the, the mountain or all around this community, uh, is adequate to meet the needs of the people that continue to pay the taxes. So uh, I think this growth or this trend is an important trend. 21% is a huge number to have to keep in mind. Provincial projections, as you all know, our official plan is uh, meets the needs of, uh, of growth to the year 2031. That is consistent right across the province. But as you know, in, in the, the midpoint of last year, the province did indicate uh, what its projections would be in terms of population employment extending out to 2041. And so what you see here in Hamilton is growth that's occurring. I would say significant growth is being slated for this community. Uh, in the 10 years that follow 2031. So in this case, we're talking in terms of population going from ultimately 660,000 people to 780,000. Uh, as well in terms of jobs from 300,000 jobs to 350,000 jobs. Um, there's a reason why I think Hamilton is expected to, to do well in terms of growth, uh, as is all of Southern Ontario, but I'd say in particular Hamilton is because of the very things that you're seeing happening today. People are coming here for good reason. Uh, it's not just our geography, it's our housing prices, it's our diverse workforce, it's a chance to kind of grow their businesses in a community that's going to open its arms and accept their business. So this is an important thing. So, I mean, it sets the stage to say that Hamilton is going to grow. It is expected to grow according to the province. How it grows, I think transportation will be key. And so with that, I just want to give you maybe the broader context here that we all have to keep in mind as we think about Hamilton and how it's going to uh, unfold in the next several decades. And this map shows you very clearly where the Golden Horseshoe is relative to uh, the major centers that uh, tremendous amounts of economic activity take place here in North America. So you can see the position of Chicago relative to Toronto, relative to Boston, New York, Baltimore, Washington, and so on. I mean, we are in the middle of a huge economic region. In fact, the GTA represents an incredibly important economic corridor. And we play a vital role in that corridor, as this next diagram will show you. I just want to point out a couple of things. You can see Sarnia, Windsor, Niagara. Those are the three border crossings of the 119 border crossings that are in this country. Those three border crossings represent 60% of all the trade that takes place between Canada and the United States in terms of that comes across by rail or by road. Those three areas. And you can see how they relate to the GTA. And more importantly, you can see how they relate to Hamilton. We're in the middle of it. The fact that we're enjoying some success here today, we can see the cranes and we can see the growth that's taking place, $1.5 billion in building permits. I have to believe that in the next 10, 20, 30 years, you're going to continue to see this part of the Southern Ontario economy be focused on. And so what I think is really important is that Hamilton sees itself in a regional context, not as just a municipality in the midst of all of this activity. And this is going to start to challenge us in terms of how we accomplish all the things that we can accomplish as a municipality. And that what I'm saying to you clearly is that we need to start to work with our neighbors. Uh, we need to be connected to Niagara, not just geographically, but I would say more in terms of how we grow our respective communities. We need to be connected to Niagara, we need to be connected to Halton, Peel, and Kitchener-Waterloo, because it's really that end of the Golden Horseshoe that a tremendous amount of activity is expected to occur and to run through our respective communities. 
and from a land use and transportation perspective, not just what we do with LRT or conventional transit, but also how we invest in interregional transit as well as the road system. All of that is going to matter. And I don't think we can continue to act as islands and just think that the province is going to be the ones to sort all this out because, quite frankly, the province, I think, needs us as much as we need them to get this story right. Which leads us to regional transportation planning. This is the, this is the basics of what you see uh, in any kind of regional transportation planning text that might be out there in universities. But the inter interesting thing is, is that when you look at this transportation system and you look at all the facets of it that govern how people move and how goods move, every single one of them has a place here in Hamilton. That's what makes us incredibly unique and it makes us, I think, strategically important, which makes us what I think the province and the federal government should continue to pay attention to in terms of where to invest. We actually touch all of these. We touch rail, roads, transit, air, marine, walking and cycling. Every one of these things has a place uh, to play here in the city of Hamilton. And so how it is that we grow this city and how it is that we treat these aspects of transportation planning uh, are going to be key to not only our success but I would say the success of Southern Ontario. And so from a strategic directions perspective, the strategic plan, as you know, assigns priority to improving the city's transportation network, supporting multimodal mobility and encouraging interregional connections. And so we talk about that, but we also link it to, and what you see in this presentation today, we link it to health and we link it to, uh, we link it to the economy. And I've said something, I said it a few times to, to staff and then, Maybe it's maybe slightly tongue in cheek, but then again, maybe it really isn't. And that, you know, it may make sense someday to have the head of planning and economic development and public works report to your medical officer of health. Imagine that dynamic. And I was at a conference last year in Portland, and very interesting is that the professionals in public health are insisting that their students have planning courses, just as the planners are insisting that their students have health courses. And I'll give credit to the planners. They've been on top of this healthy community's thinking for some time. And it's wonderful to have today, to stand up in front of you and to introduce this, this topic of ours today, that we're going to have presentations from public health. We're going to have presentations from our land use planners. This is about growing healthy neighborhoods at the end of the day. Transit by itself is just a means by which you move people around and goods around, but really if done well, you can improve the health of your community quite dramatically. So I didn't want to have you wait until the very end of the presentations. As Don said, 80 some slides is a lot of slides, so I don't want you falling asleep. So I thought we'd at least cut to the chase and tell you what the answer is. And the answer at the end of the day is, and this is based on all the work that our staff have done, LRT and improvements to the transit system are both required and Don elaborates on exactly what we mean by the LRT investment <coughs> as well as improvements to the transit system overall. It's not about one or the other, it's really about both. The LRT implementation costs are in the order of 800 million, it's actually about 811 million. Operating costs are in the order of about 12.2 million a year and that we, as we talked last year or in 2011, and we're going to continue talking about it should be 100% funding uh, and that should be and continue to be the request for Metrolinx and I'm going to explain why I think that's reasonable in light of Hamilton in a minute. Improvement to transit service, Don is going to talk about how we can invest in, in conventional transit throughout our city uh, and that cost is in the order of 155 million with operating in the order of 45 million per year. Um, and we believe that approximately 107 million of it should be eligible for Metrolinx funding. Whether we want to push that even further and suggest that more of it should be uh, on the backs of the province, I mean, that's something we can certainly talk about. But at the, at the least, we are saying overall, this is what we need to do in order to achieve the kind of growth that we want to achieve, which we know is strategically important to the province of Ontario. And I just want to say something here. As we know, amongst the list of projects that are being considered for the, the next round of investment, a number of them are congestion related. But I would hope that the province would not turn its back on good planning 
At the end of the day, we are not battling a congestion problem. What we are talking about, though, is ensuring that the health of our neighbourhoods is paramount and that we do good planning, that we have good land use uh, controls in place and that we make the right transit investments. And I would say we need to be rewarded for that kind of thinking and uh, you're going to see some of those details in a few minutes. I want to show you something, though, I think is important. Joe Ronaldo, when I first started in the city manager, I remember him making a presentation to you, and some of the details of this were presented to, uh, in other times by, uh, uh, well, Rossini and uh, Mike Zagaric recalls uh, other times that we've talked to you about this, but Hamilton's ability to pay. And there's a report, the Provincial Municipal Fiscal and Service Delivery Review that was done back in 2008. And that document looked at every municipality in, in Ontario. And it was spearheaded by the province with support from AMO. And I did talk to Councillor Powers about this. And it's still very much a real document for them. Uh, as well as a number of municipalities were signatures to the final report. Hamilton, for whatever reason, is not a signature of it. But yet we gave them a lot of the information that led to this map that you see here. And so, it's, it might be a little hard to see on the screen here, but, but let me just get right to the chase. The red circle is obviously around Hamilton. The color is purple. Um, it represents uh, the end of the spectrum uh, that you don't want to be in, but yet, according to this report, we are. And that is, in terms of our fiscal health, we are deemed to be in relatively poor fiscal health, and I'll give you the criteria that establishes this, versus everyone else that's in the GTA, which is at that time in 2008, and I don't believe it's so dramatically changed since then, that are all in relatively good fiscal health. So um, I think this is important. Uh, this is the province's own document. They recognize the fact that uh, we are, uh, we are uh, in, in need of some, uh, some specific intention, and I, I don't believe we ever want to just simply receive handouts from anyone. I think we want to earn uh, whatever investments that people make in us, and I think evidenced by you know how well we are doing in terms of growth in the last couple of years, um, you know we need to make sure we have our house in order in terms of anyone that does want to invest. But I just think it's very interesting that the province's own document very clearly acknowledges the fact that uh, unlike all the others that are vying for uh, major investments in transit, uh, Hamilton has its challenges from a fiscal perspective. And if you look at what they looked at specifically in that report, there was a comp uh, composite of indicators that, uh, or considerations that were taken in uh, when they established those ratings. Property tax minutes, assessment base, municipal costs, you know, including all your social services costs and so on. Demographics, you know, how we're evolving population-wise, our economy and the financial situation. Interesting though, in 2008, the report did not, because I think many municipalities didn't have all the information at hand, did not include infrastructure as one of the major considerations. As you know, as I said, $200 million a year needs to be invested for the next 10 years. If you compare us to Mississauga, their challenge is $70 million. So all I'm telling you is that at the end of the day, the province acknowledges certainly in this document that we have some challenges relative to the others. And so I think just in the way of making proper investment, I think Hamilton deserves to be invested in. So there is a paradigm shift happening here. Um, there is no question transportation has a direct connection to the quality of life that our citizens are going to experience today and I would maintain over the next several decades. Um, what you heard in terms of that list of people that are working on this project and is what makes this job fantastic is the fact you have collaboration amongst many city departments. You have a head of transit here that is now talking about health and talking about safe neighbourhoods and is talking about pedestrians and cyclists. Um, that's the kind of thing that all of you I know have wanted to hear uh, and you're starting to hear and you're starting to see it bear out in the recommendations that we're giving you. Intermunicipal cooperation, I am telling you, is going to be key. How we work with our neighbours uh, in Peel, in Halton, in Kitchener-Waterloo, in Niagara, about achieving all that's possible within this, this end of the Golden Horseshoe in the next 30 to 40 years. Um, you know, we can't act as islands because I think ultimately we will lose if we continue with that approach. And this, at the end of the day, boils down to our residents and our neighbourhoods and our ability to listen to them 
to know what it is that they need and to be able to address it and to make sure that these neighborhoods uh, and these residents do uh, have a community that uh, uh, has a plan, uh, knows how to invest, and uh, what you're going to hear in the coming uh, presentations will speak to exactly what that investment ought to look like, certainly as it relates to transit. That's all I had to say, so that's probably enough. Simple stuff, uh, but critically important, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Hey, Chris, could you please go back to slide 14, and Councillor Jackson. Thanks, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thanks, uh, Chris, for the opening. So I'm just, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'm just, we're just asking questions for clarification here. Um, so, Chris, um, the language you've used is interesting because it's different under each category. Under LRT, you, the third bullet point, you put 100% funding being requested from Metrolinx, but under improvements to the current transit service, the third bullet point you said would be eligible for Metrolinx. Why didn't you put 100% on the LRT would be eligible for Metrolinx? How do you know that the 107 million would be eligible for Metrolinx? Right. Can you clarify that for me, please? Sure, and to uh, you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I'm just trying to find Don. Where did Don go? Got my back. Um, Don can certainly explain why 107, but it, I, I mean, I think at the end of the day, there are some rules to the Metrolinx funding that I think he's applied here in, in terms of what we're talking about in, in terms of growth of conventional transit. And, uh, and if we apply those rules, this is the kind of money that we think very legitimately they should, uh, uh, they should be willing to spend. Um, but I don't know, and Don can correct me certainly, I don't know if it precludes us from saying that, wait a minute, maybe the rules need to be suspended and that there should be greater investment in Hamilton uh, and for the very reasons that I've said and others are going to say. But Don, if you want to just, if you don't mind, just... No, that's fine, Chris. And, and so, Don, I just want to zero, just maybe zero... I appreciate your um, first um, answer, Chris, but, Don, just to zero in, you put 100% funding being requested from Metrolinx, you didn't put up there what we should be eligible for from Metrolinx, yet under the current transit system, you've put what we should be eligible. I'm trying to reconcile what seems like different language. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, please. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. The direction from Council that we received was to submit a package to the province that included a request for 100% capital funding for the LRT system. The $107 million is what... Uh, interpreting the agreement between the city and Metrolinx might be eligible. Certain things are excluded, uh, specifically excluded in the agreement between the city and Metrolinx, like land acquisition, for example. It would not be funded if there was a need to uh, acquire land, and that would have to be borne by the municipal taxpayer. So, Don, thank you, and I'm not trying to belabor this point, and I appreciate now you said council directed to ask for 100% funding under an LRT option, but you didn't put up there as to what you felt, even though we're requesting 100%, what we may be eligible for, or is that an unknown at this time through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor to Don? Well, a lot has changed between 2008 and today, uh, but certainly the initial announcement was based on 100% capital uh, for the LRT project. Uh, there's been some discussion about that number changing, but it, uh, there's been no formal change from the province, no formal direction change from, from council, so our submission would be to ask for 100% of the capital, which would be the $800 million plus or minus 20% from what we know at 30% uh, design. I don't know, Christine, could you add anything to that? The $107 million, could you speak to that? The $107 million is the lump sum of projects that are included in the uh, Rapid Ready that we feel um, are aligned uh, with the big move and uh, w should, should be up for negotiation uh, with Metrolinx for funding. Okay, and second clarification, just so I understand this, Don. You're saying that LRT would cost about five and a half times current transit upgrades on the capital side, but on the operating side, it'd be about three and a half times to upgrade the current transit system. Mr. Deputy Mayor, through you, is that an accurate analysis by me? Well, we're going to see a slide a little bit later in my presentation that indicates that if the city were to implement LRT today, we would be within the um, low-mid range of LRT systems across North America with a ridership of about 4 million. 
to get to a high performing system, we'd have to double or triple our ridership. We'd have to move from, from uh, our current rides today and double or triple them. And to get there, uh, the cost of getting there would be in the order of 45 million per year uh, to get us there on an ongoing basis. I'm, I, I don't know that I've answered your question just yet, Councillor. Okay, I'll leave that for now. And lastly, Ms. And these are all just Mr. Deputy Mayor. I'm just trying to get clarification on this slide. And lastly, Mr. Deputy Mayor, Chris and Don, the way you've put up slide 14, is it an either or, or does the improvements to transit, is the LRT predicated ultimately on the improvements to the transit system? Can you help me with that, Don, on just on well, the slide? Well, you've, you've struck on one of the most important points uh, uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Is, that's exactly what we're here to talk about today is really these two sets of numbers, the LRT numbers and the transit numbers are two mutually, mutually exclusive sets of numbers. And uh, as we've indicated, we, we had some direction today as a result of last October was to bring back a report that we could submit to the province. The first bullet, the LRT bullet, achieves that. Not wanting to, to essentially put all our cards uh, uh, or all of our... Um, eggs in one basket, we said, look, there's, there's a couple of ways we could proceed from here. We could uh, implement LRT and allow LRT to pull the transit ridership growth along, or we could enhance our public transportation system and grow the ridership so that when we're ready for LRT, um, we would, uh, the more we grow the public transportation system, the more successful an LRT will be down the road, or we could implement the two of them uh, concurrently. Uh, obviously, the, the numbers are, are very huge, and there's, you know, there's no expectation that all that money is going to flow, but the way we, the way we recommend to council that we present this to the province is that we're ready to go no matter whether it's an LRT. If LRT is the only option, then we're prepared to go. If, if growing the public transportation system in order to ensure the success of LRT down the road, then we're ready to go with that too, or we're ready to grow the two of them incrementally. We can continue to invest in the LRT and get from a 30% design up to full construction ready, and at the same time we can be building the public transportation program. So we've tried to anticipate all the possible options so that we're, so when we go to the province, Province, we're, prov we're providing the province with the full scope of what needs to happen for public transportation to be successful in Hamilton. So, Don, not to preempt the rest of this long presentation ahead of us, but just based on that answer, I'm hearing that this is a multi, a potentially, based on council today, a multi optional type of approach. Is that what I'm hearing? I know there's lots of the presentation to come. Absolutely correct. We don't know what's in the minds of Metrolinx at this time. The idea is to get this report in front of Metrolinx to open up some discussion, ideally between members of council and Metrolinx, so that when it comes time to make the decision for them to make the recommendation to the province, is that we've had an opportunity for some discussion. We don't know if there's an opportunity for debate or discussion or negotiation. So this is really just the next step in a longer process. It's not the end. It's just the next step in a longer process. Thanks for the preliminary answers. Mr. Deputy Mayor, thanks for your indulgence just to get clarification on this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Councillor Ferguson, please. Just a couple of quick questions, and, and Don and Chris, thanks for putting the big stuff in front of us first uh, yeah. before we do get uh, a little information overload on us. And I just want to zero in again on the capital cost. And um, certainly in Toronto, uh, we've heard repeatedly that they've spent billions of dollars as part of the big move, and uh, it was 100% funded by Metrolinx. And uh, we also heard the Vice President of Metrolinx come before this council last October, and it's on the video, anybody can look at it if they want to. And he was asked that question, will you be doing 100% funding of capital in Hamilton? And his answer was, that's our model. Uh, we hear a lot of comparison to Kitchener, which, uh, where the municipality kicked in one-third of the cost, but of course, I believe through you, Mr. Chairman, to Don, that's outside the big move, Kitchener, is it not? Yeah. So. Uh, I just worry with the wording also be requested that I think that's our expectation because that's what we're told when we started down this road because we are in the big move. We're all part of that program and Hamiltonians are no different than Toronto people that uh, have got 100% funding. And, and so I, it just worries me that this is starting to show up that, well, maybe the municipality has to put some money into this and it'd be requested rather than firmly say, we expect you to do what you said you were going to do, which is 100%. Uh, capital funding commitment. Any it, thoughts? 
And Mr. Deputy Mayor, we've never deviated from that, and the province has never given us anything uh, contrary to that. The, the, the last and the only number that came was back in 2008, and uh, it was 100% funding on capital, and that's the package that uh, we'll be recommending be forward to the province, that the ask is as it was back in 2008, 100% capital. Okay, because there is some, some um, dollars that you're expecting to be levied in the report, and I'm sure we'll see that later on in your presentations. But I just want to make sure that we're not drifting away from that. Do what you said you're going to do. Do what you did in Toronto. Do what you, which is part of the big move, which is 100% capital from the province. So if I can, uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, I mean, maybe our wording sounds uh, too polite. Uh, uh, you have an opportunity to put an exclamation mark on this, uh, and that's where that, that's where your uh, that's your role uh, at the end of the day. And uh, our intention here was not to kind of you know start to uh, give any impression that uh, we should be uh, given a different deal than others have already gotten. So I mean, uh, never our intention. Just uh, we're confirming that it was 100% funding, as you heard in October of 2011. We're operating on that basis. I think we're hearing from uh, Mayor McCallion the same thing. I mean, this should be 100% funded. So, um, you know, you can say today, obviously, to uh, to us and to this community and to the province that with an exclamation mark that it's 100% funding. Or change the word from request to expect, you know. Demand or whatever you want. From the links. <laughs> okay, that's all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Ferguson. Councillor Collins. Through you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chris, the $800 million price tag that's a uh, conservative number. You've given the high and the low, and you've inserted the 800, I think, is sort of the middle range price. And I, I was trying to um, discern from Don's presentation the date that we'd be looking at actually construction if, in fact, the province said, you know, we're going to fund this project. Um, without getting into other parts of the report, there are references in the, in the, in the documents that suggest we have a lot more work to do in terms of some studies, some land purchases, as you referenced earlier. So knowing that we might have a couple of years ahead of us, why are we not um, using a figure with the inflation that's built in? And I ask that because we've been through so many funding agreements with the province that you know that if it takes, even let's say it takes three to five years to get us to the point where there's yeah. shovels in the ground, an additional five years on that budget, I think your own document here says 2% a year, which is probably another 16 or 17 million, and then into 18 million once you pass the $900 million price tag, you know, that, that money starts to add up. And so knowing how we've had some sort of slippery relationships with the province in terms of funding in the past, I'm wondering why we wouldn't use another number to state that as of this date, pick five years from now, we'll need an additional X amount of dollars. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, that's also an excellent question, and we very deliberately use this number uh, because we wanted to uh, first and foremost protect the integrity of the data. We're going to hear about later in our presentation where we start with a baseline case for LRT where there are no assumptions. And so we always wanted to be able to put a stake in the ground and go back to day one and, and say this is what the data was at this point in time. And so that one of the problems we face is that over time the numbers change and, and that becomes a credibility issue. So my direction in preparing this report was is we always we put a stake in the ground at the number we had at 2008, and then as inflation occurs and as changes are made, then the numbers can be adjusted over time. But I wanted to start with a set of numbers uh, that were absolutely basic and fundamental and, and could change over time, but one set of numbers that had the least amount of assumptions possible built into them so that we had a credible baseline to start from uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Okay, and, and I appreciate that, it, but I, I think, Don, the dilemma we face is that as those costs continue to rise, if our funding ask is for $800 million and the province says, <clears throat> excuse me, two or three years from now, here's your $800 million, and the price over five years increases even at 2% by $85 million, yeah. that's a pretty big funding shortfall. So I, I'm, I'm wondering why we would knowingly then under-ask, knowing that, when those shovels go in the ground, the $800 million is a completely different number. Well, maybe a couple of responses to that, Mr. Deputy Mayor, is the maybe the more important number is 100% capital, whatever that number is when the shovel goes in the ground. Uh, respecting 2008, was the uh, that was the number in 2008. The other is, and as difficult as it may be to uh, perhaps perceive, the cost could go down. 
And that's certainly the exercise that uh, Kitchener-Waterloo is working through right now. And they're actually trimming their capital costs on the fly uh, through uh, a, a variety of approaches. So as much as it may be difficult to perceive, it's entirely possible the number could go down as opposed to up, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Well, I appreciate that. And, and maybe it's <clears throat> worth noting that, as you suggested, Don, maybe the 100 percent capital funding ask rather than the specific 800 million it might be um, better for us in the long term. I don't expect uh, those costs to come down, to be honest with you. I've been around and I've watched a number of large projects. And we can start naming them off. Rarely do they come in under. They're usually over. <clears throat> so I'd rather be prepared for the worst. And uh, so maybe we can give it some thought through the presentations today to look at changing A1, which specifically says 800. If it's going to be something different, I'd like to change that and, and insert the 100% funding scenario as you talked about earlier. We're certainly happy to take that as committee's direction at the end of the day, Mr. Deputy Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Collins. Just a heads up here, I have a speaker for this, Councillor Johnson, Mayor Bertina, Councillor McCaddy, Councillor Clark, Councillor Duvall, Councillor Whitehead, Councillor Pearson. I don't think I missed anybody, so Councillor Marula. All right, so Councillor Johnson, please. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, I appreciate that. Um, you go to slide 11 for me, please, Chris. Sorry, which slide? 11. Thank you. I noticed on there that, that um, this map is that pertains to, to LRT, and we've got the mid pen on there. That's one of the. Is, is this hand in hand with LRT or totally a separate? Um. I mean, it's all one transportation system. I mean, at the end of the day, it's really uh, there to illuminate the fact that we're in a we're in the midst of a major trade corridor, which is expected to grow. The transportation system that's going to be necessary to achieve the population employment growth uh, is going to include a variety of, of transportation mechanisms, not the least of which would be transit interregional, but also there is contemplation, obviously, of, of uh, road capacity being considered as well. And thank you for that. And through you, Deputy Mayor, right beside Hamilton, if you go to the east a little bit, there's a square box and it's got the, the lines going through that. And I believe part of that could be even Winona. What does that box mean? I can't even make it out on my slide that I have in front of me. And I couldn't make it out when you had it up. Um. I think it actually is more of the Cambridge Kitchener Waterloo. No, other side, sorry. If you're going towards uh, St. Catharines. Oh, oh, the uh, the hatched area. Hatched area? No, no, the the area that's in hatched. Is that the one you're talking about? Yeah, I think that does span. It, it crosses between our region or our our city and the. Uh, uh, region of Niagara, so it does. It would include uh, the area. Why it's hatched in particular, I don't really. I can't really tell you right now. Thank you. Um, and through you, Deputy Mayor, to Don. Um, Don, you and I have had many conversations about this uh, particular uh, subject. I've never had a problem with LRT other than the cost and getting that all sorted out. But I always believe that we need to support the current HSR before we we can expand or, or support the LRT. So having said that, we've got, we've got bus routes that lead to places that used to be up and coming and now are no longer. And this is not to suggest to eliminate those routes, but we've often said it would be wonderful if we could take two staff of your staff, put them in a room and let them see if, what the design of the HSR route system would look like and would that not in fact support the LRT even better. So any comment on that? Well, our, our two planners, Jim Doms and Andy McLaughlin, have a, a room full of concepts and uh, in particular, they, nothing they love more than to start with a clean sheet of paper. At the end of the day, it all comes down to money and uh, we're prepared to move as quickly as the money becomes available. And uh, I think that one of the learning experiences we're taking away from the last 18 months or so is that uh, there can't be any doubt that as a community grows, it passes through certain thresholds. And certainly as we pass over a population of 500,000, the importance of public transportation changes to a community. It becomes from, um, from a, perhaps a necessary service to a must-have service. Right. And uh, as we grow, the, the, 
it is certainly our view that we won't even have a whole lot of choice, quite frankly. Uh, we'll see for some charts a little bit later that the public transportation system absolutely grows with population and, it, and it's really, at the end of the day, uh, beyond uh, our decision making because it's driven by the, uh, the demand from the public. Thank you for that. And, and one last question through you, Deputy Mayor, to Don. Is that part of the operating $45 million estimation? Is that where you're, where you're coming from, is that we would be looking at the root system and saying, okay, how can we best support LRT? Where's the growth in this community? This is where we should be uh, putting our roots. Here's where we should be looking at these roots and, and maybe combine whatever, whatever it may look like at the end of the day because the growth is one way and the HSR is headed in the other way. Well, I, I think what we're trying to suggest here, and it started with the restructuring of the uh, of the programs, all the various programs into a single division, and it's about moving together in an integrated fashion. And uh, it, it, it isn't about growing the public transportation system to make LRT successful. It's about growing the public transportation system um, in concert with an LRT, cycling, pedestrian movement, so that any money that is spent is spent most effectively, and it's spent as a result of having a good conversation about where best to spend it and how best to spend it and when. And the idea is to bring to council each time we come back, and instead of a fragmented approach to growing the public transportation program, is an integrated approach to growing the public transportation program. So we present committee and council with a full inventory of options each time funding becomes available. Okay, and thank you for that answer because that's when I saw the for the forty-five million dollar operating. That's where the the questions came out. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Johnson. Mayor Bertina, please. Thanks, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. On the funding, this uh, back in 07, big move, all that, 100%, we all had this idea, 100%. But a number of the projects, Mr. Deputy Mayor, have already commenced, including Mississauga's bus rapid transit, the My Way. And it's a $259 million uh, project funded by uh, $83 million by the feds, Mississauga 63, provincial 65 million. So that project, Don, didn't get 100% funding, even though it was one of the second phase of the Big Moves projects. And I think that's why Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, Mayor McCallion is now getting nervous, as we all are, about what is the real funding strategy going to be, and will it be 100% funding? So bearing all that in mind, uh, um, City Manager was there when we heard the statement or the question from then Infrastructure Minister Shirelli, how are you getting along with your federal partners on the funding? So as much as, as we feel that there was a message of 100% funding and that's the way we, only way probably we're going to achieve that, what would you say to that, uh, City Manager, in terms of what you heard Mr. Shirelli say and, and what we're dealing with here today? Uh, what we heard uh, Minister Shirelli say uh, was a couple of things. We heard him say about uh, uh, responsibility of the federal government contributing to the cost of transit as well as the municipality, not unlike, and he used the example specifically of Kitchener-Waterloo. Um, and then the other thing he talked about was, uh, you know, the focus being on congestion. Now, I, since that meeting, did meet with the Deputy Minister of Transportation and uh, Bruce McQuaid, uh, just to make sure that the rules of the game didn't change on us because we understood from the very beginning that it, this, wasn't, uh, this wasn't about uh, just relieving congestion. This was about supporting good planned growth. And they assured me that that continues to be the basic message of the program. Um, you know, I, I go to this, um, this slide. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I think you have a case, you have the province's case for why it is uh, we, I would argue, more than anyone else should be, um, you know, given what we were all already told we were going to give them, which was 100% funding. Not to mention the fact that we are within the, you know, the broader regional, interregional context, we are within the midst of the most important trade corridor, and we are an area where growth has to be focused. And we know transit is a key component of growth. It's in their best interest at the end of the day to uh, ensure that we grow the way in which they think we can grow. 
and, uh, and they need to make those investments. Um, and it's not just for some emotional reason, it's for very good economic reasons that they need to make the investment that they said they're going to make before. Notwithstanding what we heard the minister say, I think you can and rightfully, uh, you know, I would go as far as to say demand that they continue to live up to the commitment that they were uh, making in the early days that convinced us to be a part of this. So um, I think you have the right to uh, insist on 100% funding uh, for the LRT and, and extend that thinking to improvements in the conventional system that Don's talking to you about today. Thank you. And finally, um, we went through an interesting sometimes challenging stadium procurement construction uh, plan. So who was going to procure and manage this, this project? Councillor Collins talked about where, you know, what's the final number going to be? So will we have any control over that number? I, with respect, I think that's a premature question. And, and entirely that's one of the questions that presumably we would ask uh, when this document flows to the province and that dialogue opens up between the province and, and council here and presumably there would be a, a contingent of, of council to speak with the province and, and, and try to get answers specifically to uh, questions just like that one, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Bettina. Council McCaddy, please. Thanks, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And, uh, uh, I was going to say this later on, but I'll say it right up front. Uh, fantastic report, uh, Don, to you and, and uh, Chris and all the, all the uh, people that worked uh, very hard on this. It's, uh, and I, I really particularly uh, appreciate the uh, sort of two-part approach to it, uh, speaking very clearly about uh, light rail transit, LRT, and then uh, also providing the uh, information necessary uh, on the overall transit system to feed into uh, to LRT and how the two work together. And I really appreciate the way that's been laid out and there's, there's lots of details behind it that we don't even necessarily have in, in our full report. We, I mean, it says uh, $45 million a year, Mr. Deputy Mayor, for operating. Uh, uh, I mean, that, that number could be uh, anything, uh, anywhere from zero, I suppose, which I hope not, uh, to, to 5 million to, to other numbers, uh, which would achieve uh, increased service across the city placed uh, in a strategic way could, could definitely uh, serve uh, LRT and get us uh, moving on that. And then I, I would think we would also have some opportunities, if I'm not correct, uh, incorrect in reading the report, uh, through that previous IBI report that we may be able to reallocate some existing service hours as well to, uh, to serve that. So it may not uh, be entirely uh, new money that we need uh, to ser uh, search out. Also, we definitely need uh, more investment as Don McLean mentioned in his budget presentation. Uh, Chris, you raised that as well. I just wanted to clarify the, uh, the actual dollar figure, uh, the 800 million, 811 million, which is in the report uh, based on some previous uh, comments. I, I did uh, take great interest in the, uh, in the Waterloo example where they did, uh, is it uh, called uh, cost engineering, a cost engineering study? And they actually uh, have achieved an 18% reduction in the cost through that detailed cost engineering study. So I think in our case, uh, you know, the 800, uh, 811 million could actually, I mean, if, uh, if we achieve that 18%, not necessarily that we're going to do that, but if we're going to do that study to, to determine what our number might be, 18% uh, reduction is actually down to 665 million uh, as compared to the 811. Of course, it could go up as well, as you uh, indicated, uh, and as Councillor Collins indicated, based on inflation. But I think there's quite a bit of work uh, uh, ability in there to uh, to work with that uh, overall capital cost, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And I was heartened by the uh, Waterloo example uh, and our uh, suggestion, your suggestion in the report, that we do that same type of study, the detailed uh, cost engineering study, to, uh, to see if we can reduce the uh, costs in there. I've got lots more questions which I'll save in terms of, uh, of the assumptions around uh, uh, ridership and that sort of thing. Maybe uh, one question, Phil, Mr. Deputy Mayor, at this point, and Don, you can either uh, maybe touch on it an hour or later. It wasn't cl clear to me uh, as I read the report what your thoughts are on, on the phasing of, of bringing in LRT. I know there's the phasing in terms of, you know, do you go the full route and that kind of stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when actually, uh, and I know it's depending on Metrolinx and the funding and all kinds of stuff it would depend on, but I found myself wondering about how much 
uh, work do we need to do in the neighborhoods and, and the feeding work, the Part B there, the, the 155 million capital, et cetera, uh, or, uh, you know, are we thinking perhaps in a perfect world LRT uh, would begin by the year so-and-so, and I didn't actually see a year in there uh, that we would, at least for planning purposes, uh, as we think about other investments that we need to make along the way, and starting with the 2014 capital budget with our own transit, uh, I didn't see a, a real time in there that uh, where we would actually expect LRT to be there, at least in our planning. Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, a couple things in terms of timeline and the phasing. A, a big component of the 2012 work uh, was to work with a consultant and to look at uh, phasing uh, construction of the LRT as a cost mitigation measure. Uh, the staff uh, position on that is that you get your greatest economy of scale, obviously, by building the longest, um, or the, the most amount of track at once. But it was a requirement in the contribution agreement between the city and the province because, obviously, uh, they're looking for ways to, uh, to trim costs as well. So phasing and, and building the LRT in sections is one option that they're going to want to have a discussion with the city with, I presume. Uh, in the same way, uh, they're going to want to look at the value engineering exercise that's going on in, uh, in Kitchener-Waterloo. Uh, we'll be looking and then, oops, we'll be looking at the alternate funding models as well. The, uh, and I'm sure there will be some other ideas crop up in terms of how to fund uh, this initiative. The other, the second part of your question with respect to timing is we deliberately didn't go to timing. I think the, the objective here is, is, first of all, to have the discussion. Nothing can go forward without the money. But to look forward to determine uh, when will we be in a crisis situation in the same way uh, that the uh, other area municipalities are as you move closer to Toronto, move and set a timeline and work back from that crisis situation to when would we have to be construction ready to avoid the crisis that the other municipalities are experiencing. So that's one approach to this project going forward and that's one of the, the things that, one of the points of discussion we'd like to have with the province is forecast when will we be in crisis and then, and then work a timeline backwards to find out when do we need to be construction ready. Because I think one of the most important things with respect to a decision on LRT and when the funding cycle comes around again is to be trigger ready. And I think that that's where some municipalities have missed the boat in the past is they hadn't been sufficiently advanced in their plans to actually launch. And we saw it with the capital programs a few years ago with the recession. And yet you have to be trigger ready. So one of the initiatives that were, one of the points of discussion we hope to have with the province is so, is to talk about them. So how do we avoid a crisis in Hamilton? And backing up that timeline, when would we need to put a shovel in the ground in Hamilton? So going forward on LRT, one of the exercises could be to take us from 30% design to, to construction ready, so that when the funding cycle comes around again, we don't have to wait five or 10 years to complete the planning. So that's one possible outcome of the discussions we hope to have with the province. Okay, well, thanks very much, Don. So I think that's gonna be really important for us to know. It's we always want to know anytime we get into planning, right, we want to know timelines and what we've got to work with and that will inform our own budgets uh, in terms of our, our own local uh, transit uh, investments and what will happen when. So the sooner we can get that, the better. I think that was one part that I just kind of wondered about uh, when you read the report. You've, you know, you, you kind of go, boy, this has got everything in it except, you know, the timelines. So I think that's going to be important for us, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Hopefully we get that soon, thanks. Yeah, Mr. Deputy Mayor, actually there was a second part to that as well. And as you say, Hamilton's not presenting its case solely on the solution to congestion. The Hamilton case is built on, this is about building Hamilton and making Hamilton a healthier community and, and attracting jobs. I think Hamilton's case is built on, uh, it's really a four-pronged approach. We know the social implications and the, the social benefits of public transit. We know the, uh, the environmental benefits of public transit. In the last little while, we've learned more and more about the economic benefits of public transportation. And now, most recently, we're learning about how public transportation can, can contribute to perhaps mitigating or arresting the, the rising costs of, uh, of public health, which is, is the, the biggest number in any budget today, whether it's provincial, local, or, or municipal. So here is it, and we're starting to be able to measure that benefit, and, which is really good because everything has to be measurable at the end of the day. There has to be a business case. And we are now able to start to measure uh, the benefits of public transportation to mitigating the cost of, of public health and, and, the, and the cost of public health in the community. And that's what Dr. Tran is going to speak about. So Hamilton's approach is not 
is going to be different, we're suggesting, than the other municipalities who are in crisis and need this money to get themselves out of a crisis. Hamilton's approach is we want to set up a proper planning model, and it's not just about public transportation, as Chris said. Public transportation is just the medium to get us there. It's about we have four goals in mind, to improve the social equity in the community, to be a, a supporter of economic development. Literally, literally every, every industry now that comes to Hamilton is demanding uh, improved public transportation. And, uh, and most recently, we're starting to actually be able to put some hard numbers on uh, the return on investment to the cost of public health in the community through improved public transportation. So it's, it's two approaches. Thank you, Councillor McCaddy. Over to Councillor Clark, please. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, I did express um, my gratitude uh, to Don this morning, and, and I actually told him that uh, this is one of the best reports, if not the best report I've ever read, and I've read an awful lot, probably more, report, more reports than I care to remember, but um, the report is extremely well written um, and really does cover off all the bases. So I do want to thank the staff for doing an excellent job. Um, beyond our expectations, this is like way up there top-notch report. Um, I heard Don or Chris say um, that Metrolinx has continued to say that their expectation is that this was 100% funding from Metrolinx. Did I hear that correctly? We have no formal position from Metrolinx on funding other than the original capital announcement of 100% back in 2000, 2007, 2008. And the intent of the staff recommendation today is to get this document into the hands of Metrolinx to flush out that discussion and flush out that number and some specifics on that number, whether that commitment is still there or not, or whether it has changed. Um, uh, th that's actually good news for me because I would have expected that we would have heard from them if, if what Minister um, Chiarelli was saying was accurate and was now government policy that they were going to be lowering the amount that they were spending on this then Metrolinx would have heard that and would have already been preparing you for that bad news day. Uh, so it's quite possible that the Minister was trying to float a balloon to see whether or not we were willing to accept less than 100% um, and I'm glad that we have not indicated that we're willing to accept less than what we were promised initially so um, I would continue on that uh, very strongly thank you thank you Councillor Clark Councillor Duvall please thanks Mr. Chair and uh, to either Don or Chris on, on slide uh, 14 uh, that we have up there on the LRT uh, capital costs I, I take that that's just for the B line or, uh, well think of it as the corridor because there are upwards of five different routes operating in that corridor so it's the it's the cost of con converting that corridor to LRT between Eastgate and McMaster you'll see later in the slides that uh, for example the entire B line would be eliminated portions of the King Street would be eliminated the university would be affected so uh, try and, uh, not to think it as as opposed to the B line as opposed to uh, versus uh, a corridor between Eastgate and McMaster and and having LRT operating in that corridor uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor okay so through you Mr. Chair uh, Don um, when we first initially started this we, we were talking about an A, an a line and a B line and we we're talking about Eastgate to uh, to Mac um, instead of going to the bottom of Jane's up to the mountain. So is, that's off the radar now. Um, we're just looking at Eastgate to... Well, that's what uh, I think Councillor Johnson raised the question earlier. What got this ball rolling in the first place in the restructuring is that some of the transportation programs were moving along on their own uh, momentum and perhaps getting ahead of the rest of the transportation programs and perhaps even getting ahead of some of the other city initiatives. And with the restructuring that was directed by council, what we did was step back, consolidate all the programs, amalgamate them all so that one program didn't get in front of the other, and the total program didn't get in front of the broader corporate street project, uh, objectives. You'll see in one of the slides later on through the transportation master plan, one of the primary deliverables in the transportation master plan review that we're recommending is that we actually have 
a game plan for growing the public transportation program and that it's not done on an ad hoc basis. There's been some sense that it's been a little bit knee jerk and perhaps even a little bit politically driven. And, and we, we don't want that. Council doesn't want that. So one of the primary mandates of the transportation master plan review will be, so what is the formula? How will we bring the area municipality service levels up to the rest of the city? How will we grow the B line to a, f a full our rapid transit system. How will we grow the A line? We'll extend the A line from the from the uh, from the downtown to the waterfront. Fill in all the gaps around the city. There's a number of gaps around the city right now. Below the escarpment, the service bus is coming by every four or five minutes in peak period. Above the escarpment, the buses are coming by every 15 minutes. Moving forward, we know there's not going to be enough money to do everything and be all things to all people. What's really critically important is that we put a document in front of council that allows council to make a well-informed decision so that when money becomes available, the choice is made by committee based on some kind of a, uh, an, evalu an evaluation metric. And that is one of the primary deliverables we want to bring back from the Transportation Master Plan Review. We want to know in advance from committee and from council how this transportation program is going to grow across the city. We want your direction in advance in the same way so that we're not growing the transit system through knee-jerk reaction or on an ad hoc basis. We're growing, we're growing the public transportation system through a, a, a well thought out plan that's been authorized and directed by committee and council. Okay, thanks and thank you, Don. And so Mr. Chair, uh, to Don, Don, the actually operating costs of 12.2 million, that's just for LRT only, correct? You'll see later in the slides that that's 12.2 million without taking any buses off the road. We project taking probably 18 buses minimum off the road, which would bring it down to about a $2.9 million operating. So on a $130, $101 million operating budget, I guess what we're saying is $800 million in capital is a very, very large number. Whether it's $600 million or a billion, it's still one of the largest numbers the municipality's ever had to deal with. On the operating side, day one, one of the real benefits that the city of Hamilton has over every other municipality that's opting for LRT funding is we already have ridership in that corridor. Many corridors start from scratch. They start from an abandoned rail line and have no ridership at all. And it takes five or 10 or 20 or 25 years to build that ridership. And the city operates in a, in a deficit position over that period of time. Or you could be in a position like York or Brampton where they wait until they have a crisis and then they try to implement LRT in a corridor that's that's actually gridlocked with the automobile. So now they have to build the LRT in that corridor and then transition people from the automobile to the LRT. Hamilton's situation is quite unique here in that we already have uh, identified a corridor with a developed ridership. That's the good news. The bad news is, is trying to build an LRT in that corridor uh, without causing uh, irreparable harm to the business owners, for example, in that corridor. So that's where time becomes an issue because we want to be absolutely sensitive uh, to the people who are already running businesses and living in that corridor. Okay, and Don, um, the improvements to the transit service, I, I, uh, it's safe to say you're basically talking about rapid bus uh, transit? Well, actually, or, or is that combined together? We're talking about a lot more, and that's we need to have this conversation with committee and council. Staff needs direction from council on a plan for growing the public transportation system. We've identified $45, $50 million. We know that we're not going to get $45 or $50 million anytime soon. So that when money, be, but when money becomes available, we don't want it to be a crapshoot. We want to have sit down, have a conversation with the committee and council, bring forward to you what your priorities are. Is it to bring the area municipalities up to the same level as the rest of the city? Is it to f further fortify the B line? Is it to strengthen the A line? You know, what's the plan? So we can bring you options worth some $50 million in operating. And what we really need direction from is prioritizing those options so that as funding becomes available, everyone knows going in how the money is going to be spent. So Don, that's, that operating $45 million, that's over and above what we have now? Absolutely. We're going to see a slide a little bit later where it, it's really quite interesting. And you've seen some, some, uh, some uh, media here from Catch. And uh, we're going to give you what we think is an apples to apples comparison in terms of uh, how Hamilton has been growing and how other municipalities have been growing, Hamilton's performance rather to other municipalities. So if, if I could uh, ask if that maybe I could come back and answer that question during my presentation. And, and, and my last question would be, 
Just an approximate, but what is our current operating cost right now that we have? In the our current operating cost before revenue is a little over $100 million this year. We're, still, we're recovering just under 50 cents in the dollar, so our net uh, cost would be something in the order $50, $55 million. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Duvall. Councillor Whitehead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, um, I'm just curious. CHCH did a, a story about a week or two ago. Um, the, the problem uh, on, say, West Mountain, for example, West Fifth and Queen Street Hill uh, has reached its capacity years ago. So we already have congestion. In fact, congestion is so bad that, you know, it's just a matter of time before somebody dies just trying to get down Queen Street Hill. So I'm concerned about why that uh, issue isn't part, because I haven't seen those kinds of facts or those kinds of numbers anywhere in the, pre, in the, uh, in the um, presentation. Identifying, one, the growth on the mountain, Two, uh, we have pinch points. We have congestion points on, uh, on a number of accesses. I'm going to identify the two in, in Ward 8, specifically uh, West 5th and, and, and uh, Queen Street Hill. Uh, growth hasn't, hasn't stopped. Uh, and then you have uh, Go Transit. And I, I'm trying to think if the Go Station was confirmed before we uh, embarked on the, the original plan or not. I don't think it did. I think it was a concept at the time. Uh, so then uh, we know that 45,000 or so uh, people leave this community to go uh, and, uh, and work outside the community. We know a lot of them go Toronto bound. We know most of them don't live downtown, but most of them live on the mountain. Uh, and yet the go transit is going to be in the lower city. So I'm just trying to understand the sands have shifted in regards to some of the contacts. And, and it still it will continue shifting. Uh, you have Red Hill taking off in regards to employment lands. You've got an Ancaster that, my understanding, is almost full in the employment lands. You've got the airport. Um, and again, congestion. We have real uh, pinch points on, on access from the, the, the mountain to the lower city. And again, it doesn't talk about the fact that we've got acute issues with that, those accesses. Well, actually, it does, perhaps not directly to that specific area, Mr. Deputy Mayor. But what it does talk to is transit priority. And one area I think where we can uh, perhaps uh, credit ourselves is we've been very, very cost effective. Uh, with our transit program. We continue to perform at a financial level at or above our peers across the country. So we've done a very, very good job of managing our expenses. Uh, also, our, our revenues. Our revenues are in line with other municipalities, uh, and we've gone probably more years, I suspect, than any other municipality around, or at least in the GTA, without a fair, without a fair increase. Um, so we've trimmed our expenses to the bone. We're generating, I think, good uh, ridership, good revenue based on the level of service we have on the road. So what we need to now is to look for another way of approving our efficiency and our effectiveness, and one of them is to implement transit priority. And just being able to move the buses a few, just a few minutes, if we were able to, just in this corridor out here, we could save several hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and create new capacity. So that's where we want to go now in terms of the financial equation is if we can get uh, the willingness of the community and the willingness of council to look at transit priority so that we can move the buses along faster, there's an opportunity here to, uh, I think, explore a third financial uh, opportunity, and that's to uh, be more be more more productive. And so, in as much as I respect the Queen Street Hill, and no doubt about it, it backs up during peak period. We have selected a project in the in the downtown here, and, and for two reasons, quite frankly, it's in the identified corridor. Or three reasons: we have the support of the two ward councillors to move on this initiative because it won't be pain free. Uh, it will be a challenge, and there will be some backlash. Um, and third, it's where the, the bulk majority of our service operates. So it's a great opportunity to test the water with respect to transit priority and develop a model based on our experience here to be used elsewhere in the city. But, but certainly moving forward, you'll see it again, it's one of the five or six bullets we have for a mandate on our transportation master plan review is to come back and talk to committee and council more about transit priority and how transit priority can, priority can be part of the budget solution and, uh, and can, can help us improve our productivity without increased expenses or increased revenue. Yeah, I, I think at, uh, and I appreciate the explanation, and I do want to comment on the uh, very comprehensive report as well. I guess what's me missing here is that uh, when you're comparing apples to apples, when you're talking about potential ec uh, economic uh, opportunity and growth, and you've talked about uh, uh, the minutes and time, uh, it's pretty clear uh, that at least you're currently moving traffic 
uh, fairly well in the lower city east-west. You're not doing that on the mountain. And you've got some pinch points that are creating the problem. So I guess I, my concern is uh, if you did the same level of detail uh, uh, in the context of opportunity uh, on, the, on the north-south route and understanding that uh, we have an acute problem uh, that's evolving with the, the continued growth which happens to be on, on the mountain, how do you reconcile the fact that we don't have that level of detail to do those, uh, that kind of analysis? Well, I keep coming back, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, to um, staying focused now that we have an integrated program and not to look uh, at a piecemeal solution or a fragmented solution to come back with a, an all-inclusive solution. As Chris pointed out earlier, it's kind of interesting in terms of all those contributors um, that uh, part of the solution is, is transportation demand management. And I'm very new on this. I've got about 12 months exposure to transportation demand management. We're we, uh, uh, one of the few municipalities that have a dedicated staff uh, person. And that's really what the role of that staff person is, is to help us ensure that we manage transportation demand citywide and not, uh, and not through a reaction or, or, or not through crisis, that we have a, a grand plan for the whole city in terms of transportation demand management. And we are, I think, working on a small initiative in that, in that respect with the Queen Street Hill, diverting the traffic down uh, an alternate street. So I, I guess the point is, is that this, I think there's in some cases a what I've learned in the last year or so as well is this it's a tremendously complex program and, and and we've we all need to step back we've now got the program integrated you know a, a couple of years ago uh, I thought of, of, of cycling as being intrusive on the transit program and uh, as being in co com competition uh, for uh, lane capacity with with bicycles and and now I've realized that you know we can't be in competition we may not always agree, but we can't be in competition. We've got so much space between the building faces. We have to sit down, sit down with committee and council and say, look, of the limited amount of space, here's our options. What's the right thing to do uh, for this street? Uh, but one of the big revelations for me in the past year with cycling, for example, is it, it can actually help generate transit ridership because it can get people through the first and last mile. So where the walking distance is maybe too excessive, cycling has become you know, universally accepted as a mode of transportation. Anyone can ride a bicycle now. So there's a whole new market potential there to get people on the public transit system and grow the ridership on the public transit system. Appreciate that. Uh, on page 38, 36 of the report, uh, it, this stuck out at, uh, to me. It says, conduct feasibility study for the long-term conversion of James Street, James Mountain Road to a two-way bus-only roadway. And I'm not sure what role we're talking about. Is it Upper James? Well, again, um, we will get into this, if you don't mind, Mr. Deputy Mayor, when we get into the presentation. But certainly there's a lot of pressure in the community uh, to talk about one way and two way. And uh, my learning experience in the past year is that one way and two way is not an outcome. It's an input to an outcome. And there might be some cases where one way is better. There may be some cases where two way is better. But it's certainly not an end unto itself in the same way transit is not an end unto itself. It's an input. It's an ingredient to some kind of an output. It depends on what kind of cake you want to bake. It, it really becomes part of the decision metric. But we are offering up, I think there are a couple of initiatives that council is interested in looking at. I think Cannon and Queen Street, for example, are two uh, potential candidates for us to take a look at in the short term, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Yeah, I think this actually says two-way bus-only roadway. So it's not about converting one way to two-way. It's talking about actual dedicating two lanes on James Mountain for buses only. Is that my understanding of what that says? Christine is, I think... For you, Mr. Jeopardy, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, yes, you're, you're correct, Councillor. That is um, a possible initiative that has been identified as part of the overall citywide uh, transit improvements. Um, eventually, we could investigate uh, James Mountain Road as a, a bus-only access. Appreciate it. Uh, do we have, I didn't, again, I didn't see it in here, but you know, it is a pretty comprehensive report. Do we have the, the numbers on peak hours, for example, uh, how many people commute from, commute from the mountain to the, the lower city? Christine is shaking her head no. We don't have those numbers. I think, again, when I'm looking at assessments and setting priorities, back to your point, 
uh, where we set the priorities and, and expenditures and, 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 and options that we're, we're looking at. Uh, obviously, the experience on the mountain is one uh, is unique as well, uh, because when, like I said, when it takes somebody an hour to get from McMaster University to Garth and Stone Church, there's an issue, uh, and they're not going to take public transit. So uh, that's one of my concerns is we've got pinch points. We have a transportation network is not as efficient as the east, west, and the lower city. And it seems to me it's taking a back seat in the context of some of the uh, the things that have been identified here. So I'm a bit concerned. Well, we want to stop that, Mr. Deputy Mayor. If that's been happening, that's exactly what we want to stop as a result of integrating all these programs so they all move together. Uh, together. And the other thing we want to stop is any sense of uh, transportation initiatives moving forward on a fragmented basis or on an ad hoc basis or because they're politically popular. What we really hope for is to move the transportation program forward based on a plan that's been adopted by council in, in the whole. Because we know there's not enough money and we know there won't be for the f future. What we need is through a conversation with council is to bring you the full list and have you uh, give us direction on what the priority are. Understanding that over time we have to adapt. Things change that we didn't foresee and, and so it's, it's, it's a case of an implementation plan that you bring back perhaps on an annual basis and it's updated on an annual basis to take into account changes that have occurred over the current year. And I really appreciate that. I just was highlighting uh, some of the issues from a mountain perspective. But when I go through the report, you do really break it down to integral, comprehensive uh, ways of looking at uh, a strategic plan for transportation. And uh, from that perspective, it actually raised my comfort level because it appears that we're going to uh, look at the plan versus uh, you know, political preferences. And I'd rather take the, the comprehensive approach versus a political approach. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Whitehead. Councillor Pearson, please. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Don and Chris. I'm um, certainly looking forward for the, to the rest of the presentation. But a simple question, it was just raised when Councillor Collins asked about the $800 million capital, and you're saying that's in 2008 dollars, correct? So it, are all the figures in there in 2008 dollars? I need to clarify that. Yes, they are, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So all of these will be, because I'm seeing operating at 12.2 million from day one, we don't know when day one is, correct? That's correct. Okay, I just wanted to be sure of that. And the question, I know the concern has been raised of the 100% funding. I think the simple thing would be just to be, be being requested be removed. So it would appear, Metrolink. It appear, Mr. Deputy Mayor, that we have that direction or we're going to get that direction before we leave here today is to remove reference to the $800 million and replace it with 100% capital funding. And we'd be happy to take that as direction uh, arising from uh, your discussion today, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pearson. Councillor Marula. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, the first question, I want to thank uh, the presenters, uh, Chris Don. Um, but I, some of the questions around the table, I think uh, we need to refresh what the objective and purpose of LRT is. So could, could somebody just give a brief synopsis of what the actual, the purpose and objective of the LRT is? Because some of the questions, I think, aren't in sync with what our purpose and objective is. So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. What is the purpose of LRT? Yeah, I think through you, Deputy Mayor, you know, a catalyst for uh, supporting planned and, uh, and responsible growth. And um, when you look at, for instance, the corridor uh, area that's been identified, as Don mentioned, and you contrast that with some other areas of the city, do we have any other areas of the city that, city that would fit the same criteria so well for, for an LRT line, such as the B line? Well, uh, I, I think perhaps the way, the way I look at transit planning or transportation planning is I look at the major destinations. And what's really interesting is, is all the work that the, our, our long range planning staff and Christine Newbold is here to talk about that today, have done in terms of the nodes and corridors planning. And what's really interesting is of all of the um, all of the key destinations along the B line, for example, extending all the way from Eastgate into the downtown, all the growth here in the downtown, Columbia International College, McMaster University, and the future Dundas, and then the same thing with the A line, all the way from the airport to uh, Mohawk College to the hospitals at the crest of the mountain, uh, all the businesses in the CBD, the new medical center, and then extending out into the waterfront. I, th I think that those are two pretty natural corridors in terms of developing rapid transit on. 
from a transit perspective, um, about half of our ridership is in this corridor, a little less than half of our ridership, and that's uh, taking us back to 2007, 2008. That's what gave Hamilton a leg up in terms of is this going to be a transportation program? Is it going to be an initiative or a city building initiative? And we're still trying to, to nail that one down. Uh, certainly growing the A line in the same way the B line has been growing. What we're trying to do is, is improve the convenience to public transportation. And as Councillor Whitehead pointed out, ideally the whole escarpment would, would be running at a five minute frequency so that anyone living on the escarpment could walk out to the corner and not even have to have a bus schedule. In the interim, if we bring the A line up to the same level of service and perhaps Mohawk and Rymel Road over time, then it's a way of getting there. It's a way of providing that convenience. So in as much as you still have to walk from your home out to Mohawk or out to, uh, out to Upper James, the idea is, is when you get there, you don't need to know the schedule. And, and that's when transit ridership will really start to grow. So what we want to do is enhance the A-line, bring it up to the same service level as B-line, because what it does is the A-line touches every service on the, on the escarpment. And so what we want to do by enhancing the A-line, it's, it's to serve the airport and the hospital and the downtown and the waterfront, but more importantly, as a trans transit initiative, it greatly, greatly enhances the access to the service and the convenience of use of the service on the escarpment without bringing the whole level of service on the escarpment up. So it's, it's an interim measure that will have really, really significant impact in terms of ridership growth. Okay. And the one can't happen without the other. So obviously, so in essence, the B-line would be the foundation of that, of that uh, corridor. To you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Well, the, I think um, one of the, the discussion points we're going to have going forward is LRT will attract ridership faster than conventional public transit. Um, bus rapid transit, in turn, will attract ridership faster than conventional public transit. That's one side of the equation. The other side of the equation is improved overall service levels for the public transit program will generate as much or more ridership to ensure a successful LRT down the road. And that's why we're putting the whole, we're suggesting we put the whole package in front of the province, because both, both directions will get us there. What we're not getting is a clear uh, direction or a clear response from the province in which direction to take LRT, develop the transit program, or move the two of them along uh, together, which is really what we're suggesting is a strategy to go forward to the province with. And to you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor, with respect to the capital uh, cost, my position from day one related to the LRT has always been based on the commitment that Metrolinx has made, and that being the 100% capital. Um, just through you, do we have representation on Metrolinx presently at, at the table? Yeah, actually, uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, he's sitting just to my left, Richard Corsell. Okay, so uh, so Richard uh, is our represent representative on Metrolinx, and we we have no political representative on Metrolinx. No, there's none. So, not just us. So it's uh, Richard's our representative, and there's a number of other representatives from other municipalities. But that's the way it's set up. Okay, and there's nothing that's been formally provided to the community um, that contradicts their commitment of 100% infrastructure funds since 2008, I believe, or seven? Through you, Deputy Mayor, nothing formally has been presented to us that would contradict what they said earlier, no. Okay, because I'm just a little concerned that if we go down the road of trying to apologize on behalf of Metrolinx or the province, it basically provides them with an out not to provide the capital infrastructure necessary. Um, so I, I, at best, we need to look at this and say that we're committed to this project on, the, on that commitment that Metrolinx has made. To give them an out at this point, and I'm a little upset or a little discouraged by Mayor Bertino's comments because it lends credence to the fact that we might be giving them an out, and I'm not prepared to do that today. So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, with respect to uh, the business case and the synergy of the stadium, I think this is another important component because nowhere with everyone being redeveloped and the fact that Scott Park has been identified, um, have we worked through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, with respect to finding some synergies with the new stadium? Um, Don, I can turn that over to you. Our land use planners, I think, have looked at every square inch uh, along that corridor and what opportunities present themselves. So I don't know, if Christine, if you want to comment on that or, or uh, any member of our staff in terms of uh, 
uh, what opportunities uh, lend themselves to a, uh, uh, you know, to uh, good synergies between the growth that's occurring at Ivor Wynn and, uh, and the transit system that we're putting in front of council. So has there been any specific, I know Paul Johnson has been, uh, has been directly connected with the planning that's going on in the Ivorwind precinct, and I know that you know transit is a, is a key component of what's possible there. But Christine Justin or oh, Justin or one of doesn't matter, someone. I was going to say I have not been involved specifically in the stadium precinct, but in terms of the overall Beeline corridor work that was going going on, uh, the area around the stadium is certainly identified as an important place on the corridor uh, that needs to be accessed by an efficient transportation system. So it is a destination. We consider it as a destination, an important place that would make sense for certainly rapid transit um, stops or stations um, and potentially some additional uh, uh, development in that area to uh, really capitalize on a lo the, the, the place uh, that it is in terms of an important um, uh, recreational component mm -hmm. uh, at that location. Christine, and then Justin. Uh, and just to add to um, the, the, the land use component, in terms of the um, planning design and engineering work for the Beeline LRT, we have certainly uh, considered the, uh, the stadium and, and stadium planning uh, to date in terms of the, the station location and design and uh, continue to do that and, and uh, uh, communicate with, with Paul Johnson and his staff as well. All right, Justin, anything to add to that? or? Um, well, just in terms of the station design, there's an extra layover track as well to accommodate peak demands from station unloading and offloading. So. Okay. So there's some specific designs being contemplated for the Ivoin precinct. And I know in the conversations that the councillor has been involved in uh, and with Paul Johnson and uh, the consultant, I think there's been a, a variety of uh, expectations that have been raised by the community and, uh, and obviously, uh, you know, well-designed, uh, transportation access via an LRT or whatever method ends up being ultimately built there uh, is going to be key to the success of that particular area. So uh, it's not, it's on our radar for sure. I just think formally, so it's formally being addressed then? Oh yeah. Okay, fair enough. Uh, and just lastly, um, this question I guess would be for Don. The B-Line, you had mentioned that 50% of our ridership uh, access is the B-Line. Uh, from a financial perspective, it still shows that it's being subsidized. Um, presently, why, why would that be considering uh, the the level of, uh, of ridership? Actually, uh, to be accurate, about a little less than 50% of our total ridership is in that corridor between Eastgate and McMaster. So that would be the accumulated total of the King Street, uh, the Delaware, the oh, I see. the, the okay. universities, and there are times during the day when that service actually runs out of profit. It's certainly a profit generating. Anytime you see more than about 45, 50 people on a bus, uh, the revenue is, is it's generating uh, profit revenue. So 50 is about the turning point on a bus. So if you ever wanted, wondered whether the bus uh, service was making money, that's about when it's making money is when uh, you have a little more than a full seated load on a bus. Okay, so it's still being subsidized globally, but it's still one of the most profitable. Well, the profit is no real profit and loss, but the the revenue in excess of cost in that corridor is paying for other areas of the city where uh, expenses exceed revenue. So it, it all balances out. Which then that raises the question to you, Mr. Mr. Deputy Mayor, with, with respect to creating a separate entity for the A and B line in order to tie those revenues directly to the operating of, of the LRT and, and really separate the, the remainder of the system, would that not be uh, something that would be prudent to consider? Well, we, we actually have a slide, Mr. Mayor, if you'd allow me to come back to that during my presentation. What we attempt to do is say, and if we, when these 18 or 20 buses come off the road, so what happens to that money? And so we'll, we'll show you what, how that money is reapplied to the LRT. Oh, so that's, okay, that's fair enough. All right, thank you, Mr. Deputy. Thank you, Councilor Murley. have Councilor Farr, then Councilor Partridge. Councilor Farr. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, a lot of great questions to just two of uh, a plethora of qualified staff. Uh, Don and um, Chris uh, monopolizing the morning thus far, and I guess that's our fault, but uh, that's okay. A lot of great questions, and I'm sure many uh, will be able to devolve um, 
uh, get into in a greater detail in, in just a bit here. So I'll, I'll try to keep it general. Um, first of all, very impressive report and a great start to a very important day where we see a lot of citizens in the gallery along with the, um, the uh, qualified staff. Um, it's an all-encompassing, detailed report, but at the same time, it's very uh, simplistic and very consistent to a vision uh, that I just want to try to get a date on and see where we are um, with that vision now as it relates to all of this great work that's been done in the past that, got, that has gotten us to this point, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So through you to Don, I know um, all of what we see here, according to your report, um, uh, is based on a, a council directive, a vision statement on rapid trans transit, which was established uh, when, and maybe you could speak just briefly to how, how it was that this vision statement guided this in, uh, intrinsic report. Um, I, I might ask you, could I just ask you to, to give me that question again, if you don't? Sure. Uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So we have um, a council-adopted vision statement on rapid transit, and it says uh, somewhere in the confines of what I read this weekend that it was that rapid transit vision, vision statement that guided um, our, our Christine Lee Morrison's, our Steve Malloy's, and all those other people behind us, and you and your staff, Jim Doms, and everyone else. So why is that relevant? Why is it important? And, and, and uh, is it still true as we move forward, the vision statement on, on rapid transit? Absolutely. I believe it is. That's what we've founded the report on. What it all comes down to at the end of the day is, is funding flow. Funding flow uh, from the private sector, from the federal government, provincial government, local government. And uh, what we've tried to do with this report is prevent a gap from happening. We had really good momentum towards our LRT initiative and we don't want that momentum to stop, which is another reason why we've presented these alternatives to committee. It may be months or perhaps years, we don't know uh, when a decision will come on LRT and we don't want to lose the momentum. So that's why we've backfilled essentially with an option to grow the transportation program in the meantime because, you know, clearly this can go forward as an LRT initiative, as a transportation growth initiative or both. We're just trying to, to convince the province that we have a plan and depending on how the funding flows, how much flows, whether it's capital or whether it's operating, we can change gears and, and we're ready. Mr. Deputy Mayor. Okay. And, and my only other question, and I know there'll be plenty more as we uh, break it down throughout the day and probably into the night, Mr. Deputy Mayor, but uh, we're hearing now again in a public session from Chris and you um, that we have not been told otherwise. When we got into this back in 2008, um, it was based on a 100% capital funded by Metrolinx. Absolutely, absolutely correct, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So if that is the case, and we're here now, February 25th at City Hall in 2013, so many years later, can we assume then that, that Metrolinx has not been told otherwise? Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I. I have no way of answering that question other than any communication we've had with Metrolinx hasn't been any, anything other than 100% capital for the city of Hamilton and, and the only formal position we have from the province is the one that they gave back in 2007, 2008. So there's been no discussion and nothing formal and again that's really one of the primary mandates or one of the primary um, um, things we hope to instigate with sending this report off to the province is to, is to flush you with that number. I think we all want to get at that number and we can't get at that number, we can't have that discussion until this report's in the hands of the province. Give us a few days <laughs> and, and welcome Richard and goodbye David. Thank you. Thank you Councillor Far Councillor Partridge please. Yes, thank you Mr. Deputy Mayor and um, uh, most of your questions, uh, some of the questions that have been asked are going to be answered in the, the next part of your presentation. So I just have a couple of, of quick ones. Would you mind going back to uh, slide number 11, please? The economic prosperity of the region. That's the one. Well, our, Whoop, sorry. right there. There yeah, we go. That one. I just think this is such an important slide. And um, when, when, you, when you said 60%, of the um, uh, trade flows through Hamilton. Uh, you know, that, that's such an important part of the business case that we need to make. And I'm wondering if you could just speak to that a little bit, a little bit further. 
Well, yeah, I think to you, Deputy Mayor, um, you know, sometimes I think because we, we get so much into the details and the weeds on things that we never take the moment to kind of lift our heads up and realize where are we in terms of, you know, certainly when you talk about the economy of Ontario, like, you know, how important are we? I mean, I put this slide up just to show you just geographically our location relative to, uh, you know, the major uh, transportation routes that, uh, that carry the economy. And so, uh, you know, it, it's, it's an important slide, not just for today, but for down the road. And there's a reason why the province is forecasting greater population and employment growth. And, and my concern, I think, at the end of the day, though, is that, um, you know, is there a disconnect within the provincial government when it comes to the growth that it plans for and how it achieves it? And so uh, what I think is critically important from a transportation standpoint is that not just the movement of people within a municipality or movement of people between municipalities through GO, but from a goods movement standpoint, you know, short sea shipping, rail, air, we have all of these. And then the major highway system. And the plans that you're hearing right now about widening, you know, the QEW, I mean, really at the end of the day, the actual amount of capacity that adds to the overall system is very little it will not address the kind of growth that the province is now talking about in 30 years. And as we all know, transportation systems don't turn around overnight. Um, so um, I put this slide up there just to remind ourselves of the context that we live in. And uh, I mean, really interesting is that little dotted line that you see, the green one, the Continental One, uh, that is a major you know, federal uh, government uh, uh, investment to move the economy of the US right to our border. So again, it's, it's there just simply to say to you that um, Hamilton is a critical part of, uh, of the province of Ontario's economy. And we need to, in working with the province and working with our, our municipal uh, colleagues, uh, ensure that we are in step uh, and that we're not uh, leaving it to MTO to figure out uh, you know, what the transportation system ought to look like. In, in my way of thinking, the province through MTO, but also through municipal fairs, uh, as well as economic development, um, they, they need to be working together, just as I think the municipalities need to be working together to achieve what someone is coming up with in terms of growth within Ontario in the next 30 to 40 years, because as you know, 30 years is nothing. You know, it's, it's here tomorrow. And the plans that we, you know, we develop together with the province uh, will enable, you know, when we talk quality of life for our citizens, we're talking quality of life for Southern Ontario, I would say the province and largely the, the country. So, you know, if that sounds like it's too big, it's not. Uh, and we got to be thinking in that context. Well, and I would uh, add to that that we're also thinking, and we should be thinking about the quality of life for not only our children, but our children's children, because that's what we're talking about going forward. Such an important slide, and I would encourage you, it should be in every presentation, not only at this council table, but certainly when you go to the province. Um, a nice segue, though, because one of the comments you made, uh, I believe, Chris, was how critical it is for our inter-regional partnerships and relationships in terms of transportation. And my question through you, Deputy Mayor, have, have preliminary discussions taken place? Are there meetings underway? What is the sense of the, the group dynamic? The, uh, uh, through you, uh, Deputy Mayor, and thank you very much for that question. And uh, the city managers and CAOs of Peel, uh, Halton, including Burlington, um, Kitchener, Waterloo, Niagara, and Hamilton, uh, and senior staff, uh, land use, economic development, uh, transportation have, have been meeting to discuss where we're at with respect to growth within the Southern Ontario region, and in particular, how that growth is going to be achieved vis-a-vis uh, -vis the transportation system. Um, and so that's the conversation we've been having. We have no political direction as of yet from our respective uh, councils to begin working uh, in a much more cooperative uh, uh, alliance, if you will. Um, uh, to, uh, to make sure that the municipalities and the province are, are on the same page when it comes to making sure our land use and infrastructure uh, strategies are in sync with where the province sees population and employment going. Um, this is very new, uh, but it seems pretty 
obvious that, you know, we should care as much about how transportation works in Kitchener, Waterloo and Peel as they should care about how it works here in Hamilton. And, and if we want to get a little bit, you know, selfish here, if you want to call it that, I mean, uh, our airport is doing good. We think it can do better. Uh, we want to make sure that there's a relationship between those that are responsible for Pearson and those that are responsible for Moreau that we accomplish as much as possible. I mean, there's this looming possibility of an airport in Pickering, which I think will just only kind of dilute the pool. Um, I think we need to kind of stay focused on the two airports you have right now that are moving a lot of goods uh, and a lot of people and that we need to kind of strengthen that opportunity and that, that will bear fruit for Hamilton. So, I mean, again, the days of us kind of, you know, leaving it to MTO to sort all this out uh, and us not being involved in this kind of relationship is a mistake and the, the CAOs and the city managers are getting together. You can expect that we'll be coming to you, I would say, in the next couple of months. Um, I know the, uh, the mayors are, are, this was an item that was going to be discussed. Uh, we had that snowstorm, <laughs> so it fell off the table, but we're meeting again, though, uh, uh, very soon, and I, I got a feeling that through, um, you know, the Lumco Marco meetings that uh, uh, there is going to be some priority placed on this relationship, this alliance, if you will, of, uh, of uh, Western municipalities of the GTA. No, and I couldn't agree more, and uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, um, you know, we do need to care about transportation in all the outlying communities, whether it's Guelph, whether it's Kitchener, because we do have folks from those communities who are going to our universities, and they need to be able to be able to uh, transport back and forth in, in a way that is going to help our economy, but also help them and vice versa. We have students from this area who are going up to, uh, to Guelph University, amazing universities up there. And we have airports in, in Kitchener, Waterloo, and London with that triangle of, of trade that's opportunity that's there with Hamilton. We can't forget that. Um, just two more comments. Thank you for putting the L back in LRT. That is so important. And, and I, you know, I raised that before because it is LRT. That's what our community knows. That's what they understand. The other thing is, last question for you, Don. You've come a long way in the last couple of years. Do we have you cycling yet? <laughs> <laughs> That's just rhetorical. You don't have to answer that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Partridge. Mayor Bettina, second time, please. Thank you. Just briefly, uh, Councillor Clark made a very uh, insightful con comment about trial balloons and people, governments will throw things out. And that's what they're doing right now. For instance, I was on the GO Transit Board, and we uh, control 50,000 parking spots. And I said, well, how about a dollar a spot? You do the math, five days a week, you end up with a lot of million dollars. Don't even go there. Don't even think about it. So now that one has come up again. And I'm sure they're going to hear from talk shows and however they get their information how they feel about that. But specifically to the point that was made, when we spoke to Mr. Shirelli and he said, how are you making up with your federal partners? I'm sure Chris Murray will recall the conversation went, well, how are you making out with your federal partners? Because you're the guys who are supposed to put the big funding piece together. We didn't know we were all chipping in on the big move and the 100%. So we threw that balloon right back. Uh, our, there has never been a message, I'm sure Chris Murray and Don Hall and uh, certainly myself, that we're back, we've backed off of that commitment. But all I would say, Mr. Deputy Mayor and Chris, and I, I'd be pleased to hear your comment, nobody knows what the final outcome is going to be. So we better be prepared for whatever comes along. But would, would you agree with the point, uh, the meeting with Mr. Shirelli, Chris. Through you, uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, yes, I would, uh, very clearly. Um, it was a bit of a surprise, I think, to all of us that this was the sudden veering, uh, uh, but as, it, as you say, I mean, it could very well just be a, a, a trial balloon. I think the good news, though, is, is that uh, we have more than an LRT plan. Uh, we have a transit plan in front of you. and. Uh, uh, and very emphatically, we can restate uh, the original assumptions that got us into this, and that was, uh, you know, 100% funding. Uh, and now we can put something in front of them that speaks to the LRT investment uh, in some specifics, but also in terms of other investments that need to be 
uh, made in the city of Hamilton uh, in order for the province to achieve what they want to achieve, and that is, you know, more population employment growth in a community that actually does planning uh, and knows how to make investment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have no further speakers on the list, so Chris, it's back to you. So with that, uh, we're going to turn the floor over to Christine Newbold, who's going to remind us of our land use planning context, and, uh, and she will talk about uh, how this strategy that you have in front of you fits with all of that. So Christine. Just going to butt in here very quickly, Mr. Deputy Mayor, while Christine's made her way to the mic. Uh, we left out, I left out two very key uh, contributors to this report. Uh, Brian Hollingworth and uh, Lawrence Liu uh, from IBI Consulting. Uh, they essentially dropped uh, everything they were doing to help us out. And um, Brian has a fairly lengthy history here with the City of Hamilton, very intimate knowledge of the uh, of the transportation master plan as he's done, uh, I, I think, the bulk majority of the work with respect to the initial plan itself and, and the renewal. So uh, Brian, both personally and professionally, is very uh, heavily invested in the City of Hamilton, very personally interested in the, in the success of City of Hamilton. And it was thrilling that uh, he would drop what he was doing and, uh, and help us out uh, with this report over the last several months, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thanks, Don. Okay, thank you. Um, we're very pleased to be here today to work uh, uh, on this project in, uh, from planning, working on this project together in the city uh, with our, our colleagues in Public Works and the transportation section there. Uh, I want to back up a Christine, little bit. We, can you kind of bring the mic right up to you there? Thank you. Is that better? I think it's better, yes. Okay. So you've delved right into the nitty-gritty details of the report, but I do want to uh, back up a little bit uh, and help you understand the planning context or remind you of the planning context that we are working with, uh, and the transportation and land use planning work that has been done since amalgamation here. We have developed a very strong integrated transportation and planning framework, and I'll provide uh, a brief overview of that to remind us where we've been to, how we've progressed on our journey, and to help set some of the context for Dr. Tran's presentation, uh, as well as the remainder of the discussion today. Yeah, I always start out with key provincial directions, of course, because in planning we take our direction from the province. Uh, planning at the City of Hamilton since amalgamation has progressed concurrently with several key provincial policy initiatives. These provincial and regional level initiatives provide our key directions for how we grow our cities, how we plan our transportation, our transportation systems, and they reflect the challenges that the province and our communities are facing. Some of the challenges that Chris Murray uh, has also mentioned um, are transitioning uh, economies, shifting demographic characteristics, increasing congestion in many parts of the region, and also but at the same time, uh, we have the challenge while addressing those, those other challenges of how we protect what's valuable in our communities and in our province, items such as, as the natural and cultural heritage resources that, that we have. So the first two documents on this slide, I know um, all of council members have seen these before in many presentations from planning. The provincial policy statement, which defines, defines the province's interest in land use planning and development matters. And the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, our regional plan focused on building a stronger, prosperous communities by managing growth in the region. Both these documents call for building complete, compact, uh, sustainable communities and require the coordination of land use policy and growth planning with infrastructure planning. The third document, the big move is our regional transportation plan, uh, figures very prominently in the transportation portfolio. It establishes a vision for a seamless, coordinated, efficient and equitable user-centered transportation system for the region. And the big move contains the policies and actions and uh, proposes investment strategies for transportation and transit specifically in the region. So moving here directly to Hamilton, Hamilton's planning since amalgamation had, has echoed the pro province's directions. 
We've had three main initiatives since amalgamation that have directed transportation and land use planning over the past 10 years. The Growth Related Integrated Development Strategy, or GRIDS, uh, Transportation Master Plan, which was developed in conjunction with GRIDS, and the Urban Hamilton Official Plan, the land use policy piece that was completed in 2009 and approved by the province in, in 2011. All three of these documents provide the policy direction for how we grow our city and plan and manage our transportation network for the future. Uh, as a refresher on GRIDS, GRIDS is our growth strategy and it was all about coordinating growth with infrastructure. In GRIDS, we posed the questions, how are we going to grow our city in the future to, buy, to provide for a growing and changing population, um, changing economy in a manner that is sustainable, efficient, and creates great places for our residents to live? How are we going to link our population and the important places in our communities that we want to create and support? And how will we link those populations to the jobs that they need to lead a productive and engaging life? Council's chosen growth concept through the GRIDS process uh, was a, a note and quarter concept, essentially developing the city around existing or envisioned nodes or places in our community um, that are linked together with an efficient transportation system and developing new communities that have access to employment opportunities, access that's provided along corridors, through higher order transit, conventional transit, alternative transportation, and the automobile. The new urban official plan takes the growth concept from grids and establishes it in land use and planning policy. This document uh, contains the detailed growth and development policies and um, when, when it's implemented, it brings us closer to realizing that growth concept that was envisioned in grids. The urban structure is a part of our official plan. Um, as you can see from that map and recall the grids map, they're very closely aligned or, or precisely aligned. And uh, it identifies those nodes and corridors that will be the focus of growth in our city. And in order to ensure that those places of growth and intensification remain livable and sustainable, these areas have to be supported by higher order transit. In newly developing areas, the growth must take place at densities that support the establishment of transit. Transit must be part of every new community. And the urban structure also identifies and directs the built forms and commu community designs that are required to support transportation or transit and active transportation. The official plan contains specific principles on how we plan and develop our nodes and corridors. And these principles illustrate that the, land, the important land use and transportation connection. The first two principles on this slide um, illustrate the importance of transit and alternative transportation to sustaining and creating the nodes and corridors in our city. In addition to those transportation components are the principles of creating our nodes and corridors as focal points of activity through higher residential densities, mixed uses, and as creating the corridors as focal points of activity. Ultimately, these important places in our community become the focus for reurbanization activities. Uh, by that we mean population growth, private and public uh, redevelopment, and infrastructure investment. So already at the highest level of planning, planning policy for growth and development, you can see that the integration of land use planning and transporta transportation planning is a critical direction that our city has taken. We recognize that our transportation, and, uh, infra our tra transportation infrastructure supports our growth objectives and that our growth objectives support our transportation infrastructure. Further policy directions in the official plan call for planning our city so that the car is an option for people, not a necessity. And this is increasingly important in our community as we recognize that for many, many people, an automobile, is ownership, automobile ownership is not an option. Policy directions recognize that planning for new development and redevelopment include um, planning for transit. Those two processes must be integrated. And finally, policy on land use mix, built form, and urban design facilitates a community where active transportation is easy and convenient and therefore a real option for people. Our overall transportation policy is focused on mobility, but not just increasing mobility through transit, but to balance mobility between the different transportation modes, between places in our communities and across the various populations of Hamilton. 
So finally, my presentation has described for you uh, how we have integrated planning, growth, and transportation policy together in, in our planning work since amalgamation. But this integration is not only seen in these documents, but in how we work here in the city organization. Over the past 12 years, we've seen a real shift in how we implement the policies and master plans from um, a project level. Increasingly, we have different departments working together on projects, sometimes special teams put together to bring that variety of expertise and knowledge together to ensure the integration is successful. Uh, shown on this sli these slides are two of the documents um, that have been developed through special teams and special processes with different uh, professions, the Transit or Oriented Development Guidelines and the Main Queen Queenston Corridor Strategy Study work. Uh, are two examples where land use planners, transportation planners, and urban designers have all been put together to work together to creatively advance that integrated policy direction. So land use transportation connection is a critical component of a healthy community, but we no longer see these connections only in planning documents. Um, I want to re reiterate Chris's comments on healthy communities. Um, healthy communities are uh, Planning for healthy communities is a requirement, but it's also necessary from all aspects of, he of, of health. There is the physical and environment health, economic health, or the social and public health aspect of healthy communities, so we can't lose sight of that. And that's all I wanted to say on our planning context. I can take some questions, or if you prefer to address those as part of some of the other discussion, we can do that. Thank you, Christina. I have Councillor Jackson. Thanks, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Just back to slide uh, 23, please, uh, Christine, and thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, one more there. That's great. Sure. So I'm just trying to understand, people are starting to use this term, higher order transit, in your top bullet point. So almost sounds like a church hierarchy, but can you help me understand what do you mean by higher order transit? Mr. Deputy Mayor, through to Christine. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, higher order transit is a term that we use in the planning policy. Uh, it, it generally refers to, tran um, it's differentiated from conventional transit, which is a, <clears throat> a, a, bus, a bus service, a, a traditional bus service, higher order being um, a more frequent or faster express type of service. Um, if we have a specific definition in uh, our, our transit planning, uh, maybe there's another staff that would provide something in addition to that comment. But it, it really differentiates between a faster, more rapid system uh, versus the traditional bus uh, type of system. So if we did a bus rapid transit system, that's not considered a higher order? Yes. Oh, yes, that would is. be. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I just thought you were going in the direction, Christine, of it of has to be team. light rail. No, no. we. Those those types of decisions require very specific study, and at uh, official plan level, we don't provide that type of, of analysis. So the higher order terminology means mm -hmm. how you call a municipality can move a greater number of people in a non-conventional way quicker and more often? Mr. Deputy Mayor, through to Christine, or am I off a bit with my assessment? I think it's a higher frequency type of transit service, whether it be LRT, BRT, or subway. Well, obviously, a cycling obviously wouldn't fall into no, that category. No, cycling is under active car, transportation. The mode of car transportation wouldn't fall into that higher order either? No, that's conventional automobile. So you're basically talking about BRT or LRT. Is that basically where you're going with the higher order? Uh, generally, there might uh, subway would be another one of those. Is there something else someone wants to add to that from the transit planning? For you, Mr. Deputy Chair, I, I think Christine's uh, got that fairly accurate. And the, the official plan talks about the higher order transit being on the primary corridors, and that that's where we should focus our highest order of, of transit available within the city. So it could be express bus. It could be uh, okay. express bus with, with priority over general purpose uh, uh, tra transportation. It could be bus rapid transit. It could be uh, LRT. Okay. Th thank you. I just didn't know where that terminology was automatically taking us. That helps clarify for me. Thanks, both Christines. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Councillor McHattie. 
Thanks, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thanks, Christine. And uh, that's, this has been a key part of this project, obviously, is to align the land use planning with the uh, LRT planning and then back to the places to grow targets that we've been given by the province, uh, particularly accommodating the growth to 2031, uh, which we, we say bring it on. That's great growth, and uh, we know exactly where it's going to go, and uh, we we're ready to, uh, to do that with our transportation planning. I, I guess uh, maybe just a question for you or maybe um, another staff member. Uh, earlier on, uh, possibly maybe two years ago, we had a workshop with the, uh, the, the real estate uh, uh, folks, or, or I guess real estate, but also the Hamilton and Halton Home Builders Association, the developers. Development community. And development community, thanks, uh, Christine. And, and uh, they're obviously going to be a key to, to making the land use vision uh, work on this. We're going to be looking to them to, uh, to develop up and down the corridor in those uh, locations that the Canadian Urban Institute have identified and you've identified through your corridor planning. Um, so in that, uh, I remember reading the, uh, the minutes from that workshop, and there were a number of uh, challenges identified by the developers uh, in terms of our fees, you know, whether it be development charges or uh, our parkland fees. And I know, uh, I mean, we're getting into the D.C. discussion, which is kind of a Mike Zagarek discussion, I guess, uh, with the new D.C. bylaw that will come up in 2014 or 2015. And uh, the idea of differential DCs and, you know, the kind of creative things that we heard about from Dr. Pamela Blay when she was here from Ryerson a couple of years ago or a year ago. Um, but where I'm going with this, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, is uh, has there been a follow-up uh, workshop, meeting, discussion, or series of discussions with the uh, development community? Because I, I just, as we see this kind of thing, uh, where the rubber hits the road, where, where things really happen is with uh, the developers in this case, you know, with the land use changes. Uh, they talked about pre-zoning, and I know we get into the uh, OP sitting at the OMB and the new residential zoning bylaw, but have we had that uh, follow-up workshop? Do we have any more certainty uh, for the development community that they, they know uh, they have a better sense now how they can invest and how they can make it work uh, economically, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor, to you? Through you. To you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, no, we have not had that follow-up discu discussion. Uh, we do. We've been uh, looking at work programs, how best to align those discussions with a variety of, of things going on in terms of node and corridor planning, um, as well as a broader city intensification strategy, because there's issues that would imp that uh, certainly applicable to the broader intensification of the city uh, in that regard as well. So no, we haven't had those follow-up discussions. Okay. So I think, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I think that's probably direction if we can provide that today, uh, maybe to Chris Murray or uh, and Bill, uh, Bill Jansen. And Bill may want to just touch on that, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, Bill Jansen, through you. Okay, Bill. Uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, we do have ongoing discussions, uh, to, to add to uh, Christine's point, we do have ongoing discussions with the home builders, uh, particularly around intensification. I think there is a thinking that uh, for the future, the home builders need to consider uh, growth and development uh, in our existing urban area, particularly uh, opportunities exist on our nodes and corridor areas. Uh, and they would be looking at uh, higher levels of, of transit to be able to uh, create development opportunities um, that uh, are uh, financially feasible. So if we do look at things like uh, reduced parking or zoning, uh, that uh, would assist. We have uh, began uh, discussions with the home builders to create a joint committee to look at opportunities for intensification, and that would ex further explore uh, those uh, initiatives that were developed uh, as part of that uh, ongoing workshop. So we are continuing uh, to talk uh, with the home builders, and the home builders seem to have an increasing level of interest in looking at opportunities uh, for that. That's, uh, that's great to hear, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and I'd like to follow up with you, uh, Bill, on that, because I, I think that's one of the keys to making all this happen, is to get the development community to buy in, uh, make sure what they need uh, to, to make this successful is, uh, is discussed in incredible detail because uh, the devil's in the details and uh, so I'll uh, follow up with you. I'm very interested to hear that committee possibly being set up a joint committee and uh, as you know Mr. Deputy Mayor, Councillor Ferguson Farr and I sit on the LRT task force of the Chamber of Commerce and the, uh, both the Realtors Association and the Home Builders Association have a seat at that table as well. Uh, so. Uh, we hear on, uh, from that end how important this is to, uh, to having this uh, vision uh, play out as, as 
And if I could just add, Deputy Mayor, to the Councillor, uh, I, I thought your question was more focused on the Beeline specific, so I do apologize. I did know about no, no, that's the fine. broader that's, uh, discussion. That's great, Christine. So I think your work uh, and the work of the department uh, is critical to this, and, and really what we're offering the province is a smart growth uh, strategy, uh, a sure thing. You know, invest in Hamilton, and, and we're going to deliver, uh, you know, what, what uh, you want as the province. So this, this uh, your work uh, lays that out very clearly. Thanks, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor McCaddy. I have no further speakers for Christine, so thank you. Thank you. John? Thank, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, while Dr. Tran makes his way to the microphone, our, our newest partner in this initiative, uh, I did uh, misspeak earlier and uh, just uh, need to correct a number that I gave you earlier. I mentioned that uh, as it, uh, our data was based on 2008. Our baseline has actually been updated to 2011, and uh, the reason why we did that was to, it was really a major initiative as part of the work we've done in the past several months, but also to align it to the Canadian Urban Transit Association uh, data, and that's the most current data. So, uh, and so I apologize for that. It's actually 2011 data, not 2008 data, Mr. Mayor, Deputy Mayor. Dr. Tran. Morning. Mr. Deputy Mayor, members of council, pretty excited to be here on a pretty big day for a major topic that will affect our city, uh, not only for this year, but for decades to come. And I'm excited that uh, we'll be able to work together uh, with many different departments to bring this forward. So I'm representing public health services and to talk about transportation and health. Now, typically we've talked talked and thought about transportation, as Don has mentioned, in terms of the social and environmental benefits. And then more recently, economic benefits, and even more recently, health. And that's what I'm going to focus on today. So today's presentation we'll talk about a few different things, but really is about why transportation matters. Matters in terms of a uh, health perspective, a pub public health perspective, and a healthcare perspective. And I'll do that through two parts of the presentation. One is first talking about how relying on automobiles and having a transportation system that's too reliant on automobiles or focused on automobiles may lead to additional health or social problems. And then we're going to talk about shifting that priority uh, to what the transportation master plan is and the vision of the city towards shifting the priority a little bit more to pedestrians, so shifting the balance and so that, as Christine mentioned, automobiles are not a necess necessity, but rather an option. So that we focus a little bit more on pedestrians, cyclists, and public transit, and how we can really do this to really build a healthier community, which is one of the main goals and objectives of City Council. So why does transportation matters? For some of us, there's a few th areas that we've thought about in terms of health that are very intuitive to us, but there's others that you may not have thought about. And there's really five areas where transportation influences health. There's the air quality point of view, which most people uh, can think of intuitively in terms of transportation. There's also the injuries or safety part, physical activity, mental health, and equity. Now, if you look at this list, you'll notice that these aren't small health issues. These are major drivers of our health, of our population, of our city, and as well as health care costs. Air quality uh, is also, uh, air quality is physical activity, mental health, and, and equity are also parts of our public health departmental business plan and or the city's corporate plan. So when we actually address transportation and to transform into what we're looking at transforming it into, we can actually address not only major health impacts of our community, but also the underlying healthcare costs that we know that are continually to increase and to actually directly or indirectly impact the bottom line of the municipalities as well. So you may have seen this slide. This is about air pollution, and this is from a Clean Air Hamilton report. And we know that transportation, whether it's cars or trucks, the more cars and trucks we have on the road, the more pollution we have. And air pollution contributes to health in a number of ways. 
We have over 100 premature deaths each year and over 700 respiratory and cardiovascular hospital admissions. We traditionally think of air quality in terms of lungs, but actually a lot of the impacts happen from a cardiovascular level, uh, from heart attacks. We also know that having more cars and trucks on the road um, also leads to more injuries, whether they're fatal or non-fatal injuries. Now these can include motor vehicle collisions, um, but particularly uh, we also have more vulnerable users uh, of our city that it actually impacts traffic related pedestrian and cycling injuries. And this is particularly of note because if we want to look about which populations it it impacts the most. We're talking about uh, those in the different spectrum of the ages, uh, very young children, as well as those who are uh, over 65 or older. And given what Chris has already mentioned in terms of our demographics, we know that we are moving towards a more, a shifting a demographic that will see more and more seniors uh, up to over 20% uh, by 2031. So this any problem that we have in this area will continue uh, to be exacerbated in the future. And when we have safety concerns, whether it's with children or with seniors, people become a bit more scared to go walking, taking or cycling, and that's contributing to our levels of physical inactivity. Uh, we're seeing that actually only 7% of Canadian children and 15% of adults are actually meeting the physical activity recommended guidelines. And physical activity is a huge health and economic issue. Uh, we're talking about biggest drivers uh, of obesity, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, some cancers, mental health. These are again, biggest causes of mortality, morbidity uh, in our community, as well as major healthcare uh, and indirect impacts. So there's estimates that uh, the economic cost for physical inactivity alone is $6.8 billion in Canada for 2009. This is a bit of an under-representation because it only includes uh, seven of the top chronic diseases and it doesn't actually include the mental or social uh, benefits of physical activity itself. And we've gotten to the point where our obesity and overweight rates and physical activity rates have not improved and we're coming with a growing problem where uh, if you actually measure overweight and obesity levels. So typically a lot of our data comes from self-reported. So people tend to say that they're a little bit taller and a little bit skinnier than they actually are. But when you actually measure in Stats Can did a special report uh, a number of years ago, they found that in the Hamilton and surrounding regions, uh, we see that about three out of four adults in Hamilton are either overweight or obese. And again, that's contributing to rising costs in healthcare, whether it's diabetes, cardiovascular disease. So when people aren't able to use, to bike or to walk to work, uh, many of us use and rely on automobiles. Unfortunately, automobiles aren't for everyone. And that's because not everyone is able to drive for a different number of reasons. Uh, one is the affordability issue. I think there's one of the estimates uh, that to the cost, the annual cost, the average annual cost to, to buy, maintain, a, a including depreciation is about $12,000 a year. So that, that limits the number of people who can actually rely on driving themselves. Uh, there's also age and physical limitations. You know, we know that a five-year-old kid can't drive. <laughs> and as we get older, um, we know that seniors are less likely to, to drive themselves or either relying on someone else to drive them or needing a public transit system or walkable communities, uh, which again becomes more of an issue as uh, our demographics start changing. So this is where we want to move towards. That's part of our vision for the master transportation plan is a transportation system that's active, that really puts people first. Now we're not talking about completely getting rid of cars. We're, we're just talking about 
starting to rebalance the system where cars are an option but not a necessity. So we want to start getting people out of us out of cars and focusing at, on a transportation system that puts people first, uh, whether that's pedestrians, cyclists, or transit users. So the next few slides will demonstrate really is what the opposite of what I've already mentioned in terms of what are the positive health impacts that we can achieve if we start working and moving forward with the master transportation plan that uh, the city has outlined and is recommending to council. We know that as we get people out of the cars and there's less cars, fewer cars on the road, cars and trucks, uh, we are gonna have less air pollution. So cleaner air uh, leading to lower rates of heart and lung diseases. We also know there's major environmental benefits to improving our air quality, including uh, uh, climate change. We also know that when we reduce the number of vehicles on the road and shift towards using transit or reducing the distance traveled uh, by motor vehicles, that we actually will start to see uh, fewer motor vehicle collisions, pedestrians and, and cycling injuries. Uh, there's research in the United States and across countries that more people use public transit or other modes, you actually see the traffic fatality rates uh, go down. So you're talking about less deaths and disabilities uh, that are both not only physical, but there's also a mental uh, uh, impact to being involved in a traffic uh, collision. And again, the biggest impacts we're talking about are, is the impact to children, seniors, as well as any uh, with physical limitations. And when we have safer communities, people are more likely to be active. They're more comfortable to walk bike, take transit, to work, to see others, to other opportunities, and we have a, a more active community. This is a really interesting slide, and it looks at really globally how this plays out. Now you look at, it really compares, um, looks at countries such as United States and Canada, New Zealand and Australia, as well as many of the European countries. And what you see from the slide is, has a proportion or the number of people who decide instead of taking cars to, to use walking, biking, or public transit, as that goes up, we see significant reductions in the obesity rates, and that's worldwide. And in addition to physical benefits of physical activity, uh, there's also mental health benefits. Uh, there's increasing and emerging literature and research that shows that physical activity uh, reduces symptoms of depression and anxiety. Um, I know this for pers uh, personally as if I go out for a run or do something and go for a nice uh, walk or bike ride, uh, I feel more energetic and uh, have less stress. And, and also, uh, there's also other improvements such as increased social interaction, networking capital. Now this is both from a physical activity point of view, but also as people walk in, in pedestrian oriented communities and neighborhoods, uh, there's a stronger sense of community. But also if you improve transit, uh, you also notice uh, better opportunities for people to visit and be uh, connected to each other. Uh, Christine talked about transportation as linking people to places as well as to jobs, but it also links people or connects people uh, to other people and to each other. And in terms of the type of community we want, a, a strong transportation system, uh, one that is really inclusive, that allows everyone to be able to uh, link to or connect to places, jobs, uh, opportunities, and others, uh, we see a, a more inclusive community. This means that there's less barriers and we give more people in our community 
opportunities, uh, opportunities to participate and really meet their full potential, whether it's in terms of getting educational opportunities, formal education or other informal education and participating in the workforce. Uh, it also means uh, improved access when we need it to health or social services. I know as a family doctor, there's times where, I, you know, the best uh, place for someone to get medical attention for a specific provider is in a different part of the city. And, and at, at times it's um, my choice of where I can refer them to is limited by their ability to get to certain places. And then we're also talking about increased citizen engagement. As People can feel free to access services, opportunities. They're more engaged in the community, whether it's attending council meetings, whether it's participating in voting, uh, education, employment opportunities, or volunteer opportunities. And this is really, uh, as we've, as Chris has mentioned, probably in the vision of the city and, and is also confirmed by council, this is the type of community we're looking for, one that really um, is inclusive and engages our citizens. Thank you, Dr. Tran. I have Councillor Farr, Councillor Jackson, Councillor McCaddy, and Councillor Johnson. Councillor Flar. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, Dr. Tran, really appreciate your enthusiasm. I'm going to call you Dr. Tran Sit. Uh, that was a great, great presentation, and uh, it's much appreciated. And it's uh, as noted off the top uh, with the introductory comments by both Chris and uh, Don. Um, yeah, it's a key element of our presentation, I, I think, and uh, you covered it off very well. I'm wondering if, um, if um, Mr. Deputy Mayor, through you, when you talk about stuff like um, Hamilton's uh, obesity rate and our air quality, are there ways in which we can be specific in making our case and in our presentation where we can show a comparator and see there are some areas where this community is unfortunately uh, worse off than maybe others, or have we already contemplated that through you for this presentation? You, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I just wanted a clarification. Is that comparing ourselves in terms of overweight obesity rates or air quality compared to other municipalities uh, right. here? Yes, yeah, I, I, are there areas, I mean, uh, with resort yeah, very much like where Chris has noted on a few occasions already, this uh, 2008 uh, Provincial Municipal Fiscal and Service Delivery Review from 2008 being uh, a, a crucial part, a necessary part to our presentation, and it's specific to Hamilton. Remember that the, the, the purple on the map at the tip of Lake Ontario. Could we also maybe uh, find it advantageous to uh, use compar comparators in other Ontario communities with respect to something like some of the stuff you've presented here, uh, air quality, assuming that Hamilton has uh, is worse off than others in the Metrolink's catchment, uh, obesity, assuming that Hamilton is worse off um, uh, than other areas in the Metrolinx community. So is there a, a way to um, uh, have comparators work to our advantage in this case through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor? Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, there are certainly ways for us to provide uh, our information and gather information from other municipalities uh, as comparators, uh, whether it be to fiscal activity rates, transit use, uh, obesity, diabetes rates, on a number of the health issues, uh, as well as air quality. We, I don't want to comment necessarily whether that puts us advantageous or not, because there may be other things uh, that we're taking on in the city, whether it's in regard to air quality or other initiatives uh, that may mitigate um, some of that impact. So it may not necessarily show the, the differences that, that you want, um, but that's something we can always look at in making comparisons. Let me put it this way, and I'll simplify it. Um, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Are we worse off in Hamilton in the whole Metro Lynx catchment area when it comes to air quality? compared to other cities? I haven't, uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I haven't uh, looked at that okay. type of data, but we can, I can look into that. Okay, and, and, and while you're at it, if you could, uh, and with the greatest respect, it really was a good report, maybe as well our obesity rate compared to other municipalities uh, vying for uh, Metrolink dollars. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we can look into that. Thank you very much. And again, thank you uh, for the presentation and your enthusiasm.
Thank you, Councillor Farr. Councillor Jackson. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, Dr. Tran, could you go back to uh, slide 28, please? And as you do, I appreciate the, um, to Don Hall, I appreciate the cross-departmental approach um, that um, has been brought forward on this issue. So uh, it's, it's good to see. So yes, uh, so Dr. Tran, the last bullet point, equity. Uh, explain to me what you mean by throwing up the word equity there. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, the term equity really refers to, uh, there's differences between equality uh, and equity. Equality is, means that um, it's sort of equal uh, for everyone, or whether um, equity is more focused on areas of social justice. So it's really about looking, making sure that uh, regardless of your income, where you live, um, your age, um, uh, your language, whether you're an immigrant or not, um, whether or not you have the same opportunities and the same levels of either care opportunities or health outcomes. So in terms of transportation, one of the uh, couple of the slides I mentioned was um, and there's a couple areas. One is about equity in terms of those who have less financial means. Um, so if it costs about $12,000 a year to buy, purchase, and uh, maintain vehicles or even something in that area, not everyone um, has the means to do that. So we want a transportation system that regardless of your income, whether you can speak a certain language, whether you have physical uh, limitations or, uh, or disabilities, you're able to access services and, and opportunities and participate in the city. Okay, um, I think I understand. So all I need to know with this, Dr. Tran, if I've worked hard my whole life to purchase a car and I happen to, it's for me a necessity given my job and where I live in this community to use a car, I would hope you're not suggesting by equity that for that person who unfortunately, for whatever reason, can't afford a car, I hope you're not asking me to give up my car for the sake of equity. I mean, I hope we're not going down the communist state role here. I mean, I'm not trying to be silly about this, but I just, I'm not understanding this equity that you want to make a system available for everyone. I get that, that public transit would be available, more buses, uh, better running time. I get all that, but I just didn't quite understand your equity that not everybody can afford a car. And so I hope you're not even suggesting that you people who use a car as a mode of transportation give it up for the name of equity. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I'm, if I could first, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and then Dr. Tran will respond. My sense of equity is that we don't, just as we talked earlier about not putting all our eggs in one basket, is that we don't sink all of our money into road construction, road rehabilitation, that when we build a road, we take into account all the, all the needs for that road. And for one of our most recent examples is our new service on Rymel Well Road has done extremely well. Unfortunately, a lot of that service has soft shoulder and people who want to use public transit can't use public transit because they can't get from their home safely to uh, the transit stop. So it's about equitable use of the distance between the buildings and that uh, we make uh, transit, uh, we make um, transportation, whether it's on foot or on bicycle or on public transit or an automobile, equitable so that we have sidewalks and that the sidewalks are in good state of repair and the sidewalks don't have obstacles in them and that the sidewalks are wide enough so two people can pass or two people in a wheelchair can pass. So it's about equitable treatment in terms of the infrastructure so that all of the citizens have equitable access through maintaining the infrastructure um, equally across the board and not sinking all of our money into road rehabilitation or road reconstruction. That's the transportation perspective. Thank you, Don, for that. Sorry, Dr. Tran. Thank you, Don, for that. That allayed my fears of that other possible theory and argument. And in terms of equity, even on the infrastructure side, Don, I get in, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I get in theory how you want to possibly apply that across the community, but again, um, this council has so far in its first two budget years have put a high priority on improving, upgrading, and modernizing hard infrastructure in our community. Sewer, water main capacities, roads, sidewalks, because that's through the last election campaign, overwhelmingly, many of us who were lucky enough to get here heard that loud and clear. So 
Don, at least I can buy your equitable argument from an infrastructure standpoint moving forward, if it's possible. I apologize, Dr. Tran, from where you were saying it from the health standpoint, uh, I, I was fearful as to where you were going with that argument. Uh, just to slide 38 quickly, Dr. Tran, please. On slide 38, so let me understand obesity and active transportation. Now, I get the fact that you put up there walking and cycling, right? Can obviously somebody who does more walking, more cycling versus um, a sedentary lifestyle, I get that. But transit now, for me, I don't understand why transit is up there because you're sitting in transit. I, I get the environmental thing on transit, but on this particular graphic, I, I the, the argument with obesity and riding a bus versus me riding in my car again, I don't. I don't get that rationale. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, to Dr. Tran for an explanation. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, the, the issue for physical activity in transit is getting to and from transit. Um, I mean, in, if with cars, uh, you can have a car parked in your garage. You can basically get to your car with a very limited walking, just to your garage, drive to the parking lot, and, door to door. Uh, the idea with public transit is actually, there's research showing that uh, the transit users, even if you're going to the same places, um, are walking at least uh, eight minutes more a day because you have to actually do a little bit of walking to get to the bus stop or the LRT stop and, and to make some transfer. So there is some physical component to the transit. It's not as much as walking or biking all the way there, but it is more physical activity compared to um, relying on a car. But if the idea is, to, so let's at least now measure that. You're saying it's obvious it's nowhere near as much as walking or biking. You said that, which I, I can buy. And I thought the whole goal of this was to provide greater number of public transit opportunities closer to people, closer to where they live, so they can just hop on it, hop on it more frequently. So I'm just challenging the fact of throwing transit up there where people really, you're hoping, and Don's hoping, we're all hoping that with a, an improved system, you'll run more often, be closer to the greater number of people that can use it. So I don't quite get the obesity and active transportation argument on transit. But I appreciate what you said, and you said it's obviously nowhere near as good as walking or cycling. Dr. Tran, for a last comment, please. To you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we, we do want a, uh, a transit system that's convenient. People, We don't want people to walk like hours to get to a transit system. Right. Um, but the chances of having a transit system like right in front of your door uh, all the time or right exactly uh, without any walking is uh, isn't something that's expected. So it is, you want a transit system that's that's convenient enough, but gets people up and about uh, enough during the day. Uh, in terms of, we talked about, one of the issues I think is in terms of how you hear the word transportation. And, and often when we think of transportation and transportation system, we think of primarily public transit and, and buses and trains, that kind of stuff. Uh, but you, we also are looking when we talk about the transportation master plan is also looking at making a transportation system that meets the needs of pedestrians and cyclists. So it's it's not only just about public transit, which is really important, it's also about sidewalks, bike lanes, uh, making more walkable communities as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Jackson. Councilor McHattie, please. <coughs> Thanks, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and I, I guess uh, thanks very much, Dr. Tran. This is critical information, and I uh, really appreciate the report that's in the appendices here uh, in, in the overall RT report. Um, just following uh, on Councillor Farr's comments, uh, and, and I'm just thinking about uh, the trip we make to to see uh, folks at the province to try and convince them to give money, give the $800 million to, to Hamilton to do this project. and I. And I think that kind of information, the comparisons, uh, we, we got Chris, Chris Murray uh, shared the information on the ability to pay. I think along the same theme, it would be useful to share that. 
uh, the air pollution, uh, maybe transportation related air pollution, which we probably have more information on than anywhere else in uh, North America with uh, Dennis Kors uh, work. So maybe maybe a subset of that uh, that we want to look at and bring forward. But I'm just wondering um, uh, the, uh, the cost information on health, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, one of the challenges that I'm sure you must face as you speak to us is we, our eyes glaze over a little bit because a lot of the health costs are provincial. So there, if, as we look at our levy, as we are during our budget process right now, we don't see uh, uh, you know, the, the health care costs in any, anywhere near the amount that the province of Ontario sees health care costs, just in terms of the jurisdictions uh, that we have. And, and of course, the federal government uh, as well has to deal with health care. We deal with health care as well through the public health budget, and, but uh, the numbers are nowhere near the same. But because it is such a huge number for the province and for the feds uh, as part of their overall budget, uh, you would think that they would pay pretty close attention to uh, uh, a story from Hamilton that would say, you invest in LRT and, and other transit improvements and other active transportation uh, improvements. And our, our uh, estimates, our forecasts, our information, our models suggest that you could reduce health care costs by X percent or whatever it might be, at least for Hamilton. Uh, and, and, we, and along with that, you might be, we might be sharing that kind of information that Councillor Farr uh, has saying, you know what, you probably put more money into Hamilton and health care costs than you put into some other uh, communities due to the uh, obesity or, or other numbers that uh, we might pull out uh, in comparison to other uh, GTA communities. So you can, you can uh, save even more money because there's more money to save uh, in Hamilton. So is there a way, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, and I'm just thinking about the LRT Task Force, the Government Relations uh, Committee, uh, Councillor Farr, uh, Ferguson and myself, the Mayor, uh, going to Queen's Park and, and uh, telling a story about this. Is, is there a way to provide that kind of information that the province would relate to? They're the ones holding the uh, purse strings on uh, the 800 million we want and more, if we can get it. Uh, I think you, uh, hopefully you get uh, where I'm coming from, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Councilor McHaddy, we have Chris. Chris, please. So if we can, I'll just start and, and uh, but say the following. Um, it may be a good idea uh, in terms of getting all the voices of Hamilton on this topic to uh, think about what happened with the casino debate. I mean, you heard from, you know, the key healthcare institutions, they weighed in in terms of their views about gambling and, uh, and uh, they provided those comments to council through the medical officer of health. Um, and I can say as well that we are increasingly finding the, you know, Hamilton Health Sciences and, and the general and others uh, very interested in our neighborhood work, uh, wanting to um, understand it better and start to think about what it is that maybe they can do to uh, make decisions that uh, benefit people in the neighborhoods as opposed to waiting till they come to the hospitals. And so, you know, it, it is in their best interest for us to have healthy neighborhoods. Uh, at the end of the day, it does help to uh, reduce the number of people that come into their facilities that they have to look after. We know that right now health care costs are in the order of about 50 cents of every dollar. We know in 10 years they're going to be 60 cents. Maybe something to help bolster the government relations work that's got to be done on this is for the medical officer of health to ask for comments from the health care institutions, no different than they did on the casino matter, to get their voices heard at Queen's Park in terms of what benefit is there if you get people exercising even as much as eight minutes more a day, what benefit it is to their bottom line, not just ours. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'll have a, I just have some additional comments, and I think Councillor McCaddy has raised a number of excellent points. Um, first of all, I guess there's two things I'll address in terms of what you've already mentioned. One is in terms of the cost and where it's allocated in terms of provincial or local, and then how do we, the second part is how do we move forward some of these items or information to the to the province and how can we, how can the health, public health or the health sector in this community move it forward uh, in cooperation with uh, local leaders here. So in terms of costs, and this is one of the growing and emerging field of research uh, 
public health has typically thought of looking at just the health impacts, but now you know we've been asked and people have been wanting to know what are the economic or health care costs uh, of these things. And you're right in the sense that uh, a lot of the costs uh, do occur at a provincial level, whether it's health care or, or other costs, and it, it can be a bit of a challenge uh, when we have slightly siloed budgeting in terms of uh, investing using a municipal tax base but getting benefits from a province. Uh, there are, from, from how I see it from a local perspective and municipal perspective, we're, maybe we're not always directly impacted, but and there's always an indirect impact. So the more funds or costs and expenses that the province have to pay through healthcare or other uh, budgets, um, you know, in, a, in an austerity government or environment, uh, when that happens, they look at other ways to reduce costs that indirectly affects us. So we, we know that uh, they've cut some of the fundings to the discretionary benefits, to the housing supplements. So we get an indirect, uh, economic cost, um, uh, even though the cost actually or benefits happen at a provincial level. There are some local um, issues as well. Um, so when you look at economic costs, I mean, a lot of it's in terms of treatment, uh, like whether it's tr direct cost, treatment, uh, diagnostic. But the, many of the indirect costs are mainly uh, in most studies are looked at uh, productivity and reduced productivity. So that actually impacts the economic development and economic health of a local community as well. Uh, from a provincial point of view, I think it's good to, when we're making the business case to the province, to not only put forth information and have leaders uh, talk about it from an economic or environmental point of view, but having that health perspective uh, can also work, whether it's us supporting you by providing information or us coming along with the local leaders here to make that case to the, the province, whether it's us and or the health sector. I know that transportation and built environment has been a growing area of interest within other health units and medical officers of health. Um, there's actually a provincial working group of medical officers of health that uh, are looking at uh, working together, and I'm part of that committee, uh, to look at uh, making connections to provincial ministers uh, and, and sort of understanding the case, but also making forward some of those uh, our arguments as well. Well, I really appreciate the response both from Chris Murray and Dr. Tran on that. I just just thinking of that uh, trip to Toronto or trips plural, of course, uh, to uh, secure this uh, the funds we need for this. And uh, we, we'd definitely like to have you along, Dr. Tran, and and be able to show the province how much they're going to save, uh, at least in, in uh, you know if it's not specific as, as specific as we can. Uh, along with, uh, with giving us as many people as you want to 2031 in terms of population growth. Norburn, Sprawl, and Hamilton, they'll all go you know, in the corridor and areas like that. And I mean, that's part of the story we can tell them, which, which circles back to health, of course, uh, with the urban sprawl issues around, uh, around uh, human health. Uh, so, Mr. Chair, I guess taking, taking out of that and following on Chris's uh, suggestion, if, if we can ask, if I can provide direction, I guess, that uh, the Medical Officer of Health uh, make that request to the other health agencies here in Hamilton, as was done with the casino uh, um, project, uh, to, uh, to gain their support uh, as well as we go off to uh, Queen's Park. That's going to be very important for us to, to show, uh, you know, a united uh, Hamilton front, front uh, in support of uh, light rail transit. Thanks. Pastor McHenry, would you like to do that now while you're still fresh in your mind? To yeah. mm. I want that as a motion, Mr. Chair. We'll, uh, I think uh, people understand what that what that was uh, that we asked the MOH uh, to go off to uh, her uh, colleagues in uh, the various health aspects, HHS, St. Joe's, all the folks who she worked with uh, previously, and have them uh, provide comments back uh, on the importance of LRT, and uh, you know providing some of the information that we talked about in terms of making the case to the province of Ontario, uh, the health case. The, the uh, cost, cost benefit case, the the uh, the savings, the economic savings for the province, uh, based on uh, on an LRT investment by the province of Ontario, second by Councillor Farr. By yourself, second by Councillor Farr. Yes. Quick. 
need some more direction, Mr. Chair, from me on that? Uh, or just call the vote? Or point, 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 point. Where we're in the presentations now, and I certainly support the intent Council McCarthy is putting forward. But there's a process when you speak to something, you put, you move your mo you, you reserve your motion, let us know that you're going to bring the motion forward, and then we deal with the motion appropriately. Good time. There's a speaker's list. I realize that, Chris, some direction here. With the motion being put on the floor, it's now the most uh, of the highest priority. Right. Although we have not completed the presentation nor received it, I has been put by a member of the. Any? It's been second. It's moved by Councilor McCarthy, second by Councilor Farr. Councilor Jackson? Yes, yeah, so uh, can I just get clarification? I heard the move of the motion talk about uh, the MOH uh, consulting with partners in the community uh, to build the further case from the health standpoint for, he said, LRT, and he made it specific to LRT, and yet today's uh, report is talking about a multi-mode of uh, possible options moving forward. So if it includes the multi-optional approach, which means that increased uh, transit, um, either current uh, conventional and or eventual LRT, I can support it. If it's only specific to build a case for only LRT, I can't support it. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Councilor McHattie. Mr. Uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I, I take that as a friendly amendment. So it's, uh, it's based on the, uh, the two-part recommendation we have uh, before us today, which talks about light rail transit. But it also talks about other transit uh, improvements uh, that we're, we're uh, also pursuing. So your motion, friendly amendment with Councillor Jackson. For clarity, is this ad being added as an amendment to the staff recommendation or is it standalone through you, Mr. Councillor Caddy? I, I would think, uh, just in terms of process, probably important to have it uh, in the same report. So it would, it would be an additional uh, recommendation uh, to uh, what we have before us here today. Okay, so it's actually an amendment then, not, not necessarily a, a motion. Is that correct? So, so I guess to the clerk or uh, yeah, I would ask uh, Chris's direction on that, but it seems to me rather than a standalone motion, it probably makes sense. So perhaps the wording is, is amendment, Mr. Chair, uh, through you to Chris. Uh, then it might be more appropriate to deal with it when the staff report is being uh, discussed. This is a presentation. Okay. So it would be an amendment to the staff recommendation, which hasn't been put yet. We'll, we'll deal with that. Uh, we'll deal with that at the, at the end. Okay. All right. All right. We'll deal with it later. Councillor McCaddy, you're through. You're? Okay. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. But my questions were asked. Councillor, Councillor Whitehead. Yeah. Um, and I know that Councillor uh, McKay and I have been really pushing hard on uh, promoting public transit, and certainly I've already identified issues on uh, Queen Street Hill, and it's going to be taken out of service for the three months, and so it's really an I see it as an opportunity. One of the pushbacks I get, and, and I don't see it from a, a health perspective on your, your report, uh, but I do get some pushback, so I can now go to my community and say there's absolutely zero risk of health going on in public transit. Is that my understanding of this presentation? Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, there's, I don't think there's ever a case where there's zero risk uh, in anything, but the, uh, most of the research has shown that from a risk perspective, you significantly reduce the risk uh, using public transit or active transportation in terms of the risk of, of injuries or fatalities. You actually see um, in a similar way to this, maybe not as strong a relationship uh, when you increase um, rates and uses of public transit or active transportation, you see reductions in injuries, particularly traffic fatalities. Uh, you're going to see reduced risk of uh, health effects from uh, air quality uh, as well. I couldn't just get you, I, I, I understand that a part of it. There's a lot of urban myth in regards to riding in, in a transit system that I'm trying to address with individuals. So we're talking about airborne uh, uh, stuff, we're talking about hitchhikers, we're talking about all those kinds of issues that uh, people put in front of you in regards to why they don't get on the public transit. You don't really address those issues in your health uh, report. So I would think that what I'm saying, seeing, it, because it's not there, is that there's 0% of risk if you ride in public transit from a health perspective. 
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I, again, I would not characterize anything as zero risk, but you, in any sort of issue or situation, you have to consider the overall risks and benefits. Um, and from a public health perspective, from a health perspective, the overall benefits of you know, moving towards a transportation system uh, that's active, that uses, uses a pedestrian, cyclist, public transit, far outweigh any uh, unintended risk of, of that as. Uh, Mr. I would appreciate, obviously it's not in the report, it's not here. I, I need that kind of information so I can educate those that I want to encourage uh, to take the public transit because that's some of the pushback I get back and I don't know how to answer it. So it would be helpful, uh, Doctor, since you are approaching this from a health perspective, that we can put some of the urban myth to bed or at least talk about the risk versus uh, benefit so that I can better, uh, we can better articulate to our community in regards to uh, utilizing the public transit system. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we can provide uh, further information. Uh, there are some myths that are out there in terms of if you have people um, cycling more, you're gonna have more cycling accidents but uh, and injuries. Actually, you, you find that that's not the case, that it actually reduces, so we can address some of those. In terms of quantifying any of the other specific risk of public transit or safety, that issue, that will, with anything, it depends on, I'm talking a, about uh, a well thought out, integrated, uh, transportation system that's active. If you design it properly, you, those risks uh, in terms of safety issues uh, will be uh, minimized. Um, if you if you do it poorly, then you would you would still have the risk. But uh, we can uh, provide you information on that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wade. I have no further speakers. So Don. Thank you, Dr. Tran. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, we're a little over halfway. I'll try to be as quick and painless as possible and uh, move as quickly as I can through uh, some of the slides, but uh, perhaps slow down on ones that uh, need, a, need a little bit more uh, attention, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, so not to go over ground that we've already covered, but uh, really there's a, a twofold purpose to today's report. Uh, first is to report back on the progress of the rapid transit file, to advise our of our completion of the 2012 uh, rapid transit work plan as directed by council, and in accordance with the uh, requirements of the contribution agreement between the city and Metrolinx for Hamilton re to remain eligible for consideration of a provincial investment in Hamilton's transportation program uh, through the province's big move. And finally, to make a recommendation uh, respecting those next steps. Second, uh, we're providing an integrated planning framework for the next five to 10 years. And I'll describe how LRT fits into the overall context of that plan. And talk about where we are today, with respecting our transportation program, where we need to go to achieve council's transportation targets within the transportation master plan, and to provide some thoughts on how we will get there. In addition, we will provide some feedback on what we have learned in the first year of our experience with an integrated transportation program, the role that transportation plays as a support for economic development and can play in helping to curb the cost of health care, in addition to the traditional role of social service and environmental benefit, the benefits of bundling all transportation programming and how Ant Hamilton is now envied by other municipalities for its efforts to remove silos being existing between transportation providers that should be working in concert rather than in competition. So if you think of us as working down through a strategic decision-making funnel, uh, we started, Chris started at the very highest level. He provided a regional perspective and then brought us into the corporate strategic plan and then we moved down another level with Christine Newbrell talking about our corporate strategic policy documents, most importantly grids, and the uh, most importantly grids and the official plan, and uh, demonstrating that I think we can feel good that we have a very uh, solid foundation to build whatever structure on that council ultimately uh, decides to move forward on. 
and not to be repetitive, but for a long time, we've been aware of the environmental benefits of transit and cycling and walking over the automobile. And this isn't an attack on, uh, on the automobile. It's simply a recognition that there are multiple forms of transportation out there and we need to level the playing field and make access to all of those transportation modes as equitable as we possibly can uh, when we build or rehabilitate roads. We heard Dr. Tran talk about in more recent history to come up with the importance of, of transit walking and cycling and achieving council's vision of a prosperous community recognizing that transit is an essential ingredient to the success of our economic development program. Evidence most recently by Canada Braid's requirement for a high level of transit service as a condition of relocating to Hamilton. And then even most recently, we're con coming to appreciate the contribution transit makes to achieving council's vision for a healthy community. Dr. Tran talked about a value of a high functioning transportation system to public health and to mitigate spiraling health care costs. An emerging realization that transportation is a critical ingredient as opposed to perhaps a product in achieving council's vision for the future of Hamilton, to support the ser social services, to be a contributor to an improved environment, to be a, a contributor to attracting new business and new job seekers, and a contributor to uh, lower health costs and improved health programs. Continuing to focus the lens even farther down now, We'll talk about the transportation master plan in which the transportation program is embedded in the transportation master plan. So the theme for today is to talk about where have we been, where, where are we going, what do we need to, to do to get there, and how are we going to get there. We last met in October of last year and received 11 directions in total from Council. The first direction was to complete all the deliverables re relating to the contribution agreement between the city and Metrolinx, and that's now completed. It's part of this report. That we complete a, a project benefit and cost report, and we're going to talk, Chris talked about that a little bit. We're going to talk about it some more as we work through this slide presentation. That we complete a maintenance storage facility analysis and environmental assessment, and uh, we, that requirement was waived by Metrolinx. As a result of that, we've actually saved a considerable amount of money in our 2012 budget. Moving on, the staff negotiate with uh, Metrolinx uh, a funding formula for the above works. A, a budget was set for 2012 of $950,000 for this program, and we've completed that. That staff report back with the financial impacts and a funding strategy. Well, that's a to-do. That can't happen until we hand off this report to the province, and the province comes back with a proposal in terms of funding for the city of Hamilton. And that that staff pursue further Metrolinx funding uh, for purchase of 60-foot buses. Our current uh, capital replacement program can only is only sustainable purchasing 40-foot buses, and that we see a need to further increase our capacity buying 60-foot buying buses, and our current capital program uh, won't sustain uh, the purchase of those buses. That we complete a uh, beeline nodes and corridors land use planning study and give priority to the completion of node and corridor plans for James and Centennial. Um, we heard Christine talk that the main uh, King Queenston Beeline Corridor Strategy plus Phase One approved by Council, uh, completed on April 25th of 2012. The James Street North planning is is underway. Uh, the recommendation F arising or direction F arising from the last report in October, that staff develop an organization structure and a community engagement strategy um, to support an integrated public tra transportation program. Uh, that's completed. Uh, we're not at, uh, recommending any additional staff. Although, um, depending on uh, moving forward, what direction we get from council, we certainly recognize the need to realign some existing staff within the existing complement. So, uh, we, we are uh, identifying certain positions in the organization uh, that, uh, as they become vacant for elimination, to shift those resources to uh, the program, uh, whatever those program requirements will be, uh, depending on council's decision or committee's decision today. And that the city manager be authorized and directed as correspondent Metrolinks to reaffirm the city's commitment to modernize the public transportation program. And that was completed on December the 6th. Uh, recommendation H, that the staff and the report back include capital costs and a recommendation to ask Metrolinks for capital and the net change in operating costs. And we've seen the, the high level numbers from, uh, from Chris. We'll get into a little bit more detail a little later in this presentation. And recommendation I, that uh, Metrolinx uh, be requested to reimburse Hamilton for the $5.1 million invested 
in the development of the program to this date. So far, there's been about $9 million expended. Uh, about $5 million of that has come from the city, and about $3 million has come from uh, Metrolinx. Oops, sorry, if we go back then, Christine. Um, no, perhaps I think we'll just move forward for now, Christine. Um, so getting to the transportation master plan then. So we talked about the regional plan, the big move plan. We moved downstream to uh, the grids and the official plan, moved downstream to the corporate uh, strategic plan, and now uh, we're at the transportation master plan, and it, very timely, just coincidental, that it's due for five-year review this year, and there are targets within that plan uh, to, for achieving uh, single, single occupant, to reduce single occupant vehicle use by 20%, to increase daily transit trip from 5 to 12%, and there's some other statistics here. We, we haven't achieved those targets. Those, achieve, those targets are a product of investment. So, um, again, a key, re key reason why we're here today is to start a discussion in terms of level investment and timing of investment uh, over the next number of years on the overall transportation program. So the five-year review, Transportation Master Plan Review, advocates an extensive investment in transportation, acknowledging that a high-functioning transportation system is a, essential to achieving Council's vision for a healthy, safe, prosperous, and sustainable community. So what we're hoping to do as a primary deliverable from the Transportation Master Plan review is to do, determine from Council uh, a recommended approach to investment in transportation and transportation program over the next number of years. And we've talked about it already. It, it could be an LRT investment only. It could be combined LRT and public transit. It could be public transit only, or it could be investment in a public transportation suite that draws in the pedestrian, the cycling, car share, bike share, and we're going to hear a little bit more about bike share. And to determine the rate of that investment, we, we go through various financial cycles, and we know that uh, finances are very tight right now, but we need to get some sense from committee and council in terms of the level of investment over the next five years so that the staff resources we invest in that planning is money well invested. That if if moving forward there, there isn't perhaps funding for the transportation program, then we can adjust our staffing accordingly. If there's incremental investment in transit, then again, we can adapt. Or if there's rapid or accelerated investment, we can adapt to that. And then depending on the type of investment, we'll also uh, drive the need for uh, some staff realignment. And we can do that within uh, existing complement as, uh, as vacancies occur. We've also been, uh, part of the 2012 direction was to report back on the implication of not achieving the transportation master plan targets. And so with respect to congestion, while the city's not experiencing congestion today, without a proactive approach to manage transportation demand, key quarters in the city will experience ex increased congestion and associated delays and a greater need to invest more heavily in roads. And I think most municipalities recognize that our current investment is in roads is perhaps the largest investment in our capital budget and even with that large investment uh, we're finding that that's not uh, sustainable ultimately if we don't address it uh, through appropriate planning proper pre-planning we'll find ourselves in the same crisis mode that other municipalities closer to the heart of toronto are already experiencing from a socialist perspective there are also risks in not addressing integrated mobility needs and respond to changing demographics and an aging population that will be increasingly dependent on getting around by transit or on foot. Also, we heard from Dr. Tran, the negative implications on health and community could result, particularly by limiting access to services and social activities. On a economic front, a not so obvious risk is that Hamilton residents continue to be captive to automobiles and the financial burden that comes with this. Even if transit investments allow a household to manage with one car instead of two, this can still translate into significant savings over time. Back to the Transportation Master Plan Review. It's a very complex undertaking. Uh, the, the, the intent is it was approved, uh, the 2013 capital budget approved in uh, a budget expenditure of $250,000. We expect this to be a multi-year undertaking and report back to Council at the appropriate milestones. What we need to be absolutely clear with committee and Council on, and that doesn't mean that we're going to stand still in the meantime. 
which is the reason for all of these other transportation initiatives being embedded in this report. So what will happen is we will undertake concurrent improvement in the transportation program as funds are made available at the same time uh, that we uh, update the transportation master plan. Specific to Hamilton, we're hearing very loud and clear uh, from the feedback we have from Council that one way versus two way is an important issue here in Hamilton and we want to, uh, we want to earmark that as a fundamental requirement or a key priority of the review. The other is this whole notion of, of complete streets and uh, using complete streets as our ultimate decision making framework to ensure that the streets are designed for all users and we're going to hear a lot more about that as uh, Steve Malloy will be reporting back on our pedestrian mobility plan in the not too distant future. We also uh, would like to suggest that there may be a potential for a complete uh, street demo demonstration project and that we can undertake this during the, uh, during the, uh, the plan review, con concurrent with the plan review. A lot of people are hearing about transportation demand management. It, it's, uh, it's a new terminology to many. It's been around for a few years, but Hamilton is on the leading edge with respect to transportation demand management. And all this is to say is that the transportation master plan and the success of the transportation master plan, as Chris has pointed out and others have pointed out, will require that all modes of travel working together to offer citizens, all of our citizens, a range of, of uh, mobility choices. TDM, the acronym, is a multimodal strategy that works to integrate all modes so that transition is seamless and barriers to uptake are eliminated. So barriers to transportation in the community are eliminated. Goods movement is also a key consideration. By removing traffic due to single occupant vehicles, we can free up road space for good movement, which is one of the primary initiatives of the uh, of Metrolinx and GO Transit in the corridor between Hamilton and, and Toronto, and, and, and really goes to why uh, HOB, HOV is being supported in that, in that corridor. It's as much about uh, improving our ability to move goods as it is uh, improving our, tra our trip times to and from the City of Toronto. TDM techniques are used in workplaces, neighborhoods, secondary plans and developments to achieve modal splits that reduce congestion, make the road, work, road network more sustainable, reduce the need for road expansion and increase road space for cycling, transit, pedestrians and good movement. So our primary mandate for reporting back to Council today was to report back on LRT. The big move is a regional transportation plan for the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area, which was developed by Metrolinx to improve regional mobility and reduce congestion. Congestion currently costs the region about $6 billion per year and is expected to increase to $12 billion in 2031 if nothing else is done. At its October 7, 2008 meeting, the Public Works Committee approved a recommendation directing staff to study rapid transit along the B line with light rail technology as the preferred option. City Council, Council endorsed that report on October 29, 2008. So, uh, in summary, uh, LRT, uh, in, if introduced today between the Eastern Subregional Node, which is a planning terminology, presently Eastgate, and the Western Major Activity Centre, which is McMaster, could experience ridership within the range of comparable North American municipalities. The deliverables of the contribution agreement between the City of Hamilton and the Province of Ontario are complete and ready to submit to Metrolinx so they can complete their value for money exercise which will ultimately lead to a decision of what to invest in Hamilton. Hamilton's Beeline project is currently listed as a next wave project by Metrolinx. We have a slide coming up and in, uh, in, in uh, preamble to this slide it uh, want to talk about the uh, implications of, uh, of LRT both from a ridership perspective and from a cost perspective and we'll deal with the ridership perspective first. I mentioned earlier that the leg up that Hamilton has over other municipalities is that we already have established ridership in that corridor. About 4.2 million rides would access um, LRT on day one. And the significance, I've talked earlier about the baseline, the baseline funding, and I corrected my earlier mistake that it's based on 2011. What I also wanted to do was in terms of ridership, because there was a lot of cloudiness around ridership the last time reported, there was a lot of unknown, put it that way, and a lot of assumptions made, is I want to be able to put a stake in the ground and say, on day one, 
of LRT, if somehow we could walk out of here on a Friday afternoon and have conventional transit operating in that corridor and then magically wave a, wave a magic wand over the weekend to come in here and have light rail transit operating in that corridor, what would be the ridership and financial implications with no assumptions whatsoever so we can all feel comfortable with the starting case? Because as we move out further into the future and make assumptions, um, the the business case is becomes less concrete because these assumptions have to happen in order to achieve the, the future results. So I wanted to start with a baseline that we all felt comfortable with that had the least amount of assumptions we could possibly uh, that we could possibly uh, build in. So that's what we've done here. We've said, okay, let's day one, LRT is up and running. We would take and eliminate uh, the B-line route, which has got about uh, 14 buses on it right now. We also assumed that about 33% of the ridership, or the, our consultant did, uh, STG, in a prior study, that about 33% or a third of the buses along routes one and five would also migrate uh, to the LRT system and that the trains would come by with a frequency of once every six minutes. And that the, with, all, with those three bullets alone, no other assumptions, our ridership on the annual ridership on the B-line are on that corridor, the LRT in that corridor, would be about 4.2 million rides a year. That, and that's, we'll come back to that number. That number's in a chart on the next slide. And then there's a, a day one high, and this is when we start to take in some assumptions. And some of the assumptions are based from, that came from our, one of our prior uh, consulting assignments, where what was the, where they interpreted the, uh, or they translated the experience elsewhere in the world, and the transition from the, for example, from routes one and five in that same corridor, uh, would in fact be a 66% take up as opposed to a 33% take up. And day one, the entire transit system across the city of Hamilton uh, would experience an 8% ridership increase. That would require the trains to come by with a frequency of every four minutes. One of the uh, other directions we received last October was to bring back some absolute clarity in terms of the break even point uh, for LRT in this corridor. At what point? does LRT actually start to run at a profit? And so we're going to report back on that today. And what has happened, what will actually happen is starting at 4.2 million rides where we would be day one working towards 9.2 million rides, the business case for LRT continues to improve. The threshold of where LRT actually becomes, uh, along the road of about 9.2 million rides, LRT will be more effective than public transit when we hit about 12 million rides, or about th three times what we have right now, LRT will actually be operating at a profit. And that was one of the directions that we were to come back on, because the money is connected to the ridership. So uh, again, we'll, we'll bring that number back in the next slide. And then future 2031, this is where we take into a number, a number of assumptions. And, and, and that's what planners do. They assume what the community is going to look like in 15 or 20 or 30 years. And this is what that future looks like if everything happens. So there'll be a 31% growth uh, in, uh, in, uh, in LRT service, and you can see the other bullet points. Uh, the bottom bullet is pretty critical in that there's no, absolutely no way around this to achieve uh, a profit-making uh, LRT, uh, the public transit pro pro program, which is going to feed the LRT in terms of ridership, has to grow, and it has to grow very dramatically. It has to grow at least double, perhaps triple, to achieve the ridership uh, that's being achieved in uh, other uh, Canadian transit systems like Calgary and Edmonton. And so those numbers now, we're, gonna, we're going to overlay them onto a chart in the next slide. This slide, uh, we've heard a lot about the, uh, the, master, the McMaster Institute of uh, Transportation and Logistics, and we, we've been working with these folks since they published the report. We brought them to senior management team and had a discussion at senior management team. And uh, what we've done is taken their graph of the 30-odd uh, light rail transit systems across North America. So we've taken their data, and then we've added these purple bars. And uh, the purple bars are what we just spoke about in the prior slide. Hamilton day one low, so if you look at that first purple bar to your furthest right, you'll see that that represents about 4 million rides a year. And then if certain things happen, the day one uh, ridership in Hamilton could be, uh, could be as high as double that, uh, again, depending on those characteristics that we explained in the prior slide. And then as we move from 
12 uh, million rides towards um, about nine, um, as we move between 9 million rides and 18 million rides, you'll see this dotted line. And that dotted line responds specifically to the question that we were directed to report back on, is when does LRT become a profit center? And you can see it, it happens uh, at about 12 million rides and happens prior to 2031 if everything happens. So it's higher than our day one high expectation, lower than our 2031 uh, expectation. Thank you, I think we can go to the next slide, Christine. So this uh, slide, again, is another uh, deliverable that we're required to report back on today. Uh, the operating budget impact. Now we're moving from ridership into operating budget. And uh, this slide uh, breaks down the operating cost implications. So we talked about the LRT financial impact would be $14 million on a stand, $14.5 million on standalone operation. So we'll talk a little bit about what happens to that 14 point, or where does that, actually the 14.5 million comes from the removal of the 18 or 20 odd uh, buses from the system. And presuming those buses are not redeployed elsewhere in the system, uh, they would generate uh, some, some funding to allocate to the LRT system. The system that we're talking about day one um, um, identifies the requirement for some 22 uh, light rail vehicles and uh, about 180 staff. Now this is on the preposition that this is a complete standalone operation. Obviously, there would be efficiencies and an economy of scale, but um, if the two were in any way integrated or amalgamated, uh, I guess the point is, is that we want to be with our numbers and both on ridership and costs uh, as conservative, uh, conservatively uh, comfortable, I guess, for lack of better words. So you can see here the removal of the 18 buses and the associated maintenance costs, the bus operator savings, the cost of maintenance would be in the order of about 11.5 million in 20, 2011 numbers. So that the net levy impact of removing these uh, 18 uh, buses and all the operators and that maintenance and redeploying all that to, uh, to the light rail on day one uh, would leave a net levy impact on the city. And we've translated, last time we talked about dollars per hour and dollars per kilometer, when really I think the council thinks in terms of impact on the levy, both operating and capital. So we've translated everything into um, impact on the, on, the, uh, on the levy. And then there would be other city impacts uh, on the levy, uh, such as snow removal, parking enforcement, of about $8.7 million. And that's based on what we know today at 30% design. So the total net levy impact would be a combination of the 3.5 million on a budget we talked about right now that is about $100 million gross and a little less than $50 million net after revenue. So 3.5 million, you can put things in context. So it's almost an operational wash in terms of operating levy uh, day one. Um, and then uh, additional impacts of 8.7 million. So levy impacts of about 12.2 million uh, day one. Uh, you've seen these numbers already, so I, I won't dwell on them. And you can see how we, the, uh, the second bullet here uh, is 14.5 million if the buses are taken out of service and redeployed, 3.5 million if the buses are taken out of service and all that money is fed back into the, into the uh, LRT system. We've got, I think committee's message is going to be fair, is going to be clear and unequivocal. unequivocal. We need to stop talking about 800 million and start talking about 100% capital. Uh, coverage. Uh, another uh, requirement uh, of reporting back uh, from a financial perspective is the cost of not doing LRT. In this slide you'll see that uh, we, have, we put together estimates working with our engineering uh, div division that the LRT uh, project could reduce the backlog of capital works in this corridor, something in the order of about $79 million and generate about $22 million in tax benefits as well about $30 million in building permits and development charges over a 15 year period. These uh, development figures are based on only on underdeveloped and city owned properties within the corridor. The project is also estimated to create about $440 million, $43 million in gross domestic product. This is a number taken from a CUI submission. It's in the appendix to the document, uh, as well as create 6,000 temporary jobs and 1,000 permanent jobs in the province. Uh, with somewhere in the order of three, 330, I think it's supposed to be 3,000 to 3,500 uh, local jobs. In addition to the financial benefits, there are the health, environment, and social benefits that we're only just beginning to be able to quantify. 
These benefits are difficult to quantify for Hamilton. However, research indicates there are benefits as outlined in the following slides. So we've broken cost of not doing LRT into four categories, and we keep coming back to those four themes. The first theme is public health, in that uh, investments in public transit, such as LRT, can help shape a city build, city's built environment into a more walkable, complete, and compact community. Uh, relating to Dr. Tran's presentation earlier, individuals who walk an additional kilometer per day reduces their chances of becoming obese by 5%, compared to motorists driving an additional hourly daily who are 6% more likely to become obese. And that goes to the Councillor Jackson's question is, it's about uh, seniors, people with disabilities, and frankly, any member of the public, if we can get them to use public transit, the physical exercise they get from going from their home or from their business or from their job to public transit, there's now quantifiable evidence that just a kilometer a day in both directions will actually lead to a reduction in their exposure to obesity. And we'll firm up those numbers over time as we continue to build on this relationship. So while transit will never ever uh, go down uh, side streets, it's never intended to, and you'll see over time we'll probably evolve away from serving uh, secondary roadways and serving the arterials. The idea in response to Councillor Jackson's question is to have very high levels of transit service so it's convenient, but we will never get away from that walk uh, from a person's residence out to the bus stop. And we're now finding that there's, the, there's actually quantifiable medical evidence that that one kilometer walk in both directions each way is enough to counteract uh, uh, the impacts of obesity. Cost of not doing LRD from the, uh, from the environmental perspective is public transportation produces on average 50 to 90% lower emissions than driving. All of public transportation um, um, emits less than 1% of total tailpipe emissions. A study conducted in the Greater Toronto Area found a 30 to 50% reduction in car traffic and lower emission rates and have a potential to save an estimated 200 lives and $900 million a year. From the environmental perspective, auto-dependent communities require 20 to 50 times more space than transit-friendly communities. That means 60 to 80% of the land must be devoted to roads and parking facilities. This leads to increased hard surfaces, which are not able to deal with stormwater runoff, and we've had some very recent experience with that, resulting in stormwater management challenges. Hard surfaces are also known to create heat island effects and consume more energy for cooling and transportation. Finally, from the social perspective, in Hamilton, 17% of the existing population, 20% of employment opportunities are located within 800 meters of the Beeline Corridor. 80% of the city's population is serviced by HSR routes that connect directly with the B-Line. LRT has the potential to connect people living in downtown neighborhoods with job opportunities and amenities, including health and social facilities. Investment in LRT and transit can help reduce poverty by providing economic transportation options. I thought I was done with social. There's <laughs> a slide here. This figure is a map, uh, I guess we've seen this actually once before, uh, showing the GTHA by extending, uh, by the extent of social need. As can be seen, Hamilton shown by the darkest color exhibits the highest social need. This goes to our city manager's point that this has to be part of our package going forth to the province of Ontario. This supports Hamilton's position as an area to invest in transportation as a means to enhance opportunity, provide equi equitable access to services, and employment and then to improve quality of life. So to continue on our theme, where have we been? This is where are we? Um, frankly, we have a downtown that is recovering. It's all very positive. We have a supportive urban structure with firm boundaries. We're seeing an increase in stakeholder engagement. That's an indication that people are starting to believe in us and believe what they have to say matters. We recently won an award as a silver cycling community, and our public transportation system performs well against our peers. This next slide takes a little bit of time to uh, get your head around, and it goes to actually, it'll speak to perhaps, if nothing else, the catch article that you saw recently in the newspaper. But we've plotted um, all of our comparable properties on here, municipalities, and uh, we want to maybe 
draw your attention to some of the performance statistics. You can see uh, the bars, the vertical bars are the annual service rides per cap, service rides per cap, or rides per capita, use of the system, which is the highest measure of performance of transit. That's the vertical bars in 2006 and 2011. And then the lines are the service hours per capita. So you can see there's an absolute relationship between service level and service use. So it's not a question of if we spend this money, will it be sunk cost, will we get any return on our investment? It's absolutely a certainty that if investment is made in public transportation at the appropriate time, then the ridership will respond, which will generate revenue, which will generate additional ridership growth. There are some unique things happening in Hamilton GTA right now. You take, for example, York. York currently has a population of almost double uh, the size of Hamilton. Brampton has recently passed Hamilton with a population of 510,000. Hamilton's population within the UTA is only about 480,000. And then you see Mississauga with uh, 741,000. So in terms of performance metrics, you can see all three of those municipalities, some of them quite a lot larger than the city of Hamilton, have lower ri rides per capita with a higher population. And there's, there's an explanation for all that. They're younger municipalities than Hamilton, and Hamilton has had a transit system for much longer than, than all three of these municipalities. But on the other side of the coin is all are in the same position right now. All are in some form of crisis. All are experiencing gridlock. All are experiencing significant congestion. And I guess the purpose of our discussion today is in part is to is with perhaps some planning and putting out some timelines in terms of when we're going to invest in transportation in Hamilton, we can avoid finding ourselves in the circumstances that these other municipalities are in. Because I think we all have experience with having to deal with crises, and crises also almost always consume uh, more money uh, than a well-planned implementation. Crises consume more staff and more negative image than a well-planned implementation. So we have an opportunity to learn here uh, from the experience of other municipalities. Um, now, again, these same three municipalities all recognize where they are, and they're all in a catch-up, and they're all spending millions of dollars in transit right now. And uh, in order to catch up, in order to alleviate the gridlock and, and the lack of goods movement and the uh, it's the dissatisfaction that they're uh, experiencing in the community as a result of, of all those complications. Interesting as well is that they're all investing in rapid transit. Uh, LRT is the highest return on investment working its way down to conventional public transit. But York has its uh, Viva program that it started off with bus rapid transit and is hoping to in the short term uh, commute that to light rail. Brampton has the Zoom uh, bus rapid transit program, and Mississauga has the My Way program. Interesting, all three of these initiatives were all preceded with a branding program. We have never really branded the, the transportation program in the city of Hamilton. We really, in my view, need to brand the transportation program, and that's not a small or inexpensive undertaking. The good news, though, is we do have the financial support of Metrolinx to pay for that. I suspect we can pay for it with 100% dollars. Uh, from Metrolinx, it will be a multi-year undertaking. But the timing is very good with the, this, um, now this amalgamated structure that we have. So whereas the other municipalities are only branding their transit program, we have the ability to, to brand our mobility program. So we will also brand with council support to move forward, not only the public transit program, not, not LRT or B, only LRT or BRT, whatever it becomes, but also brand our cycling program, our transportation demand management, our pedestrian program, everything transportation. So again, we're in a very unique situation to, in fact, use the experience of other communities, but to get a higher return on investment from those, uh, from, from this branding exercise, because we are the only municipality of all these municipalities that have a consolidated, integrated, uh, transportation program. That's some good news, uh, some bad news. Uh, Hamilton is not invested in this at the same rate as these other municipalities. And in fact, our rate has been, if you can see, if you look up at the lines, you can see the, uh, the, the solid line is actually a little bit below 
uh, the, the lighter colored line. What that indicates is that even though we've invested a couple of million dollars in the transportation program in the last few years, it has not kept pace with our population growth. So we're actually falling behind a little bit in terms of investment um, relative to, if not anything else, population growth. Good side of the good news is we're not in a crisis yet, uh, but a crisis is in the uh, foreseeable horizon. We do continue to, at the very least, uh, experience pressure from our, our operators and our operators union uh, with respect to our service levels. And, uh, and uh, that, in fact, is a matter right as we speak before uh, a board of arbitration. So there's a concern out there that even the existing services out there are not keeping pace with the uh, growth and demand. Two other municipalities to talk about are Halifax and London. They both have a lower population than Hamilton and higher ridership than Hamilton. But both have invested more heavily uh, and more significantly in Hamilton. Halifax is a unique, uh, an interesting comparison because the same way Hamilton has its challenges with the escarpment, Halifax has the bridges co connecting Halifax and, and Dartmouth. So they're a good comparator as well, but also a reflection of municipalities with smaller populations um, investing more in transit and then getting a good return on that investment. So the only point here today is to say is that if we invest in transit at the appropriate time with the the appropriate level of money, we will absolutely get that return on investment. So part of the discussion going forward can be, do we take a wait and see attitude and, and, and maybe get ourselves into a set of circumstances like York, Brampton, Mississauga, where we're playing catch up and, and perhaps, you know, and, and live in a crisis environment or look forward to say the Halifax, the London, uh, Victoria and Winnipeg as the models to aspire to, to say, let's, even if we can't invest tens of millions of dollars, can we stay ahead of the curve? Can we avoid the crisis and can we stay ahead of the wave? So that's, uh, that's what that uh, graph, it's a fairly complex graph, but it, it does indicate a number of things. And, and most importantly is that if we invest in public transportation, uh, there's, it's an absolute certainty that, uh, that there's a return on the investment. It's, it's, it's here in spades as well um, is, uh, I lost my train of thought, but that's probably uh, sufficient on, on that slide. Oh, sorry, Christine, if you could go back. The unfortunate thing is this slide is not quite big enough. And we want to talk about just the gaps in those lines. And I just did some quick math here this morning. If you look at Mississauga and the Mississauga investment, and you can see York has invested more and got higher ridership since uh, 2006. Brampton's the same. Mississauga's the same. You can see Hamilton's actually fallen behind a little bit. Uh, just a point with Mississauga, just the difference between those two bars there, that's a $6.9 million investment to get them there. So how will we get there is the third part of our four part theme. And uh, we say high performance rapid transit requires more, more than anything. There's, the, there's one thing with an absolute certainty that, the, that you need is increased service levels uh, in the public transit program across the board. We need to bring our frequency for the entire city of Hamilton up to the same level. We talked earlier how the lower escarpment, below the escarpment here, service frequencies are around four to five minutes. Service frequencies in the peak period on the escarpment or above the escarpment are largely about 15 minutes. There's quite a disparity there. Area, some area municipalities have no service at all. Where they have service, it's not at the same level as the rest of the municipality. So. Part of our thrust over the next little while, again, is to get this planning document back in front of committee, get direction from committee and council in terms of when money is available, how is that money going to be spent? Um, because we have a number of areas and uh, gaps to address. We need to elevate the role of public transit in the community and think that there's a recognition now of that here. And that goes to the branding exercise. It goes to a community where we perhaps spent 10 or so years trying to control the cost of transit and to a community that's now, I think, telling our decision makers it's time to uh, grow the public transportation program. So we need to further engage the community and we're, we're working on that both at a corporate, but we also need to work on it at a, at a division level on how the, how the system should grow. Uh, we've talked a lot about multimodal active transportation, the transportation suite. We need to move away from um, a segregated or fractured approach to advancing our different transportation programs, whether it's the automobile or the walker or, or the cyclist, and bring them all together as, as a unit uh, and as a, single, as a single entity. And to prepare for light rail, 
uh, we will have to uh, undertake some fairly substantive refiguration, reconfiguration of the transit network. That'll take a number of years to do. Won't be a painless exercise because it will be fairly disruptive. And uh, that's another exercise that we'll have to undertake over the next few years. A fair amount of planning uh, needs to be done to get us there. So uh, we talked about uh, looking. It's nice to have a target. You always want to have a target because if you don't have a target, they say any destination will do. So we looked at, we looked at moving to the next level. We're, there's no question that Hamilton is competitive with its peers here in Ontario, at least from a cost perspective, a ridership perspective. We are starting to get into an area of risk right now due to our, our level of investment, but we really need to move to a whole new plateau. And uh, the next uh, plateau in terms of uh, transit uh, programs throughout Canada would take in uh, municipalities like, uh, like Victoria, uh, Winnipeg, Halifax. We've chosen Winnipeg as a potential uh, target municipality because it's roughly the same geographic size as the city of Hamilton and it uh, has a population now that Hamilton anticipates having in 2031 which is the timeline we're using here today. And just to show you uh, some, some statistics here that we, uh, we got from working with Winnipeg is Winnipeg's current ridership is just a little bit more than double Hamilton's at 48 million. And you can see the rides per capita. Hamilton's at 46, been rather stagnant over the last couple of years. It's, it's deviated around the 40 to 46 range. Winnipeg's got 72 rides per capita. The significance of that number is that's not out of line with the transportation master plan target, which calls for 80 to 100 rides per capita. So again, Winnipeg's a good choice for us to look at in terms of, you know, what, what could we look like down the road? Uh, at some point in time, similar, ge similar geography, similar population that we're uh, looking to have in, uh, in 2031, and, um, and uh, um, similar rides per capita that are, uh, that are targeted in the transportation master plan. So what did we have to do in terms of transit enhancement to get from where we are to get there is 1.43 rides per capita. That's taking our total annual rides divided by our population comes out at 1.343 bus hours per capita. Winnipeg is just north of two. And uh, just to put the things in, in, in context, uh, that amounts to, let's say, a difference in per capita of um, 0.57 hours per capita. If you take all in cost of, of incre increasing our public transportation uh, program, that's the capital, the operating cost without revenue, uh, $100 an hour is, an, is a rough cost. You know, we're looking at about $30 million to get us from 1.43 bus hours per capita, 2 million rise per capita. So we're in that ballpark of the 30, 40, uh, 50 million dollars. Interesting in Winnipeg, you can see the low, lower average fare. Hamilton, with respect to our peer group here in, in, in Ontario, is uh, migrating to what could be uh, the lowest uh, fare um, in the Hamilton GTA area for comparable for mid-size and large municipalities. Winnipeg is able to manage a lower fare as a result of uh, provincial contributions. So they, uh, they, they still enjoy what Hamilton enjoyed up till about 1995, uh, 96, and that was a 50-50 split on the cost of providing, uh, the operating cost of providing public transit. So they've obviously invested some of that, not only in growing the service uh, to two bus hours per capita, but also keeping their fares low. So you can see the implications of having uh, the provincial government as a major funding partner. Thank you, Christine. Some final, some other statistics on Hamilton is uh, Winnipeg, as I said, is at 657,000, but 37% higher than we are in the ballpark for where we plan to be in, in 2031. What's really important is their population density, and, and when you really get down to an apples-to-apples -apples benchmarking exercise between one municipality and another, this is where you really have to understand benchmarking really, really well. Population density is absolutely key, and you can see the population density within uh, Winnipeg is, consistent, is considerably higher than Hamilton, as is their CBD employment. What's really good news here is I think we have every indication that our CBD employment is going to track uh, with what his, uh, Winnipeg has experienced over the last 10 years. The other is, is we, we talk about the performance, the financial performance and the ridership performance of other municipalities. And uh, second, post-secondary enrollment is absolutely key. They're one of the biggest drivers to transit ridership. Something that, again, where Hamilton leads the league is I think we have one of the most comprehensive bus pass programs in the country. 
Uh, we have literally every post-secondary education now on a bus pass program, and as long as we look after those contracts, that's guaranteed, in, uh, that's guaranteed revenue and it's guaranteed ridership. But you can see here in Winnipeg, their post-secondary uh, enrollment is 50,000. That's a big, big contributor to the ridership success. And uh, I guess to another degree, London. London has a higher post-secondary uh, education enrollment than Hamilton does. So within a smaller geographic area, London has a larger uh, catchment of transit ridership from its post-secondary enrollment. I'm going to speed up here a little bit and uh, just talk a little bit more about um, Winnipeg. Is ex you can see where what we've done here is plotted Hamilton's express network against Winnipeg's. And I think we've made our point now is that express services provide a higher return on investment than conventional services. So uh, certainly uh, we want to continue to grow the lines like the A line and the B line. We want to introduce lines across Mohawk and, and Rymel that will ultimately be express lines. But certainly a, a big component of Winnipeg's uh, success has been uh, high express service. More uh, peak period service, that's when people want to travel. Uh, so when we get into an evaluation metric in terms of for adding more transit service here in Hamilton, or is uh, we'll look at certain things like the return on investment on, on, uh, on uh, express services, the return on investment versus putting the service in the peak hours versus the off-peak, or perhaps moving from 21-hour, 21-7 service to 24-7 service. Real-time passenger information, uh, again, that's a major initiative for us over the next couple of years, and part of the realignment is to create a new position in the organization that will deal with solely and exclusively with things like social inf uh, social um, social media and real-time passenger information. So, uh, getting into the heart of the report, uh, the Rapid Ready report is based on three themes, improving public transit, supporting community planning, and multimodal integration. And the uh, so with respect to improving public transit, it measures uh, such as uh, structuring transit around the rapid transit corridors, increasing transit service, and improving the customer experience. Improving the customer experience is a major initiative for us moving forward. We need to make the service, you know, nothing beats increasing the service frequency, making the customer experience more, more user-friendly, more convenient, absolutely generates new ridership. And so we've got some work to do there. Expectations from the public are, much more to be have much more accessible access to information have the changes in the system that are occurring um, um, available them much more frequently the service much more easily to understand and get around in so so that's an area that we want to focus a lot of staff attention on over the next couple of years support of community planning planning how the city will grow around rapid transit with supportive land use and densities and i think we're seeing it now Te teamwork is going to get the job done Multimodal integration, rapid transit will serve as the main spines in the city, but in order to work effectively, it must be integrated within a regional transit, such as GO and other expanded mobility options, such as cycling, walking, and carpooling. So there are seven key uh, actions in this. This is really intended to be a how-to manual, that if somebody walked into the door and said, how, to, how are we going to improve the public transportation program in Hamilton over the next five or 10 or 15 years? This is intended to be the cookbook uh, to get us there. So there's seven key actions with three, uh, three strategies or three themes uh, outline, outlined in this slide. Uh, so, Christian, I guess we can move on. So what are we doing right now? Uh, we've got a lot of irons in the fire. Uh, frankly, not enough horses to pull the wagons, but we're working on changing that. Um, most importantly, the specialized transit, we're going to hear more about that during the, the budget presentation, is a, is a major uh, draw on our resources right now, long overdue, and uh, I think we're doing some really good stuff that we're going to feel really good about as a community uh, once we have AOD up and running. We also have some quick wins projects uh, underway that we need to finish before the end of this year, or at least substantially finish, to demonstrate to the province that when they give us financial support, we can deliver on that financial support. We've ordered all the infrastructure, the back office infrastructure, to allow us to give real-time wayfinding in the transit system. <coughs> And we've also ordered the signage for the downtown, the new McNabb Street terminal that will allow us to give real-time information in the terminal. So that will be our first opportunity to demonstrate real-time transit information. But at the same time, we're buying, we're, we're buying the back office network to allow us to do that at, at all 2,200-odd bus stops in the system. 
Uh, we're working with Mohawk and uh, on a multimodal transit terminal there. We're hoping uh, to, uh, to get an operating agreement with them in the not too distant future. We talked about transit priority measures on uh, King Street bus only lane that's been, uh, that's been uh, highlighted in the report. And infrastructure upgrades, as the councillor asked the question earlier, you know, so what's different about high order transit? What we intend to do is again use 100% Metrolink's dollars to really, really improve some of the uh, major stops along the A line and the B line and to show you what a real high order rapid transit, light rail transit, BRT, whatever you want to call it, what a real station stop looks like. And again, we'll do all of that with, uh, with uh, uh, Metrolink's money that's already been provided to the city. Uh, Peter, uh, the second report today talks to our bike share program. I'll leave that to Peter Topolovic to report on. We've reported to the committee on a, on a bus shelter expansion. We haven't expanded since 2010, I think it is. There's a report in front of Public Works Committee. It was temporarily tabled. It's coming back on March the 18th, and we hope to move forward with the direction from Council on that to expand our system by 50 uh, bus shelters. We've already talked about the, the image and uh, what that might, uh, building the city's image, building the transportation program image, and what that might take into account. We're working actively uh, with Go Transit, doing everything that they need of us to ensure that that project gets completed on time uh, and, and uh, to be fully operational uh, in time for the Pan Am Games. And then Presto impl implementation, it's, it's hit some bumps in the road, but we're absolutely obligated to participate in the Presto program in order to remain eligible for our uh, gas tax monies. What we might do over the next three to four years, depending on the direction we receive from Council, funding, whether funding flows from whatever level of government and whether it's in the form of capital or operating, it could apply to improving our express services, harmonizing our service levels across the city, addressing existing service reliability issues, I talked about those earlier, and improving connections to the outlying communities, express services from the outlying communities into the downtown, transit priority measures, continue to grow our cycling program, introduce our mobi pedestrian mobility program, do some more work on the transportation demand management, and with that, depending on what direction Council sends us in, to uh, realign some of our staffing. Not a major realignment, not a major restructuring, no requirement for additional staff, simply taking opportunity uh, with some existing vacancies to restructure to allow us to complete these initiatives. The, uh, again, uh, where are we at now? The rapid Ready Expanding Mobility Choices in Hamilton. Chris talked on this number earlier. All we've done is put up some of the really big ticket items. This list is probably 50, 75 items long. It's on page 43 or 44 of the report. And we're talking about to add, for example, 250,000 hours of service to get us into the ballpark of, of Winnipeg. And we could be looking at 25 to 40, we would be looking at 25 to 45 million dollars in operating costs depending on where the services were put, what time of day, day of the week. Capital costs uh, would fluctuate somewhere between 50 and 75 million. We'll need to build a second maintenance garage. I think that number is really quite light. Brampton just built one and it was well over 50 million dollars. Um, transit signal priority, again, another initiative in the city that working in partnership with traffic. We have the, the fiscal capability within the Metrolinx funding and the reserves to uh, install a completely new, uh, sophisticated transit signal priority program that could benefit the entire city. And passenger shelter amenities, we've talked about that a little bit. We're gonna upgrade certain stations along the A line and the B line, expand our shelter network by some 50 uh, shelters. And then we're gonna go back through the entire shelter network and refurb the, sh the entire shelter network. It's in, it is in a state of uh, disrepair at the moment. And then we, talk, we talked about branding that uh, it's, it's not a small uh, ticket item. It's four to $5 million. Again, our expectation is most, if not all of that money would flow uh, from Metrolinx. So getting ready, uh, building a rapid transit network. Uh, this is kind of the, the concept moving forward. A network that will draw riders from all areas of the city, build on ridership and rapid transit, express corridors and feeder routes. Enhancing service levels both within the main Queen, King Queenston corridor and the James Upper Drames corridor, extending all the way to the waterfront. Through route restructuring increases in service span, service frequency and service coverage. And adjacent to the two quarters ensure that routes have the capability to feed the A-line and the B-line such that ridership will grow towards meeting TMP targets. Expanding the service coverage and growth areas, improving connections to the outer municipalities of Waterdown, Binbrook and Stony Creek, and longer term to express bus 
install express bus links to provide fast east-west services between future go-to corridors. So I can speed up at this point. Some stuff that we have underway that's very positive for the community is implementation of the DART's eligibility policy. Some municipalities have allowed their, uh, their eligibility policies to lag behind. Hamilton is out in front. We've, again, tried to create that equitable playing field where and to some degree, our people with disabilities have left, been left behind. Council's adoption of the DART's eligibility policy and its investment in AODA will bring that level of service up comparable to and equitable to um, people uh, without disabilities. Um, the, the, um, the DART's uh, program, again, funded with, um, with uh, provincial monies. We're in the process of st installing mobile data terminals and all the DART's buses. What that would allow us to do is uh, as a person with a disability, it takes some time for them, especially in the winter, to get ready to take their trip. It can take upwards of five or 10 minutes, especially if they have to put a coat on and they may need assistance. One of the most interesting thing about this software is that software will call um, the, the residents of the individual we're going to pick up at a predetermined time. And you can set it to any time. You can set it to five minutes, 10 minutes. And so what it'll do is when the vehicle is en route to the resident, it will call the resident's home and say your bus will be there in whatever time we choose to put in that. So that when, the, when we get there, we don't have to wait for the resident to, to dress, to get to the curb. And so there's great, great opportunity for productivity improvement there. And uh, we're actually following the lead of, uh, of Edmonton on that. So that will be a very, very good investment. Um, implementing AODA and uh, trans uh, travel training. Again, we're way ahead of the curve in terms of travel training and the travel training, we're gonna report back on this on a separate report because it is uh, out to a really, really good start and we're enjoying some really good success in terms of keeping people on the conventional transit system and attracting people to the conventional transit system that previously relied on darts because they were uncertain of or afraid of the conventional transit program. And we're very quickly talking about, uh, this has got some media attention this week, is the uh, the dedicated lane along King Street, working with councillors Farr and McCaddy, and here it only goes as far as Queen Street. I think there's there's some um, interest and in, uh, to extend that all the way to Dundurn Street, and this would be our first opportunity to demonstrate uh, transit priority measures using dedicated bus lanes. Dedicated bus lanes, again, that's a key, absolutely key component of high order transit. When you go to describing or defining high order transit. Higher to transit means you put the buses in a dedicated lane, whether it's a side street or whether it's the main corridor, and all the travels in that corridor is either buses or, high, or HOV vehicles. That dramatically improves the, uh, the productivity of public transit. That is one of the key ingredients of high order transit. We investigate uh, transit signal or transit priority on James, Upper James. It's becoming the most congested corridor for public transit in the city. Uh, additional challenges with getting the buses up and down the escarpment. So we really need to focus some attention on James, Upper James Corridor, uh, to get the buses up and down the escarpment, uh, in particular the deadhead buses, but also the in-service buses. It's uh, probably the place, uh, I think the, the one written in the system that we're experiencing perhaps the most uh, uh, slowdown right now as a result of congestion. And then we can investigate transit-only access and major transit terminals such as Lime Ridge and Eastgate. We've done uh, made some improvement at, at Lime Ridge, and that was huge, being able to create a dedicated lane to get the buses back out into uh, service at, uh, at Lime Ridge, and we need to do more of that. A minute or two or three minutes in the public transit game is a, is a lifetime. So uh, we're getting close to the end. Uh, creating a uh, rapid transit, uh, creating a refined uh, customer transit experience. This has been an area where we haven't focused on in the past, and, and, and frankly, we've got some catch-up to do and that's in marketing and branding of the mobility program. Increasing transit is, increasingly, transit agencies across North America are incorporating commercial marketing approaches and methods to both attract new users and retain existing riders. Methods may include sophisticated market research, and segmentation tactics, branding, and identity programs, product positioning, and individual targeting of markets. New ground for us, but we're learning that with My Way and Viva and and Zoom in Mississauga, Brampton, New York. It's something that a community of our size absolutely has to get into. Uh, customer service information, uh, the real time that I talked about, open data communication, bus stop and passenger amenities, I've talked about that. We're going to build some rapid transit stations, presumably along uh, uh, James and, uh, and this corridor. Uh, smartphone application for transit is just some of the things that uh, 
we'll be getting into. Uh, providing safe and, and convenient walking and cycling. We need to continue uh, the progress we've already made on the cycling master plan, endorse the, the pedestrian mobility plan. We'll be back before committee uh, before summer, I assume. Bike, inst bike rack installation at, suggest at, at selected A line and B line stops, way funding signage signage we talked about, the bike share program we're gonna hear about shortly, and uh, accelerate our, our, bike, uh, our bike lanes and rapid transit corridors. Something as well is, is undertaking a walkability audit. Uh, Chamber of Commerce has done a study, and I want to get back in touch with David and maybe get back in front of a committee on this, is that, is that we're learning is that there are a lot of people that want to use public transportation and can't, and there are a number of reasons for it. And so what we re really need to do is improve the access from the origin to the bus and from the bus to uh, the destination. And uh, so we're going to hear a lot more about that in the future. Integrating uh, corridor and community planning, we can need to continue integrate our planning approach as was done for the B-Line, develop an A-Line corridor strategy. This is some of the work the Rapid Transit Office could be working on over the next few years. Uh, better integrate TDM and land use, and, and again, on the theme of public engagement, engage the BIAs to encourage TDM in retail. Developing seamless multimodal uh, connections, uh, absolutely critical. Enhancing our integration, bus service between which, uh, it, which means bus service between uh, the new GO stations and the, Ald and the Aldershot uh, GO Rail terminus. There are going to be changes there uh, imminently, uh, or at least over the next 12 to 18 months that we're going to have to adapt to. And this goes to perhaps providing um, uninterrupted service from Waterdown uh, through uh, Aldershot GO and into downtown Hamilton. Uh, not even so much as, as, a, as a building a transit and water down initiative, but as connecting our renter regional partners to uh, to the city of Hamilton. So water down will benefit. The initiative is is that we have to make ourselves accessible and fully integrated into uh, the different uh, the different go stations. So we'll continue to work with Metrolinx and go on that. They really lead in that uh, in that area, but uh, they'll have us uh, there, and we'll provide whatever resources are necessary to make that work in a timely fashion. So uh, this is just one example of what the amenities are that I'm talking about, and this is a bus standard here, and you can see how much that, uh, how much more attractive that is than a, than a sign stuck on a hydro pole. And you can see some of the canopy work here. So very soon we'll be hoping to go out for a, re a request for a proposal to get a respondent to provide us with uh, several artists' rendering of what these stations could look like in time to get back in front of committee, in time to get a funding decision for 2013 in order to take advantage of monies that we have set aside for, uh, Metrolinx monies we have set aside for that initiative. Getting very near the end, uh, we have 11.5 kilometers of bike lanes every, and uh, 2.5 kilometers of sharrows. So I guess the point is we have accomplished a lot. We haven't accomplished by me any shape or means the everything that was laid out in the, in the transportation master plan, but we have accomplished a lot. A transportation uh, demand management program, uh, the Smart Commute program, where we have 14 employers and 87,000 employees, found out yesterday that the spectator signed on, so that, that's, that's going to be a big plus for that program. We have a 2014 goal of, of, of increasing from 14 employers to 20 employers and from 87,000 participating employees to 95,000 participating participating employees. We're in the top five carpooling communities in the region. We have a draft uh, mobility management plan to be presented to committee and council in March or April. We're expanding the service hours in, at the HSR. We're in the third year and we will complete that on time. We have some service to add in uh, the Dundas area between McMaster and Dundas. We've got some reconfiguration to do up in the Stony Creek area and we've got Aberdeen Lock, uh, York uh, to implement and we will get that done uh, before the end of the year. Um, our fleet, uh, really good news story is we had a fairly ragtag fleet as little as uh, seven or eight years ago. I think today we have one of the most, I know today we have one of the most modern fleets in the country. Uh, with uh, What that has allowed us to do is, and we'll see in our budget presentation, is really mitigate the cost of, of uh, our maintenance costs in the operating budget. Uh, from two perspective, our cost of bus parts is down uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars, in fact, in excess of a million dollars as a result of a younger fleet. So we've used provincial capital money to buy buses 
that's had a favorable impact on our operating budget, and we'll see that our, our maintenance costs are, are really, really uh, uh, in good shape. And uh, on top of that, the buses that we most recently bought have a five-year bumper-to-bumper warranty. So we're really, really going to be able to mitigate our cost of maintenance. And uh, that's really important because maintenance now is, is, uh, is approaching uh, probably 30% or more of the total operating budget. So uh, beyond what you pay for the bus operators, it's the most single most expensive uh, cost in, in terms of providing a public transportation program. And there's certain things you can't control, like fuel. It's You're going to burn so much fuel for every mile you put on. But if we can control our cost of parts and our cost of maintaining the vehicles, those are some pretty substantial, uh, some pretty substantive dollars, and we're well positioned for a number of years there. We do need to buy more articulated buses. We, as quickly as we catch up, in terms of our capacity, we find ourselves again with the capacity constraints. Our our capital budget doesn't uh, isn't sustainable buying ca articulated buses, so it is one area that we could uh, perhaps have a conversation with the province on in terms of a buy up from conventional 40-foot bus to articulated buses. We were one of the first municipalities in all of Canada to be 100% low floor accessible. The first municipality in Canada, one of the first in Canada to be 100% bike racks on the buses. We talked about James Street North and LRT planning, and we're done. We're down to the staff recommendation. Thank you for being so patient. Uh, Deputy Mayor and members of council. Thanks, Don. So I do have a list of speakers that they can remember their questions because that was quite a presentation. I have Councillor Collins, Councillor Jackson, Councillor McHattie, Councillor Ferguson, Councillor Johnson, and Councillor Farr at this time. So Councillor Collins, please. Yep, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Don, I, th I think one of the most common questions that we've been asked over the last little while is the whole issue of uh, certainly cost and what the impact will be on taxes. And I, th I just want to be clear through the notes that I had made during your presentation and and what we have um, in the package that we received, the it, it looks like the 12, just over 12 million dollars is the annual, the net annual cost uh, on the levy to provide the LRT service. Is that correct? It would be, I think, about a two, around a two percent tax increase. I'm sure you're right. Are you and, and just while you were presenting, there were people through social media asking questions, and I. I just want to be clear on that 2%, if um, Mike can refresh our memory, is that about a, a $50 a year cost to the average home in the city? So through, uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, including education now, 1% uh, equates to $8.2 million, so $12 million would be about 1.5%, which would translate somewhere in the area probably about uh, $42 per household. Thanks for that. So in addition to that, Don, uh, I'm just, I'm going to take, my questions will be associated with what you've presented here and then obviously the report itself, which goes into much greater detail. You talked about a net increase of 182 employees, I think it was. That's the net increase after we factor in the changes to the existing B line. We take the buses off the road for, for the B line route. We introduce LRT and essentially there's a net increase of 182, which would be covered in the 12 million that you just referenced. I wonder if I could please, Mr. Deputy Mayor, to refer that to our Rapid Transit Manager, Justin. Mr. Deputy Mayor, 182 staff is for a standalone facility. There would be a reduction in staff from the offsetting of the 18 buses. So there'd be bus operators as well as some maintenance staff that could be shifted over to the Rapid Transit program. Sorry, I missed the first part there. That So the 182 is not the net new employee figure that we would as a result of the switch from the bus rapid transit to LRT? Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, no, that's that's a standalone number. Um, so there would be about 72 operators that could be reduced, plus maintenance and office staff um, from the re reduction of 18 buses. Okay. And that number stood out for me because I didn't see anywhere in there, you know, where would these individuals be working? So if we have new employees, they're working up at the, uh, at the bus barn, essentially, uh, on Upper James. And that's taken into account as well in terms of all the costs that are associated with imp implementing the program. Well, frankly, that, that facility would not, the Mountain Transit Centre would not house an LRT operation. We'd either have to expand the Wentworth Street operation or build in that area, and that was the purpose of the 
uh, the, the maintenance facility study. Uh, we, we stopped short of actually costing out a facility uh, because it, it was an opportunity for cost avoidance that council asked us to take a look at. But certainly we would need another facility. We'd either need to take the Wentworth Street facility and move everything out of there and expand that facility or build an entirely new facility. And uh, that was in one of the high cost items that we looked at, the big ticket items. And I think we're probably well into the $50 million range to, to build a new facility. And that's in or out of the 800 million we expect from the province, Don, through you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Deputy Mayor, the cost for an LRT facility is included in the $811 million. Including the office staff who would need offices to manage that project, not just the maintenance building, because the maintenance building is referenced throughout. I didn't, I didn't see anything that referenced where the staff of, the, of LRT would be working. And we know there's no room here in City Hall, so I figured it'd be a new facility. Mr. Deputy Mayor, the staff would be operating out of the LRT maintenance facility in, in the assumption. Yeah, um, I guess one of the most, the other common question that I would receive from people, from those people who are currently using the route and would consider using the LRT, what happens to the fare structure there? We've not contemplated any change in the fare structure. Again, it goes with this notion of a, a baseline with no as few assumptions as possible built into it. So the assumption is the status quo, whatever the fare is for the regular transit, conventional transit system, that becomes the new LRT rate. That's correct. Okay. And in terms of... Um, Don, throughout the report, there's a number of references, and, and even through your presentation here today, that in order to get, in order to prepare ourselves for the use of LRT by the community, in fact, you need to make many enhancements for the, um, through the conventional transit system, and I, I think it's, you didn't use the word feeder routes, but those routes that are, um, you know, feed off of the, the current B-line route, I thought I read through the report that suggested many enhancements, and I think those are those on page 43. Some of them would fall under the, in appendix. Uh, under the investment plan tab, I think it is. And so you've listed there $155 million worth of improvements that um, is sort of on our shopping list of enhancements that would help us with the implementation of LRT. Some of them are unrelated, but many of them are related to LRT. Um, what, of the 155 million, what kind of budget are we looking at to get us in a position where we're ready for LRT from, as it relates to conventional transit? Well, um, if we go back to that chart that was produced by MITL, if we simply left here on Friday and come back on Monday and LRT was up and running, our ridership would be in the, in the entry level range. It would be within uh, the ridership that already exists uh, throughout North America on LRT systems. However, to get us from uh, that, that starting position to uh, equivalent of Calgary or Edmonton, we would have to double or triple our ridership. So um, it, it, the return, the revenue return is higher than the, than, than the cost of expenditure, but not insignificant. To double our ridership implies uh, an additional 100 buses in the system minimum, an additional 250,000 hours at roughly $100 an hour. So it, it's, it's an order of magnitude to think about uh, context more than trying to put a real uh, tight number on it, but it's to point out that the number is very, very significant. And, and that number far exceeds the cost to the municipality of LRT itself in terms of our, what we're contributing. Understanding if the province came through with their 800 million and there's, there's a $12 million price tag for us to implement, what you have on the investment list is $155 million worth of capital. Uh, I think that you've hit on probably one of the most um, um, significant points going forward from here. It's, it, going forward from here is like, first of all, uh, where will the money come from? Who will it come from? And in what form will it come? Will it come from all three levels of government? Will it be in the form of capital? I think the province has been very clear that operating is not on the table. Will there be a private partner? So that will drive a decision in terms of whether to grow the transit program or whether to grow the LRT program. So one possible scenario is the province said, no, we are only investing in light rail transit. So, and we're prepared to give you X amount of money in capital. 
So the municipality has to come up with the operating, which is why we've put this whole menu of items forward because we don't know whether there's going to be one, two, three levels of government um, involved here. We don't know whether the private sector is going to be involved. We don't know whether it's going to come in capital or operating. And if it comes in operating, 100% of that is borne by the municipality under the current formula. And, and so for LRT, that figure is 12 million. It is. But for the conventional trans transit upgrades that you're recommending, or if you want to call it our shopping list, to get us rapid ready, we'd have to invest. That cost is 45 million dollars. We'd operating. have to ex invest something in the order of 50 million dollars to uh, get us from a starting position to the mid-range of uh, ridership and uh, and cost of operating LRT relative to other LRT operations across North America. So I know we're still talking at a very high level, Mr. Chairman, through you, Don, but of, of that list, what needs to happen prior to LRT cutting the ribbon and operating on Queenston, King, whatever route you're talking uh, Without a doubt, we need to continue to enhance our service levels. Um, it was, so you heard me speak earlier, and I'm not speaking ill, uh, of our, our, our um, our union, but we continue to face, we came to you in 2011 to enhance the conventional transit system. We continue to face challenges with respect to the existing service levels, not only in those corridors, but across the city, and, and in fact are in, in the middle of a fairly protracted arbitration. So not only is the pressure to, to, to grow the exp system, expand the system, bring it all up and harmonize the level of service, uh, we have pressure just with what's on the road right now to address the existing uh, uh, capacity demands out there. The, the, the $3 million that we're going to spend when it's all implemented, it'll get a long way there. But you, you see, as quickly as we add it, the ridership is going to respond, and we're going to be right back where we started. So I say, nobody can convince me that we're in a crisis right now, but a crisis is on the horizon, and we have a planning window here to determine if, first of all, determine how much money, if, if there is any money to spend, and then make conscious decisions about how to spend that money. To spend the money to, uh, to address uh, the existing system, to bring the area municipalities up to the uh, same level as the rest of the city, to better connect the area municipalities to the rest of the city. Those are, those are some pretty tough decisions that we're going to have to wrestle with. But first of all, we have to find out what the source of funding is. We have to get a document in front of council that helps us make those kinds of decisions so that when money flows, it's, it's, it's it's flowing as per the direction of council in total. And, you know, and, and we need to find out where's the money going to come from. Uh, for example, per, it's entirely conceivable that for LRT, uh, the federal and provincial governments may only be interested in LRT in terms of capital. They may not be interested, but that's why, again, we have to get this document in front of them to get that conversation started to flush out whether or not they have any money, and if they have money, uh, how much flexibility do they have in terms of where and how it's spent? Yeah, and, I, and I, you know, it surprised me reading this report because I found that prior to reading it, I thought the biggest hurdle would be finding the funds for LRT. And after reading this book um, from front to back, you, you learn that the base transit service levels, as you call them in the report, they become a much larger hurdle because, if, as you say, if it's just about LRT and we get the capital funding, that's fine. But if we need to enhance our conventional transit system to enable us to use LRT properly, then that, that, you know, that's my question. A lot of my questions here have to do with financing. So what happens to the capital budget if we're, well, this, even if you say a third of the list, Don, yeah. of the $155 million is coming from us and all of the operating, traditionally that's the case, the feds and the province aren't into the, the operating for the most part. You know, if we're looking at 20 to 30 million dollars in operating pressures, you're, you're absolutely on point. One of the one of the problems of the past that we can't ought not to repeat in the future is to bring you a fragmented approach. Come and, and say, look, we really need to sell you on this service, sell you on the service, and then show up at the very next meeting and say, but we also need money for this service. What we're trying to do is say, this is all of our needs as best we can project them at this point in time for the conventional transit, for cycling, for walking, for interregional connections to support GO. This is the full menu so that there are no surprises. And we fully appreciate that there's competing interests here. There's competing interest between the conventional transit program and LRT. There's, con there's competing interest between the transportation program and Council's other strategic priorities. We know that infrastructure is a strategic priority of Council, social housing is a strategic priority. Our job is to get in front of you as complete a picture as possible so you can make as well-informed decision as possible without any surprises after you make a decision.
Thanks for that, Don. And three, Mr. Chairman, uh, so many times through the report, it references a route optimization, sort of uh, looking at the network and sort of replanning what we currently have to help us with our, our operating costs. And yet it's one of the only um, line items on the shopping list that has no funding beside it. And, and well, so I'm, I'm wondering why that's the case and if you can elaborate on that. Well, I, I guess it depends on what uh, your definition of route optimization is in terms the, the, the report talks about route restructuring to better feed the LRT down the road to make it, it convenient. Um, that is a, 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 a major planning exercise that would take us a, probably a couple of years to do. Uh, probably be continued on external funding because we have higher uh, financial pressures right now and we would have a number of years before we implement LRT. But what the experts from around the world are telling us is that our current system design is not optimized with respect to feeding uh, a future LRT system. The other side of that equation, and when I think of route optimization, is, is do we have any underperforming routes that could either be canceled or the hours could be shifted, as Councillor McCaddy had alluded to earlier. And uh, we have very few, if any, uh, underperforming routes. And I think the IBI report was quite accurate there when it said even if we eliminated everything that fell below Council's cutoff line, uh, we could only really cut about 10% of the total cost. That answers my question there. Don, BRT, um, it's always been seen as the alternative, and I listened with interest earlier. Your response to Councillor Jackson was that I think part of our recommendation here today sends information to the province that talks about the fact that, you know, if we're not going ahead with light rail transit, we may actually want to enhance our, our bus uh, transit system, conventional system across the city, and you've given all kinds of information to show where that can happen. When I read um, in... Appendix B, page 22, it's one of the pull-out uh, pages here. On top of that page, it, it references BRT, and it says um, it gives some costs. The 2012 cost is, I guess it looks at $15 million, and it says not considered, and it's, it's bolded in red. And then down below, there's um, a note that says LRT technology has been chosen for further consideration. So it almost seems like... I'm just using that message as the example. It almost seems like BRT isn't an option for us. So can you elaborate well, on why that was in the report that way? And, and BRT, quite frankly, it's really not referenced at all through the whole document. Well, I'm very fussy about following Council's direction to the letter. And our direction was to report back on LRT. Our, our agreement between the city and the province was to report back on LRT. We very deliberately didn't talk to BRT because we no more wanted to turn LRT against the conventional transit system than we did want to make it either an LRT or a BRT decision. What, we, what we're saying is we need to grow the public transit program, the public transportation program in many, many areas across the city, and as well as our cycling and our pedestrian. And we don't think it's a good idea to, to pit one program against another. It's to identify all of the program needs so that when we go forward to the province, because right now we don't know what's in the minds of the province. So we want to take a complete inventory. And if the province says, no, LRT is not on for the city of Hamilton, however, and nor is investment in your public transit program, mm -hmm. but we're interested in BRT, well, with this information, we could turn around a BRT proposal very quickly. I guess our suggestion is, is that we no, no more want to corner ourselves into an LRT or nothing debate any more so that we want to corner ourselves into a BRT or nothing debate. And we needed to follow the direction of council and the direction of... So BRT is, is not a stretch here. We could turn this information around and, and bring back a detailed report on BRT if we needed to. But we didn't want this debate to turn from LRT to BRT. We wanted to say this is the entire, the needs of the entire transportation program for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, depending on cash flow. And so let's, let's for the time being, avoid pitting one program against another and just creating a list of all our needs. And I ask that in the context, too, of the fact that you've put so many conventional transit system improvements on the list, and it almost seems, again, back to Councillor Jackson's question earlier, where you had said through you, Mr. Chairman, that, you know, if the province decides that maybe they can't afford the $800 million, we've given them some other options, again, not to pit one to the other, but there's a whole shopping list of conventional transit system improvements that are on this list that almost seem like the alternative to LRT, and that, that's why I asked that question, because the natural alternative in the past has been BRT, yeah. and, and now 
the list that's here is essentially, there's the LRT file, here are all the costs, and then separated from that, but connected, because the, the, if there's you look some synergies at, there. Yeah. There's the conventional transit system improvements. If you look at the big moves document and how our Nords and Corridors document f policy feeds into the big moves, it's, it's build, to be, build to be line, whether it's BRT, LRT, or a higher level of service of what it is right now, build the A line all the way from the airport down to the waterfront, build Mohawk, uh, start Mohawk down a rapid transit, start Rymel Road down the rapid transit. And in the same respect, if we had, if an opportunity arises for us to have the discussion with the province and the province says, no, we're sticking by our guns, it's the big moves initiatives only, the big moves are only uh, A line and B line, that's all we're interested in talking about, then okay, we can talk about only A line and B line. Are we talking about just capital? Are we talking about capital and operating? The whole intent, or one of the primary intents of this whole document is to go, hopefully have a conversation with the province that says, so what are your perimeters? What are your absolute rules? What are you flexible on? Is there any opportunity for discussion here? Is there any opportunity for negotiation? And uh, just how locked in are you on? Because we haven't been able to get that response from them. And so that we're, we're not sent back to the drawing board, we're going to try to go there with all possible options we can conceive of so that they will ultimately set the parameters and if they put if they put capital up and the capital says this is the only place you can spend it, then we'll have to report back to capital and council and say, okay, the province is only on for capital. They're only on for the A line and the B line. These are our options with that capital on those two lines. Okay. In, in my last couple of questions, and I'll be very brief, Mr. Chairman, through you, is, is um, you know, to be very parochial about it, I have had my own meetings certainly with business community within my area and, and uh, your staff and others were kind enough to assist me with some of the presentations that we held for a limited number of people who attended. And we've also done the same in my area to a select group, um, some of condominium owners and an apartment on Queenston Road. And, and I, I found through those discussions, Don, that there's great resistance with the design. And we still have people who have yet to accept the no left in and no left out of properties, especially along Queenston where we have you know, a, a lot of commercial activity. And we have a lot of people who reside on that stretch in, you know, I say I probably have seven or eight very large apartment buildings. And that's not counting those people who live on the neighborhoods um, surrounding it. And so when I'm in front of them and I show them the new design of LRT and the restrictions that come with it, um, they're not supportive. And some of them are, you know, they're very large chain businesses who've made investments the from the Tim Hortons to, um, you know, some of the large uh, shopping stores uh, to the mom and pop operators who are operating a sub shop or a small retail business and their concern is access. And through all the education that we've done and I think staff have done a tremendous job, we've been very proactive for four or five years now in terms of illustrating what impact it'll have on parking. That's not much of an issue for me because I don't have on street parking. That's more of an issue certainly for the other councillors uh, west of me. But access in and out of properties is probably the single biggest issue that I've, um, I've had to face with my own residents. And if they're not transit riders, they're, they're less accepting obviously of, of understanding maybe the benefits that come, comes with a, an LRT or any kind of a system that restricts ac access. So we're giving this information to the province. They may in fact at some point in time in the short, medium or long term um, advise that they're on board we're off to the races in terms of the additional plans that have to come with it. Within three to five years, we may have something that says we're ready to put the shovels in the ground. H how are we dealing with those individuals, those companies, uh, and those residents who have yet to accept the fact that, I mean, there's some big changes on the horizon in terms of how some of these major streets will function in the future. And, and I've yet to hear anyone relay alternatives to what's been presented so far. Through you, Mr. Chairman. That's right on point. And we talk of, talked about this a little bit earlier in our slideshow. Our biggest opportunity is also our biggest challenge. The biggest opportunity is we already have the ridership in that corridor to support an LRT system. The biggest challenge is it's a very complex, busy corridor. And we will meet uh, tremendous challenges, have tremendous challenges to overcome to build LRT, which is going to extend the timeline for building LRT. Uh, because we're, it's, it's, it could, it's an 180 degree contrast to an empty corridor. And so those challenges are going to be time consuming. And, and quite frankly, we started down the path of LRT 
with in hurry up mode. In other words, how quickly can, can we implement LRT uh, before the Pan Am Games? I think it's worth noting that that strategy has changed, not by our doing, but by as a result of financial circumstances. And we're more now in stepping back and looking at a, a more comprehensive planning timeline. And so my point is, is that had we tried to forge forward and get LRT up and running in four or five years, the uh, community resistance might have been um, un insurmountable, quite frankly. Um, and we would have been uh, incur incurring an awful lot of community backlash, perhaps to the point uh, that, it, that, that it, it, it may have threatened the project. The, the good thing about this change in this course correction now where we have time to sit back and properly plan, we've picked out a segment of corridor where there's very, very high transit ridership. We found two uh, ward councillors are prepared to champion a demonstration to give us an opportunity to gain some experience on a small scale because we will absolutely have to deal with that. We've already talked to councillors Farr and Councillor McCaddy about that, about turning restrictions, and that if we have them, and we probably need them in order to get a fruitful demonstration, you know, are we up for the backlash? Because there will, in fact, be backlash. So that's one of the things that we hope to discern from this pilot if the pilot moves forward, and we'll bring that back in some detail in a dedicated report to committee. Well, and I've looked at that pilot, and it's, it's, it's in stark contrast to what Queenston Road is. There, Queenston Road has, you know, dozens of driveway entrances yep. and exits. I get that fully, absolutely. And, and you're, when you're dealing downtown, it's, it's a different business environment. It certainly has more commerce maybe than I would have in, yep. in dollar value, but it's a completely different environment. So I'm, I'm meeting with people who are driving that corridor who say, I shop at these stores regularly. I live in the neighborhood adjacent to it. I'm not supportive of it because of those restrictions. I'm meeting with the, res the business community who says, I didn't plan when I moved in, my, when I invested here, I didn't plan for these turning restrictions. And when I'm talking to transit users in my area, um, they're happy with the B-Line services. You know, as Don McLean mentioned in his presentation, we need to make some changes and some enhancements. But they're not complaining about the fact, I mean, it's an express service. It's the best bus service in the city. So I've been spoiled from that perspective. And so the transit riders are, are saying LRT would be nice, but we're happy with, with the B-Line. And so I'm trying to find a champion within those sectors to say, well, here are the reasons why we should be doing it. And, and from my own, my own area, I'll be honest with you, I'm not seeing the outpouring of support that we see maybe in other parts of the city, like the downtown, where we certainly have a lot of champions about what this means to certain areas. And, and mine's not a, my commercial area is not, um, I don't have the, maybe some of the vacancies that others have where we might see some economic uplift. Uh, it's fairly established and built out, so I, I, I don't see that either. So I, someone's going to have to help me with that over the next uh, I, I, several months because it's something that we haven't solved in four years, and I'm hoping it doesn't take four or five uh, more to try to overcome it. Abe, I guess the best I can respond to that right now is I get it 100%. It, it is going to be a huge, if potentially insurmountable uh, issue, and we don't take it lightly. lightly. Um, if, if we can get this pilot up and running and demonstrate some success with the pilot, I guess, I'm a big believer if you can put something on the road that the people can see and touch, uh, then they're more likely. So that would be part of the process of down the road to get the buy-in. And, and I would agree with you. If we just, if we'd gone with the the, the, the accelerated uh, launch, uh, we would have faced some some very very significant challenges, potentially enough to to side rail the pro to to derail the project. No no pun intended. So, the good thing about now the timing horizon open up a little bit, it does give us an opportunity to put our foot in the shallow end as opposed to jumping into the deep end. Uh, but yeah, we would have been some for some really really difficult. Uh, challenges there and some some very decisive 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 divisive divisive thank you <laughs> community debate <laughs> all right well those are my questions mr chairman and i thank don for all of those answers thank you thank you councillor collins councillor jackson please thanks uh, mr deputy mayor and don i didn't say it five hours ago but i'll say it now thank you so much for all the work you've done on uh, this file with your project team, the uh, Rapid Ready team, the members that you've outlined, starting with the city manager, 
But every uh, project team needs a leader, uh, needs a lead, needs a quarterback to call everybody into the huddle. And I just want to personally thank you, Don. And with your credibility and love of transit and transportation in this community, your credibility um, precedes you and speaks volumes um, with this report. Just a few questions quickly, Mr. Deputy Mayor, if I might. Don, how much have we spent up to this very moment on this study to help get this report before us today? Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, to Don. All in. My all understanding was is in the nine to 10 million range, but correct me if I'm wrong. All inclusive, I think by the end of 2012, when the numbers are in, it'll be a little under 9.1 million. Oh, 9.1 million. How much of that was from the municipality, Mr. Deputy Mayor, through you to Don, roughly? About 5.1 million. Have we asked Metrolinx to absorb some or all of that 5.1 million, Mr. Deputy oh, we Mayor? we did. In fact, I missed that. I skipped over to my slide. We did. It was council direction for us to ask Metrolinx uh, for at least uh, co-funding, if not the total funding, on the 5.1 million. We were directed to ask Metrolinx for uh, funding for the 2012 work plan, uh, either full funding or co-funding for 650000 and funding support to buy articulated buses in 2013. And we did that. We did all that in a letter to Metrolinx back in April. Uh, we subsequently met, uh, our team met with their team, and as much as they were uh, receptive, they said their 2013 budget had already been cast and they wouldn't be able to flow any money to us in 2013. They would have to be consider given consideration under a future budget essentially saying no, uh, that they weren't going to go back and revisit the, uh, the 5.1 million that the city had invested. So the answer, and I know Mr. Corusel is just taking a plethora of notes today, which I greatly appreciate, Richard. Um, so Don, what you're saying is the 5.1 million that we've absorbed of the 9.1 million, it looks like that will be the municipality's cost. We could ask again, maybe in their 14 budget, some or all of it can be reimbursed. But right now, the 9.1, 5.1 is from the city, Mr. Deputy Mayor. That's correct. Okay. Doesn't hurt, though, to ask again? Doesn't hurt. I'm, I wouldn't hold much optimism, but it doesn't hurt. Okay. All right. Um, secondly, Don, um, this, this report here today, Don, and I, I want to be clear because I want to build on the questions I asked hours ago and what Councillor Collins just asked now. By supporting the recommendation here in 5.1, this doesn't mean that I am absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, supporting an LRT system in Hamilton, regardless of what the cost, the capital cost will be, whether it be 100% or a portion of, whether the portion of, if it comes to that, will come from possible tolls, surcharges, tax increases. I want to be crystal clear, Mr. Deputy Mayor. If I am supportive of your four-part motion here today, well, five-part, A, Roman numerals one and two, and B and C, this doesn't mean that at any cost whatsoever, Tom, you have supported LRT and your vote is for LRT. I want to know if I've got an exit ramp down the road after today, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Through to Don. I'll tell you what I think, and others can correct me if I'm wrong. You're absolutely correct. We are not asking for any financial commitment whatsoever today. You're not um, um, making any commitment whatsoever to LRT or any other form of transportation improvements. Um, so you're making absolutely no commitments today, at least we're not asking you to make any commitments today, other than to complete the next step of this process under the contribution agreement between the city and the province, and that is to send something to the province to allow them to take their undertake their value for money exercise. Okay, Don, I really, I really appreciate that because I want to support this and get it to another phase where we can have uh, an intelligent, informed discussion as to what the overall financial cost might or might not mean. Councilor so, Jackson, I may interrupt. Chris Murray wanted to make a comment here, if that's okay. Yes, Mr. Murray. Sorry to interrupt, uh, through you, Deputy Mayor. Don, just to the Councillor's previous question about the $5.1 I oh. know you, you wrote a letter to the uh, to Metrolinx requesting the funding, and, and just if you could expand a little bit more in terms of did we get anything back in writing from them, or was this something that, as you say, was just discussed as me? So we've never really had a formal written document that came back to us from, say, Bruce or someone like that 
that uh, kind of once and for all says no or yes. That's absolutely correct. Uh, we, what uh, Metrolinx uh, did in response to our submission, our letter, our written submission, is ask for a meeting at the Metrolinx offices. We took a team to Metrolinx, met with their team, went over those three directors of council, and the response we got from Metrolinx at that meeting was uh, there would be no more money uh, forthcoming in 2013 as their budget had already been cast. But through you, the Deputy Mayor, it would probably, I think, be maybe more appropriate to get you know, a response like that in writing that could be then directed to council. So, so uh, Chris, I, I wouldn't give up as well. Could I'm I leave that then with you, or should we add an amendment to this asking for the sum or all of the 5.1 million again, yeah. Mr. Deputy Mayor, through to Chris? Should yeah, we formalize you, that? Yes, yeah, so through you, Deputy Mayor. I, I think that's appropriate. I mean, we're everything should be done in writing, especially when we're talking this kind of money. Would you come back to me, Mr. Deputy Mayor, once I'm done with my questions and all, exhausting all the other speakers' lists for that amendment? Because I know Councillor McCaddy is still going to put Can his I as please, well. Mr. Deputy Mayor, just ask a question for clarification. No? Is You'd asked us to ask for three bundles of money. Uh, one was for the 5.1 million, for 650,000 to operate the program in 2012, no. and for the articulated buses. And now, are you speaking, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, is it just the 5.1 you want us to follow up on or all three requests? I was speaking to the 5.1 myself, okay. Don, okay. as part of the overall study package. Okay. Don has, uh, so um, thank you uh, for clarifying beyond a shadow of a doubt for, to get my support here today, what this uh, recommendation means. Don, if LRT uh, looking forward down the road, however Metrolix responds and you come back here, if LRT is not meant to be, can this mammoth document be used for an upgraded rapid transit system, a BRT system in our community? Mr. Deputy Mayor, through to Don. That's absolutely the intent of this document. It's a how-to manual uh, that we can implement depending on the options that we're presented with down the road. So to Councillor Collins's question, even though, and I appreciate your response, Don, you didn't want a divisive debate today about who's for LRT, who's for BRT, but again, this is not going to go to waste if LRT is not meant to be in this community. Absolutely correct. Okay. Don, have studies been done along the B-Line corridor, and you call it the corridor, if an LRT is implemented from other municipalities that have it around the world, uh, property taxes, assessment growth, have we got through Economic Development Department, talking about cross-departmental approach here, have we got a handle that you could put a chart up saying a projection of LRT investment garners you X amount of property taxes and X amount of uh, assessment growth versus your current conventional and what that does. Mr. Deputy Mayor, through to Don. We certainly haven't gone into, into depth on it, but we certainly have included some forecasts in the report and we've drawn on some other uh, reports, uh, one from the Canadian Urban Institute and maybe I'd ask either Carla or Christine or Justin to speak to that because it really precedes my time on this initiative. And, and again, as Carla or Justin or Christine are looking for that, I just don't want a generality of saying, yes, Councillor, we believe that it should and hopefully uh, could. I want, have economic studies been done to show we invest in LRT, communities that have done it, and they've shown this amount of growth, taxes, assessment, versus if they stayed with the status quo. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Christine, please. Uh, yes, uh, Councillor. Um, one of the uh, appendices that was included in the, in the report, it's actually one of the reports that's on a CD. It's Appendix A4 is the Value Uplift and Capture Study, and this was undertaken uh, for the City of Hamilton by the Canadian Urban Institute. On page 69 of that report, there are some figures in a table, and uh, what um, the study concluded was that there would be an LRT value premium or uplift or tax benefit to the city of $29 million, a development uh, projection in terms of tax benefit of 22 million, about $22 million, uh, development uh, program fees and charges of 30 million uh, for a 15 year total, so that's over 15 years, of approximately $81.6 million. Um, Carla's also uh, highlighting here that um, the presentation highlights some of these financial benefits on slide number 41. So we're going to get, um, I'm not trying to be facetious about this, we're, 
you, this study you've, sh uh, you've highlighted, Christine, these studies show that over 15 years of an LRT system in place, there'll be over $80 million worth of taxes, new taxes, new assessment growth, new permit fees, uh, and just for this one corridor from Mac to Eastgate Square that doesn't exist now, both whatever's there now will like just be embellished, enhanced, flourish, just beyond belief. That's what I'm, 80 million plus dollars over 15 years. Is that correct, Christine, what I heard you say? That, that is, is the total. Uh, we should point out that of that 80 million or approximately 81.6 million, 29 million is a um, assessment uh, a value uplift, which would be benefit to the property owners, not necessarily benefit to the city. So it's the approximately 50 million over 15 year period that would be a benefit to the city either through increased taxes or um, other means such as development charges. Uh, just quickly to wrap up, Mr. Deputy Mayor, looking at always, I find studies like this to build a case, I don't blame people, is to look at the upside. Have we looked at the downside? And I could, I, I'm trying to imagine, and I raised it with, uh, if you recall, the consultant that was here about a year and a half ago, and I happened to mention to him from constituents of mine who went to their homeland, Edinburgh, Scotland, and came back last year and told me that after four or five years of trying to build an LRT there, it's an absolute disaster, it's a mess, legally, financially, physically, otherwise. So the worst I fear is disruption to the existing businesses along that corridor. Has that been taken into account, Mr. Deputy Mayor, through you to uh, Christine, either with your projected uh, numbers and or from examples of other municipalities? Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, no, that does not include um, uh, figures or, or, or loss of uh, financial benefit through disruption. Okay, so I'm not gonna belabor this. I, I mentioned this a year and a half ago. Whenever I do something, I try to look as much as possible at the best case scenario and the worst case scenario. I would humbly ask staff and Don yourself even, maybe just when you get a time to do a little web search, just at Edinburgh, Scotland, and if that's the worst case of hundreds of systems across the world, let's find if we ultimately are gonna go there here in Hamilton, let's find out why that has bogged down, and I have um, email evidence of that from constituents of mine who went there last year, and they're just, they're, it, it, they, they say it's just a, a sad fiasco of what's occurred there. So my worry is that any disruption to existing businesses to try to build this. Mr. Deputy Mayor, to summarize, based on everything Don has said here today and with Councillor McCaddy's amendment, and if you allow my amendment as well, I'm satisfied moving forward, knowing that there still are exit ramps down the road, pending with a response we're gonna get back from Metrolinx and the province. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Just kind of a heads up here. Uh, we have a drop dead timeline here for 5.30. We have to be out, school board is coming in at six o'clock. Uh, I'm hoping to keep quorum here. Don needs, we need a resolution from committee here to take to council and we can't put it up because of timelines. Don will be dragging into Don just. Well, because of March break, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, the next time we get back in front of committee is in late March. That takes us into April by time of ratification and leaves us with a pretty short timeline to get this to Metrolinx and time to have some fruitful discussion with them prior to their decision on funding for Hamilton here and make sure we can keep quorum too so we can come up and we still have delegations too so next on the speaker's list is Councillor McCaddy. Thanks uh, Mr. Chair and I guess maybe to begin with I'll, uh, actually I just just wanted to check your your timelines and that so I guess at this point it's hard to tell whether we're gonna be finished in time or because I the questions I have I'm quite interested in the answers but they they don't change the uh, the fundamental uh, recommendation that's before us. So are you suggesting that we're, we're, if we've had those kind of questions, we should probably take them offline uh, and then uh, and just go ahead with the recommendation uh, in, the, in the shorter term? Probably should. I got, uh, I have one, two, I have five more speakers after you, Councilor McCaddy. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so I, I think all my questions are ones that I can ask, uh, ask Don uh, outside of this, so, um, 
just at the appropriate time, you can come back to me uh, for that uh, amendment. Uh, okay. Yeah, thanks. All right, Councilor McCaddy. Uh, Councilor Ferguson. Yeah, I just have a few brief questions, too, as we move it along. And first of all, Don, we've been waiting a long time for this 30 percent design, so we can put a price to it, so we can set it off the province to see what the reaction is going to be to uh, 100 percent capital funding. Uh, easy question on the start. There's been a lot of media attention that you're going to be proposing today a, a buses only lane on King between Mary and Dundurn. I don't see it up there. I'm sorry, I missed your question. Uh, media report saying you're going to be recommending a buses only lane on King Street between Mary and Dundurn, but I don't see it in the recommendation there today. Uh, it's not necessary. It's already been adopted by committee. Um, so what we need to do is bring back the plan and get the plan uh, for implementation approved by a committee and council. It's, it's fully funded under one of the Metrolinx Quick Wins projects. And it's already been approved as a goal for council, presuming that we can get uh, the two councillors and uh, committee and council to approve our, our final plan for implementation. Okay, because that, that approval, I don't think went as far as Mary, but it, uh, that was a long time ago. And we, we still got the, the Jason Farr hoarding at King and, and, and that, S. That's, and, that's correct. Uh, yeah. so that reduce you down to one lane then if you do that. We'll be bringing a detailed recommendation back to Public Works Committee, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and you'll have an opportunity to shorten, lengthen, and ask all your questions at that meeting before before we move to implementation, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. That'll be coming back in a future Public Works Committee. It'll be coming back to Public Works Committee, yes. The, the uh, next question is, uh, about five years ago, uh, a couple of members of council and some senior staff went on a road trip, and I was pushed to go as a somewhat of a skeptic along lane closures like Councillor Collins and others are talking about. And so we went to Charlotte, Port, Char uh, Charlotte, Portland, and Calgary. And the thing that tweaked my interest the most was that the average bus trip was very similar to yours in the low $2 to $230, maybe $240 for uh, an average cost of a trip on a bus. And uh, it was the same at all three cities we visited. And what also got my attention was that the cost of LRT operating it was about 25 cents, almost 90% reduction. And when I questioned it at all three municipalities, the answer I was given was the most expensive part of running a transit system is the guy in the driver's seat. And I think you would acknowledge that too. And instead of moving 35 people, they're moving 160 people with one train. Also, the fuel is electricity, not diesel, which is a significantly lower cost. And the um, insurance is significantly less, too, which is a major cost because they're not moving in and out of traffic on a dedicated rail line, so therefore the insurance risk is a lot lower. But in your recommendation today, you're asking for $3.5 million more to operate an LRT when I saw on the road trip a 90% reduction in operating costs, and that puzzles me. Well, that's... That dotted line on that graph was specifically for you, uh, Councillor Ferguson, and, and it was to answer the question you gave us direction to get answer on uh, back uh, when we reported uh, uh, last year. And uh, if we could go back to that chart. Yeah, please you, go back to it, would you? Um, two button on here, but I don't know where it is. That's slide 54. Oh, this is the one. So um, to answer your question then, uh, the, day, the day one low, we're at about 4 million rides. And that's just people coming off the buses onto the trains. The day one high, if certain stuff happens, if we get the 8% take up and there's a few assumptions built in, we're at about uh, double that in terms of ridership. To, uh, so we need a little bit more than double the ridership. So the, campaign, the trains have the capacity for that ridership. So we need to fill the trains. And where, we, where that dotted line is is the... The trains are filled to capacity. The trains have higher capacity, require fewer operators. Don't require, they require fewer operators with more capacity. So at that dotted line there is, is the ridership that we need to generate a profit that you heard about when we talked to the folks in Calgary. And so our ridership would have to increase, uh, what is it, about two and a half times it looks like? 
So, and that. And, and I didn't understand that slide, if it was for me. I didn't understand the vertical axis. That's not a cost per trip then. Three is about three dollars. That's a, uh, what they call the TK, uh, TRK index. And it's, it puts us on the same playing field uh, or, or same terminology and as other municipalities. Justin will explain what TK, explain TRK that to index us in English, means. What that means. You, Mr. Deputy Mayor, the TRK index is essentially the daily ridership divided by the length of the, the system divided by a thousand. So it's an efficiency per length of track is really what it is, a ridership efficiency or effectiveness per length of track. Very simple terms. Does it cost you somewhere, according to your report on page 28, it costs dollars per passenger now. And, and LRT is going to be in the 25 to 30 cent range now because my information is six years old. What's the cost per passenger per trip? Mr. Deputy Mayor, it depends on how much ridership we have, um, but I know Calgary, they operate coupled trains, so we're, we're limited by the length of the vehicle. So our, our block length in downtown um, is about 40 meters, so we can't have a vehicle longer than 40 meters because it would be crossing through the intersection. Um, but in Calgary, they have a lot of 40 meter long coupled trains that operate together, so you have one driver with, with an 80 meter long vehicle. Um, so that's a function of the, the cost per passenger for different systems. Okay, uh, how much was that? And just while they're doing that, Don, do you agree that when we went on that road show, it was about $2.30 to take a bus at an average cost, half of it subsidized by the fare box? Yes. yes sir. And, and LRT was 25 to $0.30? Cents? That's what they told us, yes. And, and okay, as and Justin says, if you can get into double cars and fill the cars, and so you're using more capacity and fewer operators, there is a point when those cars are reach a certain capacity that you're actually operating at a profit. And Justin, I think, is going to elaborate on that. Mr. Deputy Mayor, the, at the break-even line, we'd be, it would be costing nothing, so the revenue would equal the cost to operate. And then at the $18.9 million, we'd be making $0.75 cents per passenger. But we'd have to get from a daily ridership today of about 4 million rides to, what is that, Justin, about 11 or 12 million rides? About 12, but, so about triple the ridership. So you put the same, triple the ridership, and take it all off buses and put it on to longer trains with higher capacity. So we'd have to triple our ridership to operate LRT at a profit. Nope. I'm still puzzled then before I, I put in the motion, because I agree with Councilor McCaddy, we got to zero in on the motion. If it costs 240 to take a person on a bus and 30 cents to take a person on LRT, why do you want $3.5 million more to operate? It's, it's, it, it could be, it could be zero, quite frankly. if. An average bus is about $750,000 a year that runs 18 hours a day, seven days a week. So we could potentially 20 buses off the road. We picked the number 18 because it seemed like the most logical number when we counted up the uh, eliminating all the B-line buses and the transference. So it, it could be higher, it could be lower. I guess my point is, is that that uh, $3 million or 3.9, whatever that number is, I can't recall, um, specifically, um, on a hundred million dollar budget in 2011, it's not a significant factor in a decision going forward. What it comes down to is, is there a billion dollars in capital available to allow us to build this system so that one day when we generate double or triple the ridership we have now, that system will run, in fact, at a profit. So it's it could be, it quite frankly could be zero. You don't have to take a couple more buses off the road. What it all hinges on is the ridership materializing uh, from about double to triple what we have right now. They, okay, and, and, and I, I don't think anybody would deny the fact that ridership's gonna go up as we saw in Portland. I mean, there was men with their briefcases, there was ladies in evening gown, there was everybody rides a darn thing. And, and so you're, you're gonna have the uplift. But for me to sit there today and say, I support a half a percent tax increase, simplifying things, to increase operating costs when what I saw and heard was it's a 90% reduction in operating costs. I have trouble with that part B, that if you want us to agree now to well, that's that's, 3.5 million more in operating costs. That's the strategy going forward, that we have to find out what the options are in terms of, and the alternatives are in terms of having that discussion on the strategy going forward. Edmonton LRT was a good case. 
Edmonton LRT stagnated for a very long period of time until they um, serve, increased their level of service out to the university. So it comes back to this question of is do you build LRT now and essentially running at a, at a deficit, a very significant deficit, build the public transit system over time and the more the public transit system builds, the case for LRT will pass the case for bus and at about 12 million, 12, 12 million rides, it will not only have passed the cost of public transit, it will actually be running at a profit. So you've got a couple of choices and unfortunately that's not a unilateral choice right now and that's what we're trying to do is get to the province to say, if we, if, what he wants to do, grow the transportation program now and build the ridership from 4 million to 12 million or 4 million to 9 million and build it to a point where we're congested like the city of Ottawa and the buses are bumper to bumper, in which case our business case for LRT only continues to improve or do we want to build the LRT now and then let the uh, ridership catch up over time as it did in Edmonton. The problem is, is we're not in care and control of that decision. And what, that's the, the exact strategy that we have to try to flush out of the province is that what's gonna come first, the chicken or the egg? And, uh, and we don't have unilateral control over that right now. Two more points, I think. First of all, I don't wanna see some of my council colleagues scared off of this because <laughs> it's wrong information. You're showing it costs more to run an LRT system when evidence around North America shows it costs 90% less. And, and it worries me that we've got that in here. And, and the, the second part, even your own document on page 29 says that the cost goes down when you blend all the buses and LRT together. You're forecasting it'll go down 75 cents per truck. Well, but you're asking for more money. And, and I'm not sure whether you're just trying to be super conservative or whether uh, it's... Well, I am ultra conservative, I guess from a, a long range for strategic uh, perspective, what we're trying to say is the operating cost for LRT day one because of the ridership in that corridor would be very close to a wash. The whole issue here is the capital and is there a hundred cent dollars available from the province to allow us to achieve that? If there is, the municipality can go into this from a very low risk perspective. I, what we're saying is we could, we could probably bring the operating budget in at zero by taking enough buses off the road. We'd have the train. The issue then becomes the capital. So if the yeah, capital is 100%. You're, not, you're getting a full yeah, support for 100%. The operating is zero. Then, then we have a very, very viable project here. So I don't, A1, the 3.5 million operating is not necessary today. Not necessary. It could be zero. Put it in context of a $100 million budget. It's not a lot of money. You take two more buses off the road, three more buses off the road, which is entirely possible, you're, you're essentially at cost neutral from an operating budget perspective. Once you lose a with respect today, to transit, advancing this forward because maybe yeah. there's some wrong. That's now that's aside from the other 8.7 million, but from a public, from taking the buses off the road to fund the operating cost of the LRT on an apples to apples basis uh, within the, the, the size of the, of the public transit budget now or where it will be in five years, whether it's three million, we could actually end up with less than zero. It's just not a big number in the overall context one way or the other. That's the only message we were trying to communicate. And speaking of big numbers, go ahead one slide to 54. See the 3 point, oh, you had it. You see the 3.5 million net levy impact which is what I said, what do you need that for? It was a more efficient system. But you also got 8.7 million in there for parking enforcement, which is a profit center for us. We make money on parking enforcement, typically. I mean, Marty uh, turns in a pretty big check every year from, from parking revenues. And then snow removal, we already, I mean, what I saw in Calgary, there's the blades on the front of the trains, which clean the track. And then we always clean the streets and we already pick it up with snow wars after major storms. So why do you need an extra 8.7 million dollars? Can someone please provide some background? on? The 8.7 million? Well, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we had consulted with um, a bunch of public works staff to find out um, the current level of service along the corridor and what would be needed um, with an LRT corridor there. So that's full removal of the snow within the corridor, clearing the sidewalks throughout the corridor because it's a more pedestrian friendly corridor, um, additional litter cleaning, um, uh, parking enforcement throughout there as well. Um, but don't we already clean the sidewalks, SOS? Do we all already not clear the streets? Do we already not take snow boards and pick the windrows up, put it on trucks on this corridor? What, it, what extra do you need for $8.7 million per year for snow removal? Uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Chair, this is an enhanced level of service along the corridor, so this is above and beyond what already happens within that corridor. So again, that, that number could fluctuate, and in the same way the capital could fluctuate, 
Um, it, it could be higher, it could be lower. It, it's, it's just a number to give us some order of magnitude and uh, going forward, and it is conservative. I don't get it. Uh, I don't understand that part. We're already doing all that stuff. The, and the opportunity to me to get some. The potential exists, and I'll stick my neck out here a little bit because I'm, but the potential exists, quite frankly, to pull enough buses off the road uh, to put, for it potentially to be a wash. Um, and I, I might be getting out there a little bit, but uh, again, when with 200 and uh, what, what 200 buses in the barns there now, and, and we'll be well above that uh, when LRT gets here, it's all we're trying to say order of magnitude, operating budget, with what we know in 2011 would not be um, a showstopper. Okay, it, and, and just in summary, then, um, I think. A lot of my council colleagues would find this a lot more palatable that 12.2 million is, isn't there. I don't understand why it is. It would certainly be a lot more palatable for people of Ancaster who aren't going to get a stitch of advantage out of this if they know that 12.2 million there. And I don't know why you need it. it I guess more explaining to do in that. But uh, once again, we can take that off. Thank you, Councilor Ferguson. Councilor Farr. Uh, very briefly, I. I uh I made a lot of notes over the weekend, and uh, again, great report, and Don, uh, uh, good answers to uh, some great questions thus far. Um, I just want to just maybe sum it up. Uh, this full report is indicated in the, in the notes um, right off the get-go. We're talking about three different things, and, and inevitably they add up to an investment in this community, uh, an investment in our people, an investment in our infrastructure, an investment in our economic growth, and that's growing the use of the public transportation, creating supportive land uses in communities, and developing a seamless multimodal transportation system. And if we were to move forward, we're, we're well ahead. Uh, we're not uh, ad hocing. Uh, we're not uh, um, addressing situations as they arise. We're getting way ahead of uh, where we've been in the past, and, um, and it's all based on what we see here and the expertise of yourself and many others through you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor. That's what this well, is, that's, this is, is a, today. It's a concept document. It's, it's, a, it's a road plan or a game plan or a how-to manual, uh, depending on feedback we get, uh, presumably as a result of this document being forwarded to the province. And because we don't know the parameters right now, there, there, there's, this is really all we can do for now until we find out from the province what, uh, uh, what more explicitly what the rules of the game are. Through all of this work, and I heard you say it, and it's peppered throughout, LRT is the best return in terms of what we're talking about, A-line, B-line. Uh, um, best certainly, return certainly. on the investment. When, when all the assumptions that we talked about here all materialize, absolutely L LRT would be the best investment. So if everything materialized, all the, all the forecasts out to 2031, uh, then LRT would be the best investment. But there's a long road to hoe to get there. We I say we're, at the very least, we're talking doubling or tripling the transit ridership. We're talking about job uh, den density improvement in the, in the corridor. We're talking about uh, a lot more uh, um, uh, commercial improvement in the corridor. So a lot of stuff has to happen. Uh, but again, uh, it, 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 at the end of the day, too, it's, it's, is this a transportation initiative or is it a city building initiative or is it some uh, hybrid of the two? And, uh, and, and, and how, how is it as an investment uh, in the future of the city of Hamilton? Uh, what return is it going to be pay relative to, to uh, other investments in the city? Um, and, and, and that's kind of all this document it is, is a catalyst or an instigator to get us to that ne next level of discussion. We have to get our, our funding partners at the table and, and find out some specifics and, and, then, and then come back to committee. I like, I like the hybrid of the two, and I think most of us feel the same way with respect to that. And so just to reiterate, too, today, not asking for a dime. Not, you're not asking for any financial commitment moving forward, and then we'll hear what we have to hear in May for Metrolinx. That's correct, and I hopefully we'll get some signals. Hopefully the door will be open for some discussion, and we'll have some signals in advance of May what they're open to. What we're really trying to do is find out from the province whether or not 
Uh, they have flexibility in their original position, whether their original position is still firm or whether it's changed, uh, whether there's room for negotiation. I think we have a sense that uh, they have an idea of what's good for Hamilton. We have an idea of what's good for Hamilton. They're not identical positions, and we want to find out whether or not there's some flexibility in terms of their funding commitment to uh, coming up with what's best for both the province and the city of Hamilton, so we have a win-win situation. Thanks, Don, and thanks to all of the staff who worked on this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Farr. Councillor Whitehead. I um, like having the best information before us. I think you've done a pretty thorough job. I just be concerned on, on uh, expectations, and I, I go through the uh, economic uh, development pieces. I know that you're not always comparing apples to apples when you look at what's transpired other communities because of fragmented land ownership, uh, the type of developments already along some of the corridors and so forth. So again, when I take a look at this particular report, uh, you, said, you, know, you say you like doing things conservative. When I look at that particular, um, um, those particular estimates, I don't find them conservative at all. Well, I, th I think that you make a good point. I think those are 2031 estimates, and that's what I, I tried to say in the beginning is let's make as few, no assumptions at, at all, if at all possible, as our baseline. The, the numbers that you're talking about are out in 2031, and a lot of stuff has to happen for those to materialize. So I guess it's a question of let's start with a baseline that we can all agree on, and then each individual decide whether or not they think those assumptions out in 2031 are actually going to materialize or not. Because as you move further out in years, your, your degree of, of, uh, of certainty um, actually uh, diminishes. And so that's what we're trying to say is you, you each individually when you, and if you come to a point where you have to make a decision on funding this project, you're gonna have to say, okay, I believe that what's forecast for 2031 is actually gonna happen or I don't believe it's going to happen. That something in between is going to happen. So what we really wanna do is start you off with a baseline where everyone can essentially agree is, and, and hopefully uh, we'll convince Councillor Ferguson that the starting point in 2011 is a certain amount of money, essentially operating budget neutral, somewhere in the area of $800 million in capital. And as we move out into the future, the return on investment is entirely based on transit ridership and whether that transit ridership materializes. And that transit ridership will materialize as a result of many, many initiatives we could take over the next several years, the most important being increasing the transit service levels. Others would be continu continual development in the, in the core here, the university growing in size, Columbia College growing in size, more infilling, more density, more jobs. So all of what you're speaking about is if everything comes together according to plan, according to our long-range planning documents in 2031. The reality is probably somewhere in between, quite frankly. It, um, I, or, potentially. I was just trying to Google uh, the Edmonton, Edinburgh experience. Have you done some research on that? None whatsoever, but I'm going to make a personal commitment to Councillor Jackson and the rest of the committee to do some research on that. Because it seems to me, just from uh, quickly looking at what I have here, uh, there's some, there's been some benefits, but there's been more negatives than, than benefits, according to what's on the uh, on these reports. So, I would suggest that we'd be interested to see what that experience and what the downside is. Actually, we have uh, our budget is approved for 2013. Uh, we have one and a half staff members working on it. There is going to be a gap period between whenever council approves this and sends it off to the province, and we can use that time. Uh, to do the kind of research that you're asking of us, Mr. Deputy Mayor. The other question I have is, um, we talk about pilot programs. Um, I, I'm just concerned how we in introduce pilot programs because we can introduce pilot programs, in fact, have impact, much larger impact on uh, other wards than it has in the ward that's actually delivering the pilot. Well, um, so I guess what, what is the, 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 uh, the dynamic in regards to the discussion introducing a pilot that can impact uh, wards east and west of where that pile is taking place significantly without engagement and involvement of those areas? Well, one of my strongest beliefs in terms of achieving high order transit is dedicated lane for the buses. And so we've picked a corridor with very, very high transit ridership in it. Uh, we've found two willing uh, ward councillors. The changes that we would be making in that quarter would be largely superficial, like line painting and jersey barriers and those kinds of things. It's a decision that could be fairly quickly undone. 
in terms of restoring everything back to its original condition. So we, in as much as it would be a fairly a significant investment, all of that investment will come from Metrolinx and all of it can be undone uh, fairly quickly because uh, none of it is, is really radical uh, reconstruction. Well, the only reason I ask, because if I want to, I thought first, I said, what a wonderful idea. I'd love to see a, a designated lane uh, get some of the empty buses off of West Fifth, for example, and have a dedicated lane on, uh, on uh, Upper James. But I got to think that uh, uh, I can't, I'm not empowered to make that unilateral decision. You would have to cons look at strategy, but you'd have to consult with the others that would be impacted by it. And again, my point is, I'm not, I don't have an issue with the pilot. I'm just wondering what is the mechanism to initiate a pilot without uh, talking to those that may be impacted by the implementation of such a pilot? Well, the, uh, frankly, if we had a do-over and we had the time, uh, we would do a citywide uh, evaluation. And we did do an evaluation in the A-line corridor and the B-line corridor block by block because that's what Metrolinx, that's where Metrolinx said the money had to be spent. So Metrolinx did, in this case, give us direction. It's got to be the A-line or it's got to be the B-line for us to support transit priority measures. And so we did a block-by-block -block assessment of the A-line and the same thing as the B-line, and we picked out a segment that we said had the highest opportunity for success, had uh, political champions, uh, something hopefully that, that, that if we can turn into a success, uh, we can expand on. And that doesn't mean just expanding at either end. We could expand it up perhaps somewhere on top of James. So it, ha it, it, it met the most criteria for likelihood for success, but was it a comprehensive planning exercise? Absolutely not. The, the confinement was to the A-line and the B-line. We did some analysis on the A-line and the B-line. We're doing it with a bit of a gun to our head because it, the money has to be spent in 2013. So given, those, given that those restrictions, this was what we felt we could get done in the timelines allocated to us. Okay. And, uh... I appreciate it. I just want to understand the, the mechanism and how you arrive at a, a, a decision without a, a comprehensive strategy around it. And I don't hear We cut it. some corners, there's no doubt about it. And it was a question of getting it done, fast tracking it, and uh, so that we could complete the project uh, and stay in accordance with the agreement between the city of Metrolinx to have the money substantially expended in 2013. Uh, but by all means, we fast track this and, and, and uh, um, cut some corners is not a positive way to say it, but, but, but it's, it's a fast track to implementation. Uh, I guess my last question is, have we thought about uh, the possibility of designating one of the accesses as just a public transit corridor period? I would love that, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I'd like to pursue that. Uh, we'd like to pursue that uh, with Councillor Whitehead on another day. I'd love to. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Whitehead. Councillor Marula. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And, and Don, I think um, for the most part, what, what we're hearing today is uh, universal support for the concept itself. I think really when it comes down to it is firstly, the first obstacle is the capital aspect. So that, that 800 to $1 billion uh, price tag. But I think when you look at what's before us, and I'm, I'm glad that Councillor White had mentioned uh, a couple of the failures that are out there as examples, because there are so many successes. And I think you've touched upon two issues that are really vital in that not all LRTs are made equal, that primarily you're looking at one, at a plan here that's an integrated public transportation or part of the integrated public transportation system, which is a key variable. And also um, the fact that you're looking at a, a line that the demand already exists. And I think to you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, if you look at those cities that have pursued this and failed, those two issues uh, were the missing link to their failure. Would you not agree to you, Mr. Deputy Mayor? Um, I, I, I wish I could say I had more experience on LRT. I don't have a lot of experience in LRT. I've spent my last year or so learning about it. Uh, I, I, I'm quite convinced that where Hamilton has a leg up on all the other municipalities is, has the uh, existing ridership in the corridor and we're not uh, developing a vacant corridor and waiting for 15 or 20 years for the revenue to catch up. The, uh, on the flip side of that is exactly what Councillor Collins says, you've got some pretty huge challenges to overcome uh, to achieve a successful implementation. I, I don't know, does that answer your question? Well, well basically answer. I think the two variables are very important in that um, you've designed this or this design is part of an integrated public transportation system. It's not <laughs> in isolation to on its own. So that's correct. That's a key component. The second component is the fact that 
there's already a demand for public transit in that line, which this too, this line, B line particularly, meets that criteria. And if you look at, from what I've um, been able to obtain information-wise, is that those are the two missing characteristics that have led to failures as a... As a oh, I think, yes, I think that that's if, uh, one of the examples of a failure, and I don't want to point fingers at another municipality, but certainly that's how Buffalo was cited for not having that's, uh, its parking policies Buffalo, and its, its TOD policies, not having done the, the planning work and, and really uh, adopted a mentality, if you build it, they will come. And uh, rather than building in changes in policy, building in uh, building in the pl proper planning, building having the proper policies in place, one of the most significant policies, for example, we'd have to look at is our parking policy. Our, our parking policy would have to change very, very dramatically uh, as a critical ingredient to the success of LRT. And, and some of that was bypassed in other municipalities when the money was flowing in the U.S. And uh, so, as you say, proper planning prevents poor Results? Execution, oh, <laughs> for lack of yeah. a... But to, I, and so, so I think my point to all of this is that not all LRTs are created equal, and those two variables that have contributed to the failures will, pr will actually contribute to our success here in Hamilton. Uh, and saying that through you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor, with respect to our public transit subsidy at present, we're, we're at about, what, 50 percent? We're hovering around 50 I think our 2013 budget is around 48 yeah. percent. And when, we, and when we look at, when we look at the, uh, our roads budget line that's in the tens of millions of dollars um, with no tolling in the city, and nor would I ever support any tolls in the city. I know a lot of people were trying to do that. But uh, a lot of people don't look at the budgetary aspect of public transit. And you know that I and uh, I believe you concurred at the time feel that public transit should be on a general levy as opposed to a, a fee for service in the sense that it really is a double taxation. Uh, so when you look at it in isolation and say public transit is a cost as opposed to an investment, then you look at what we spend on infrastructure, it really is an unfair comparison. So when you look at it globally, uh, what we subsidize in roads uh, for vehicular traffic versus what we do for public transit, and yet public transit from an environmental perspective, from a social perspective, provides added, added value to this community. And that's something that I think needs to be incorporated in the discussions. So on that point, when you look at the environmental public health issues of environmental public health and social benefits, could you just elaborate on, on those benefits and how we as a community and a, and a city benefit as a direct result of that, of people engaging in public transportation? Um, can I take a stab at an answer? It's not going to be, but it was really went to the first part of your comment. The old version would be fine. If I'm allowed to put my, my transit hat on for the moment and forget about the corporate responsibilities uh, within the total budget, I'm, I'm hypersensitive to, uh, for example, as a transit manager, that transit users often, in my view, pay twice. And Councilor Collins has raised that in past budgets where they pay either through their rent or their taxes and then they pay again when they get on the bus, when many of the other municipal services are 100% funded from the levy. And then if you put a finer slice on it, when you get around to talking about uh, revenues in transit and, and what, what should fare increases be used for, in many cases historically, the, the transit fare increase has been used to offset the base levy, which has been a, it's been difficult for me to accept given that waste collection and, and, and snow removal are distributed across the entire levy. I think the other thing too, if you even put a finer point on it, is, is perhaps fuel. Uh, we have absolutely no, uh, no uh, control over the cost of fuel. And should fuel be considered a citywide levy or should, it, should the transit user pay for the transit portion of the fuel and, and the rest of the city pay for the rest of the fuel? So setting aside my corporate responsibilities for a moment, I, 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 you know, that's, that's been one of my hypersensitivities in the last is that what is a transit fare increase used for? Is it used to hit a bottom line levy? Is it used to pay, does the transit user have to pay for the fuel where for all the rest of the fuel con consumed in the city is paid for out of the general tax base? So I, I, I answered the first part of your statement. I don't know that I answered the last Absolutely. part of your statement. Absolutely. I think the, the point remains it's an, an equity that exists presently with a 
with a fee uh, for service that doesn't exist anywhere else in the corporation. And to me, that's unfair. And in saying that, it needs to be addressed and incorporated to discussions when we look at public transportation as a subsidy or as a cost as opposed to an investment. Um, now, with respect to, to you, um, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'm not sure if we, do we have public health still here? I believe we do, right? Yes, we do. Uh, so, and, and in their endorsement of LRT earlier, uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, it was, it was emphasized the, the, from a public health perspective, the endorsement of LRT. Similar to uh, their, their involvement, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, of the casino issue, and how they, they made a recommendation saying they don't support it because proximity matters, but then we started listening to um, uh, taxi drivers and, and uh, we started looking at caterers and, and, and uh, other people rather than the experts. It's like going to your doctor and seeking medical advice and then, uh, and then looking at looking at the grocery store attendant uh, to to actually circumvent what the doctor said. So, in essence, um, in, in the public health perspective, to you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, could we just elaborate on the obesity issues and all other public health aspects as it pertains to the importance of in implementing LRT? Dr. Tran is coming down. <coughs> just quickly, yeah, I just want to incorporate it. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, from a public health perspective, there are a number of health benefits as I uh, discussed today. So from a public health point of view, we're supportive of uh, not only LRT, but also uh, many other the initiatives or menu options that Don has provided through the transportation master plan. I'm more than happy to comment specifically on any of the health issues as well. Uh, just the endorsement itself, I think, is va very valid and important. But what, in, to, in a nutshell, what we're looking at is a decision that, not only from a financial perspective, but a social perspective, a, a public health perspective, even a, even um, from a city building perspective, all of these angles are being met, and the objectives and purpose are all before us. And I think the focus should be on why we need to do it as opposed to why we can't do it. And sometimes we spend too much time talking about why we can't do something. And I just wanted to emphasize that component and thank Dahl, uh, Don uh, Hall for his involvement and his very thorough uh, presentation. Thanks very much. Thank you, Councilor Marula. Councilor Pearson, please. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and um, certainly uh, support moving forward. I think it's a great initiative, and uh, whatever comes out of it, be it LRT, BRT, we can move the city forward. The only question I had, Don, and, and I just want to touch on, you mentioned about Edmonton's transit system, and ironically I was in uh, the room, the other room there just getting a coffee, and in the municipal world it has a story about uh, Edmonton. They did have some problems with their transit. In 2010 they had a drop of about 10% in their ridership, and they actually brought in incentive programs. So I thought that was very interesting, being uh, reward miles. So um, that it is to see, to see what different... Um, initiatives communities can take in order to increase ridership. So there are opportunities there. But my question was more on the lines of the request to Metrolinx for the um, $5.1 million, the $9.1 million on the study, and um, being told that their budget has already been set for 2013. Do we know when they set their budget? Do they let us know that? Uh, no, other than I think the municipal budget runs uh April 1 to April 1, but no, they didn't specifically eat into that. So that just for clarification, the total amount spent on the file today is going to be a little bit under 9.1 million, of which Metrolinx has already funded 3 million. We have 3 million in hand. So the 5.1 million that we're, be, we're being directed to go back and ask them again in writing to confirm uh, whether they'll uh, reimburse some or all of that commitment to the city. And I understand Councillor Jackson may be putting that motion forward, and I support certainly support that, and I'll second it if need be. Um, but that we that we certainly uh, not only uh, incorporate the request for that, but also the six hundred fifty thousand for the two thousand twelve operations. Well, uh, the six hundred fifty thousand for two hundred two thousand twelve would be included in the nine point one million. Okay, and how about the um, and the articulated? Buses? No, that would be over and above. So I include that also, and. Um, uh, and that we also find out what their timelines are for budgets because going forward we should know in our minds that way when we're putting forward requests we have an idea of where where they're at and their deliberations because we can end up being years out on on our process if we're not aware of where they are set uh, in in their budget um, final dates so at appropriate time I'll leave that with Councillor Jackson if he wants to add that the other question I want to ask uh, Don is you mentioned about 
you know, we're going to have savings because we get LRT or whatever we do, removing 18 buses off the roads. Would we not be looking at these 18 buses maybe being able to pick up the, um, the A lines in the other areas? Oh, absolutely. Those buses could be redeployed. Correct. But we didn't want to include them into the LRT business case because they'd skew the business case. Got that it. would be a council decision at that time whether to redeploy them or whether to take them out of service. But we still factor that it is a savings as far as the LRT process right now, but we still have that opportunity. You'll have a decision. There would be a decision point there either to redeploy them or eliminate them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Pearson. Councillor Duvall. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And Don, thank you very much for standing here all day. Um, you even had a break yet to eat. You must be starving, but uh, I really appreciate it. Um, just a couple questions. Um, going forward, I mean, I, I, I certainly support uh, the recommendation going forward, and I understand that our next step now is to take it forward to Metro Lakes. This uh, report and uh, then we make the request or they'll analyze it and then find out how much actual money we will be receiving yeah I, I think we need to have the city manager weigh in on this but somehow we presumably wouldn't just send the report off to them then sit and wait until May is yes, there's got to be some kind of a mechanism to open up the dialogue and whether it's a government relations committee or task force but we haven't really talked that through yet but uh, I don't know whether Chris might want to comment on that uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, uh, yeah, the first step is to get, obviously, committee here to endorse the report and council to approve it, and then I'll follow up with Bruce and uh, recommending that our respective staffs get together to make sure if there's any matters that need clarification in the report that we answer their questions before they make any decisions. So uh, I'll be proposing uh, kind of a staff-on-staff -staff, uh, working uh, arrangement so that, um, you know, there's, uh, uh, there's no surprises at the end of the day. Okay, and Don, the, the cost of to have the alders reports, and I know we, we asked for a 5.1 million and the request is still gonna be made forward, but is there any more costs going forward at this particular time that we have not budgeted for? No, absolutely not. We were probably budget favorable uh, because we came in under budget on the 650,000 allocated for 2012 because we were relieved of the requirement to do the MSF uh, study. And as well, we council approved a 2012 budget for two and a half staff, and we're presently at one and a half staff. So we're favorable on 2012, and we're favorable going into 2013. Okay, so then thanks, Don. I, um, I really uh, still support this. I did support it when I, when I heard about it the first time, when I heard that you know, it was gonna be 100% funded. Um, as you know, we've heard rumors, and, and I've heard a lot of, uh, uh, councillors around this table have concerns because where they live they might be reluctant to um, happen to justify uh, any kind of an increase but at the same time I must say that it's it's called city building um, we got to start somewhere this is the, the seed what we put in if you look at Toronto's transportation system they started with one subway they just didn't do them all at one time so the cost you know is enormous so it is about city building but and also it's going to be about affordability um, and we all have to, we all know that. If, if we're not anywhere near those numbers and, and it's just too high, um, even though the people will want it, I'm not even sure we've been justified there's a need for it at this particular time with the lower ridership. But uh, all those um, issues have to be brought, come in. So I'd be looking, I am looking very interested, looking forward to see what the actual cost is going to be. But uh, continue on the great work. Thank you. Thank you. I have no further speakers on my list at this point in time. So, and we still got two delegations that got to come forward to speak on this. So I'll just get a motion. I don't think there's any other speakers. See none. Okay, <laughs> moved by, move by Councillor Ferguson, second by Councillor Johnson. Receive your presentation, Don. Thank you very much for standing in there and taking on the questions. Uh, Councillor, um, just in logistics, is it to receive the presentation or to approve the presentation for submission to the province with the amendments? Okay, thank you. We have uh, several thank delegations you. and then we'll thank you. work on that. So Councillor Collins. Mr. Chairman, just before Don leaves the podium, as you recall, m my first question today was uh, some concern over the $800 million reference. And I think Don suggested we might, or there was an opportunity to change that wording to 100% capital funding. So if I could ask Don, while the presentations are going on, if maybe staff could huddle to um, 
to talk about some wording that may assist to ensure that we're all on the same page? Absolutely. I took it that council seems to be, committee seems to be unified on removing reference to 800 million, putting in 100% capital, that uh, we're being directed to uh, ask again and get a formal written response with respect to the ask for the uh, 5.1 million, and we're being asked to integrate the uh, MOH um, um, uh, medical officers, officer health uh, support into the into the submission. So I get if you could come back to me at the appropriate time with the other amendments, I'd be happy to put that. Okay, have Councillor Ferguson. Yeah, I just want to be careful that we don't drop the 500 million because the reason we spent all this money was to get a 30% design. So to answer the province's question, what's the cost? And so we got to make sure we don't drop the reference to the $800 million because that's the $64,000 question. That's what they've always been asking. Well, it's in the report. It's in the document. I think the what the direction we're getting today is council's position remains unchanged at this time, that uh, the ask is for 100% uh, capital. And, in 2011, and in whatever cost dollars, 800 million. Yeah. That's the number I heard today. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Ferguson. Councillor Whitehead. Yeah, I just and I don't know. Uh, we we have the the other motion on the public uh, the, uh, the public health component. Uh, I would only say that uh, on the casino one, that was more piling on uh, in regards to the MOJ, uh, the public health position and, and just supporting that position, but it didn't really bring anything new to the table in regards to their own experiences. I would only ask that uh, if we're going to go to uh, the health uh, sector, be uh, more um, valuable to us if they uh, uh, provide their own experiences as it pertains to some of these uh, health uh, impacts and, 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 and issues and concerns so that it adds value to the overall uh, dialogue and, and, and quite frankly, the, uh, the point we're trying to make to the province of Ontario. In, in, in as much as we uh, don't want to pit ourselves against our fellow municipalities, we all need to work together. Um, uh, on the other hand, our case is based on different merit than the other municipalities and um, almost predominantly on congestion. I think what we're asking for council's uh, support and direction on is to build our case based on the social, environmental, economical, and, and, and public health initiatives. And perhaps one additional item, is, as Chris mentioned, is that we are a community of need and, and rec recognition that we are a community of need. So our case, uh, and we're asking for special consideration and that we're not asking for it on the basis of congestion, but for a, a multifaceted city, city building uh, initiative. And, and Mr. Chair, I just didn't provide any comments, but uh, other than, you know, it was a great report, but I do uh, think that uh, it behooves us to uh, seriously take a look at, uh, we're going to make some, we're going to have to make some very difficult decisions soon on this file, but uh, from my perspective, there are necessary decisions in regards to uh, the future of this community, so I look forward to uh, seeing the outcomes. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for your patience today. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Whitehead. So, Councilor Collins, Staff are going to go away, rejig the recommendations, and come back with them after we have our delegations. Okay. And uh, it was moved by Councillor Ferg, second by Councillor Johnson to receive the presentation. All in favor? Very. Thank you. Public delegations, I'd like to invite David Adames to come down to the podium for uh, your presentation. Good afternoon, David. Well, good afternoon, members of committee. Uh, great to be here representing the Hamilton Chamber of Commerce, uh, in particular LRT Task Force, which uh, comprises representatives from our divisions and committees, uh, City Council, Hamilton Hive, the Realtors Association of Hamilton Burlington, and the Hamilton Halton Home Builders Association. Uh, my comments are also on your blotter uh, today, so you can follow along with those. We will post them on our chamber website uh, after today as well. The Chamber has had a long-standing policy position of supporting public transit infrastructure, both the all-day two-way GO train service and LRT. As we know, the GO, the GO train project is now proceeding. So today is about transportation infrastructure, particularly LRT. And my comments will build on those that I shared at both the October 11, 2011 and December 11, 2012 meetings of the General Issues Committee. We are here to speak in favor of staff's recommendations in today's report. The Hamilton Chamber believes that today's decision is clear and straightforward. Approve the report and send Hamilton's rapid ready proposal to Metrolinx. By doing so, Hamilton's plan will be placed in the queue of projects that Metrolinx is evaluating, 
especially as Metrolinx is developing, developing its investment strategy that will go to the provincial cabinet by June 1. There is a continuum associated with Metrolinx's big move transit plan. Hamilton has been part of the process since the beginning and we are moving through that timeline. Today is an important part of the process where we have an opportunity to put forward and position Hamilton's plan to Metrolinx. Afterwards, we can focus on three follow-up things. One, further public engagement on the funding tools. Two, advocate for federal transit funding. And three, work with other municipalities within the Greater Toronto Hamilton area to speak with one voice for 100% funding for this type of public sector, uh, public infrastructure. As we deliberate on today's report, it is important to keep the fundamental question in front of us. Why is LRT important for Hamilton? Or put another way, what is the public policy imperative for LRT? It is about infrastructure and building infrastructure for future growth. Infrastructure is key to economic development. This was true years ago and it is still true today. Hamilton's economy flourished in the 19th and 20th centuries by developing and leveraging our infrastructure assets such as transportation, our Great Lakes port, airport, rail and roads, and energy, access to affordable electricity in particular which developed our manufacturing industry and led to the growth of Hamilton as one of Canada's largest cities and largest economies. When we contemplate LRT, we need to think about what the city will look like in the future. 2025 and beyond, and how we will grow our population, support our residents and businesses, and contribute to the provincial and national economies. So imagine for a moment we're in 2030. Hamilton's population is approaching 650 or 660,000, and we don't have modern public transit. Yet Toronto, Mississauga, Peel Region, Durham Region, along with cities like Kitchener, Waterloo, and Ottawa do. Where do we think new companies knowledge workers and young professionals will want to live and work. Now think of the reverse situation where we have future state infrastructure like LRT in 2030. We will then be positioned to grow our businesses, attract workers that these very businesses will need to compete, expand our tax base, leverage our other critical infrastructure such as our leading universities, college, healthcare system and natural environment. We will also be able to promote the additional benefits of LRT such as providing a healthier environment and supporting healthier lifestyles for our residents. LRT provides Hamilton with infrastructure that both enables the city to grow our tax base and local employment opportunities, but also to compete with other municipalities within Southern Ontario and contribute to the regional economy. LRT will strengthen our ties within the regional economy as we would have LRT to, to connect our inter-regional GO transit system. Now the good news here is that Hamilton has had the foresight to be part of Metrolinx's big move plan from the get-go and now we have a proposal with well-considered homework behind it. It is rare when a project aligns with the city's key policies, our official plan, strategic plan and transportation master plan as well as provincial policies, in particular places to grow and the objectives of Metrolinx's Big Move Plan. LRT also supports other city policies as summarized on page 13 of the Rapid Ready report. This alignment positions Hamilton's LRT project in good stead to move it forward as part of the Big Move. Now probably one key question that is on the mind of Council today and most likely by many constituents is, can we afford LRT? We now have more helpful information as a result of today's report to assess return on investment from LRT. Some of the key economic impact numbers for LRT, and they are included on slide 56 today, but also in the report, enabling more development, of, development projects along the corridor, 108 versus 32 without LRT. A tax benefit uplift of $22 million. Building permit fees in excess of 30 million. Jobs, construction jobs, 6,000, 3,500 in Hamilton and a contribution to provincial GDP of 443 million. Those are big numbers. It is too early though to make a final determination on LRT's affordability because that is not what today's report is about. By approving and submitting this report, Hamilton's project can move forward to be considered as part of the overall investment plan for the big move. We want Hamilton's project to be considered as part of this investment strategy as other GTHA municipalities projects will be. We believe it is a fair assumption 
that new funding tools will be implemented. So Hamiltonians will be paying for transit infrastructure regardless. We should therefore be receiving our fair share of that funding for LRT in our city so we can be competitive in the future. We can all come together and argue for Hamilton's fair share of transit funding. In conclusion, the Hamilton Chamber supports the recommendation in the staff report and urges Council to approve the report and submit the rapid ready expanding mobility choices in Hamilton to Metrolinx. Growth is and will continue to happen in Hamilton and to the GTHA. A key question is how do we manage that growth and accelerate that growth to our advantage? Without question, infrastructure such as LRT is key. For the province, Hamilton is a critical piece to the regional economic puzzle. A well-functioning local economy helps this part of the province and contributes to the provincial tax base. This provides rationale for the province to invest in Hamilton's LRT system, as they have done for other recent infrastructure like the Red Hill and Lincoln Alexander Parkway, servicing the Red Hill Business Park, investments in post-secondary institutions and our healthcare facilities. The Hamilton Chamber is here to support Council and our community on this important project going forward through our LRT Task Force, chaired by John Ennis and assisted by Interim President and CEO Richard Corso going forward. I open for any questions through the Chair. Thank you, David. Yes, I have Councillor Jackson and Councillor McCaddy. Councillor Jackson, please. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Hi, David, and congratulations on your new appointment. It's going to be their gain and our loss here in Hamilton. And that was a short uh, sojourn there with the Chamber of Commerce, but thank you for still being here today on their behalf. David, just quickly, and if you haven't done it, maybe I could leave this thought with you. Similar to uh, the recent results that came out on the casino, which may have been a little surprising from the Chamber's standpoint, maybe, maybe not, but sounds like ultimately that mirrored Council's decision of what Council ultimately ended up doing. On this one, I've always been curious, and if you've done it before and I've missed it, if you could just send it to me again, I'd appreciate it. For the B-Line corridor from Mac to Eastgate and for the A-Line corridor from the airport to the waterfront, have you been able to survey those businesses in that stretch of both the B and the A that potentially would see the LRT built and what the impact may be in terms of disruption of existing service to their existing clientele. Mr. Deputy Mayor, through mm -hmm. to David, has that kind of survey been done, particularly where the two lines may go? Right. Uh, through the Chair to Councillor Jackson, we have not done a comprehensive survey yet of our chamber members of the businesses along the corridor. However, uh, we are fully committed uh, to going forward with that type of survey through our LRT task force. What today's report enables us to do through the chair is to go back with more comprehensive information. So now businesses have something to react to. But we've heard loud and clear, we've been taking good notes today, is the design and the actual implementation, in other words, the how, will be important detail to go back and, and have those conversations. I will say through the chair as well is Hamilton's not alone in the implementation of uh, rapid transit, LRT, BRT, et cetera. Because we're part of the big move and all these development projects going on in the GTHA, uh, you know, Toronto is already well underway with a number of uh, LRT projects. Uh, Mississauga is coming in line, Peel, Durham, et cetera. So in other words, there's a common issue with lots of businesses in these different areas that will be affected. We can all learn together. How, we, how are we tackling these kinds of issues to go forward with these large capital projects? We did. Well then, so, so I haven't missed anything. It sounds like that more detailed survey is still pending. Right. Thanks, David. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Councillor McCaddy, please. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and uh, just thanks very much, David, for originally setting up the LRT Task Force. And, and uh, I know Councillor Ferguson, uh, Farr, and myself, Mr. Deputy Mayor, have enjoyed being part of that task force and the Government Relations Committee, and lots more work to do uh, on that. So working, uh, working with John and and of course Richard now in his, uh, his uh, acting uh, interim uh, capacity. So I, I just uh, taking this opportunity, a personal thanks uh, for your work at the Chamber and of course previously all your work here at the City. You're not too far away down in Niagara so we'll, we'll be staying in touch. Uh, and I, I just uh, very much appreciate uh, you being here today and, and uh, presenting the message that you have and the overall support of the Chamber, leadership of the Chamber on the LRT file is critical. It's up to us now to pick up the ball and, and do the government relations uh, to, to bring that money uh, back to Hamilton. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor McCaddy. I have no further speakers. I see some have a motion. Moved by Councillor Farr. 
Looked like David wanted to say something there, and I, I, I'd like to hear what he, it could be the last time I see him up there. So um, <laughs> I want to give Dave the final word, if you don't mind. I had no questions, but I will since I'm sure. now uh, live on the mic. Thank you very much for uh, decades of uh, great friendship, and I know that will continue, Dave, uh, uh, because if I read it right in the newspaper, you're going to at least continue to live here. So I, 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 it did look like you wanted to say something, sure. and that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, I will be staying as a proud resident of Hamilton, so I'll still continue to be involved in the community. But through to uh, through the chair to uh, Councillor McKay, just to comment more, there is an opportunity to be bold today to put forward uh, the plan uh, and do that with uh, with full approval of, of committee. Um, you know, lots of other municipalities are also uh, putting in their projects and, and getting in line uh, for that uh, public transit infrastructure funding. Sixteen billion dollars of projects are already underway uh, in in Toronto, in particular, a little bit in uh, other places as well, including a bit of money here. But it's a chance for us to uh, position Hamilton uh, in, a, in a strong way. And this is, this is future state infrastructure that we must uh, position Hamilton for. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Farr. Thank you, David. Councillor Pearson. So was, we're having a battle here. I want to move on here. So motion to receive was Councillor Ferguson. It was seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, David. I'd like to call on Sarah Mayo to come down to the podium. If Sarah, great. Okay, Sarah. Hello. Thank, thank you. Um, I'm here. Uh, it's great to be here representing the Social Planning and Research Council of Hamilton. Reading this report uh, and listening to presentations today made me so proud to live in Hamilton. Proud to live in a city that understands there's only one taxpayer, which means that cities have a vital role in reducing health care costs. Proud to live in a city that wants to help make life more affordable in a time of stag stagnating incomes by investing in public services such as transit. As this report notes, investments that increase freedom of choice in transportation and make it easier for people to make healthy choices and save us money in the healthcare system by reducing rates of obesity, heart disease, and diabetes, amongst others. Making investments in transit and related infrastructure and design in a complete streets approach helps people delay purchasing a car and helps families live with one car instead of two, which saves money and improves their quality of life. The Social Planning and Research Council is very encouraged that complete streets are an integral part of this report. Transport Canada explains that complete streets are designed to be safe, convenient, and comfortable for every user, regardless of transportation mode, physical ability, or age. We see complete streets as an important strategy to build equity and inclusion in our city. For example, it is often in Hamilton's lowest income neighborhoods where more people commute to work by foot, bike, or bus. Similarly, seniors, racialized communities, newcomers, aboriginals are also among those who stand to benefit from a complete streets approach. As we will be reporting in a um, bulletin next week, since 1993, women are responsible for 100% of the full-time, full-year net job growth in our community and are almost 50% more likely to get to work by transit or foot. Transit and complete streets investments described in this report, such as Trans, uh, expanded transit, bike lanes, and pedestrian safety are all vital steps to increase social and economic inclusion by taking into account everybody's mobility needs and making it easier for all residents to get to their destinations, including jobs. This report also calls for complete street policies and design guidelines, which are essential, essential to ensure that all areas of, of our city benefit, not just areas where residents are most vocal. That way, uh, disparities between neighborhoods uh, are not increased. Last year, we published a short report, which I've distributed to you today, that gives examples of ways that neighborhoods can make residents healthier, which include many com complete street elements. Um, we're now sending this report to all neighborhood associations in Hamilton. I know there are some wards with no neighborhood association, so if you have other groups to suggest we send it to, please let us know. This mailing is intended to broaden the engagement around the issues of complete streets and invite neighborhood associations and others to be part of the conversation about how to make our streets safer and healthier. We are forming a police streets, uh, complete streets policy committee with other stakeholders and city staff and look forward to collaborating on this issue. Finally, it's important to emphasize that adopting this report will be futile if investments in transit and complete streets are not made in the next budget to start putting this plan into action. There is significant frustration among residents that the city has adopted many good plans but does not follow through with the needed investments, which has led to increased cynicism. 
The province and the federal government must be bigger f funding partners, there is no question. But Hamilton must not behind, hide behind their lack of leadership, the lack of leadership of the provincial and federal governments. If we truly believe in a healthier and more affordable society, uh, city, then there are parts of the plan where we can make headway on ourselves. When considering the cost of the needed transit and related investment, we must also remember that the status quo is even more expensive, both from an economic and quality of life perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Have Councillor Farr, please. Hi. Uh, I, I love, uh, I love uh, the presentation. Uh, for the most part, it's got stats, and stats, uh, you know, don't lie for the most part and uh, you're very good at uh, putting them together. This was a great report too, and it's great to see that you're gonna go across the board and reach out to all the neighborhood associations and uh, you're reaching out to uh, myself, I guess, and my colleagues uh, to uh, help grow that conversation because it's an important one. I heard uh, you had mentioned that uh, you're forming or have formed a complete streets committee that includes some city staff. Yes. Why don't yeah. we just elaborate on that one and, and uh, maybe there's some synergies there. Yes, yeah, so there's staff from Public Works and Public Health, um, some of the people who, who uh, contributed to this report that, are, uh, that we've met with and that, that want to be part of this. Obviously, we want to support, I mean, city staff, uh, and this report is so supportive of complete streets that we just want to add whatever we can in terms of maybe on the on the public engagement and stakeholder engagement side to get more people involved and and to un better understand complete streets and 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 um and feel that they are beneficial to their neighborhoods well we've a growing um list between wards three two and one and i'm sure you're aware of with respect to yeah. the study group the public one group. two three exactly exactly right yeah. um formerly the implementation team with respect to Cannon and Queen, but uh, we expect we'll be ramping it up in a big way in the yeah. spring, so we'll certainly uh, yeah. uh, continue the dialogue uh, offline because I'm very intrigued uh, by the fact that uh, you're taking it upon yourself with your colleagues to get together with uh, the right people, and there's some good ones on mm -hmm. our, uh, our, our team, uh, particularly with public health and uh, people like uh, Peter and uh, Steve uh, from um, uh, the street uh, perspective as well. So. I think that's all I have, but a great presentation. Thank you very much. You came on an important day, and you certainly uh, convinced me that uh, um, uh, with respect to your emphasis and your five minutes, uh, just how significant a day and how significant this report is. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Farr. Seeing no further speakers, a motion to receive Councillor Pearson, Councillor Morelli. All in favor? Sure. Thank you. That's the end of delegations, and we don't have any more on here. 5-1, uh, so our recommendations, are they going to be ready at this point in time, do we know? Don? Momentarily, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I guess in respect of your time, there is a second report here, Mr. Deputy Mayor. It's not uh, absolutely, a, um, we're not obligated to have GIC here today. It's not specifically a GIC report. It just happened to end up on the same agenda. Could we perhaps get your thoughts and direction on whether you'd like us to present that report today or refer that report to Public Works Committee? It's the bike share report, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Five, the 5-2. Five uh, want a presentation or anything? Some pretty substantive costs associated with it, Mr. Deputy Mayor. It's a so, Don, just real quick, how long would it take to... How long is it going to take you to do that, do you think? Not, not with standing questions, but... Peter has a PowerPoint presentation. I believe it's about 15 slides. Probably a 15-minute presentation, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And then uh, whatever debate uh, flows from that. Okay. Are you okay with that, colleagues? We'll go ahead and have the presentation. Okay. We'll go ahead and have the presentation and uh, your questions to the topic, then we'll get to them. So this is uh, 5.2, the uh, Public Bike Share Transit System Implementation Plan. And the uh, floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. 
and council. So this presentation is really about a, a Quick Wins project uh, that I've yet to hear about. And it really ties in everything we've heard today uh, from land use, health, uh, strategic directions and priorities, and trans transportation improvements. So just as a, an outline, I want to take you through the evolution of, of bike share and then bring it into uh, why we're using it as a transit supportive measure, how it's a key to our multimodal transportation system, and then move into the details on the business plan, the market analysis, and how this will become an effective program which will benefit residents. So just as a quick definition uh, to bring us all on the same page, bike share is really a form of public transportation in which bicycles are available for shared public use, both for citizens and visitors to the city. They're available uh, for a small fee based on uh, either daily, monthly, or a yearly basis. And really you can use these bikes for your daily commutes, running errands, uh, for visitors to the city of course, getting to bus stops quickly, and for recreational purposes. And if you are part of the system and using the bikes, you don't have to store your bike, uh, maintain your bike, or worry about theft. In terms of its evolution, uh, first phase, 1960s, uh, free love, free bikes, bikes were available within a city. And then of course, uh, because there was no direct ownership, uh, sometimes those bikes went missing, were vandalized, etc. So in, came, in comes a second generation where we have more of a co-op based model where people all own the system together. Um, these were somewhat successful based on sort of a, either manual registration or web-based registration they eventually uh, got to. And uh, bikes were available in small, you know, one or two locations in a city. They're available for long-term use. Uh, they progress into a third generation model where there's a fee per use model uh, being implemented. And there's full 24-7 uh, public access to the bikes uh, with no system operators. As you can see here, and what we're focusing on today is really the kiosk-based model. And um, <clears throat> these kiosks are usually solar powered, they're movable, they're not fixed. Uh, they're designed to be uniform and discourage theft. And you might have seen these in Toronto, Montreal, uh, other cities across the world, but also, uh, and we'll talk about this more, a lot of medium-sized medium cities in both Europe and North America. And of course, you can pay by credit card if you're a one-time user, or you can get a membership for this, to the system. So how, you know, what is the situation in North America currently? Well, 2009, there were four systems with a lot of people thinking about it. By 2011, there were 20 systems. And in 2012, there are 30, which means there are actually more coming online in 2013. So it's growing in leaps and bounds. And if you look at it, a lot of that's really concentrated in our area, in our climate, in our region of the North America. Uh, and really, the growth is not just in the big cities like New York City, but also in the medium-sized cities, such as Minneapolis, Boulder, Colorado, San Antonio, Texas, uh, Spartanburg, I'm not sure that is, Chattanooga, Irvine, Ottawa, and Madison, Wisconsin most recently. In terms of why bike share and how it really fits into our TDM strategy, of course we heard about transportation, transportation demand management today. Uh, you know, it, we talk a lot about how, and that of course bike share does relate to the how of how to get there, but it really relates to all of TDM when we talk about strategies and policies to reduce the use of single occupant vehicles, SOVs. So it's not just supplying uh, transit, uh, which bike share obviously does, but also encourages transit use and walking. And we'll talk more about how we're gonna, how we design the system to do that. Um, it's also about seamless modal integration and removing barriers. The more barriers you remove, uh, the more people are likely to, to take transit, walk, and cycle. <clears throat> and then of course, use their cars less. But also uh, relates to economic development uh, impacts, such as attracting young professionals who are less auto dependent, Complementing growth of car share, and our car share has also grown um, in, to a very high degree in the last three years, and also focuses on short inner city trips. So really it helps promote uh, both the increasing, increasing access to bicycles, but also to bike lanes, and making sure they're being used. Promoting cycling as a, a normative uh, behavior, uh, but it also can be implemented relatively quickly and at low cost, which we'll talk about. And it really contributes to the city's uh, overall, what we call transportation cocktail, or this menu of, of, of options, reducing auto dependence. And we talked a little bit about, before other presentations, about the, the cost of car ownership at about $8,000 to $11,000 per vehicle uh, per year. 
So really households who are dependent on more than one vehicle uh, can use strategies to reduce the amount of vehicles they own and therefore decrease their household costs. <clears throat> but it also obviously relates to both environmental outcomes we talked about today and also those health, uh, health outcomes. So this really ties together all the stuff we're talking about in terms of health and multimodal integration uh, to really promote active transportation and, and the impacts, positive impacts it might have. It also improves access to transit. And in terms of customer experience and customer convenience, this provides both of those things. And finally, it's been mentioned in a lot of policies, of course, helps achieve the targets of the Transportation Master Plan, but also metro mentioned in the Metrolink's big move, and most recently on the Ontario Cycling Strategy, was, which has just been released in draft and will be released fully, where it actually makes direct mention to um, having bike share systems. And so I think right now uh, we've talked about the convenience of the automobile. So bike share helps make tra transit and cycling more convenient as well. And that's really why it's the perfect mode of transit to fill the gap between trips that are too far to walk and too short to drive. I think we've all been in the situation, you're stuck making perhaps a, a two or three minute car ride uh, because the walk is too long. But if you had a bike uh, readily available, uh, it would shorten that gap for you and make it more likely to be active in, in doing a chore or getting to work. And this is really also promoting it as a seamless one trip. So it's not three trips that you're making, your transit trip and your bike trip would be perhaps covered by the same Presto Pass and become part of your one trip to work. And in, in terms of uh, from a psychological perspective, we really want to improve the likelihood of performing the desired behavior, and that is behavior change to a more sustainable mode by removal of any barriers that exist to um, actually participating in that mode and incenting the desired outcomes. But from a statistical perspective, in 2006, 55% of all trips in Hamilton were under five kilometers. But of those short trips, 80% were taken by automobile. So that to me tells me there's a big market for people who are taking short trips with automobile who could actually, if it were made more convenient, take trips by bicycle or walking. So here's a, a proposed phase one uh, map of where stations could be uh, placed. The red is really the key nodes and they, they are at A line and B line stops. And the blue are the feeder nodes. And this has really been designed, if I lay, overlay the A line and B line route, to feed that rapid transit route. And that's why when we talk a little bit about the, the Quick Wins project, that's why this is being proposed as a Quick Wins project, because it really is feeding uh, these transportation corridors. And while this is a first phase, it's not entirely fixed. And we'll talk about the, the larger study area that we looked at. Um, this is to, to form the kernel of the system, but we also should keep in mind that the, the stations are not fixed. They can be moved depending on whether they, uh, they perform well or don't perform well, and they can be moved to different areas. For instance, in 2015 with Pan Am, they can move more east. In terms of uh, some of our data we've captured from different municipalities across North America, uh, for instance, Minneapolis Nice Ride users uh, reported that when they, as they were using their bike share, they actually had a 10% increase in their transit use. So we see that bike share uh, now starts to in, in improve access to transit and therefore people are using it more. But in terms of transit support, if really bike share is a, as an on-demand form of transit. It's there when you need it, you go, you pick it up, and you get to your transit stop. So it's made to be really feed those rapid transit corridors. And also, of course, build more transit demand, as was done in Minneapolis. Uh, for instance, cities like Montreal, however, wanted to smooth out transit demand. So they actually designed their bike share to more complement their transit and perhaps get people off of their, or their transit corridor. So depending on how we, we can build it either way, of course, we, wanna, we are trying to build it to improve access to transit. In terms of the cost of the system, uh, 35 stations and 300 bikes would cost around $1.6 million as, as a maximum cost. That includes the startup costs. This would be through the Quick Wins project. So just as we have looked at the transit only lane, the Mohawk Transit Terminal, and the Park and Ride, this will be one of those Quick Wins projects. And for the price of two buses, you can have a full system. So it's relatively cheap when we compare it to other uh, transit investments. It represents about 5% of the allocated Quick Wins funding. In terms of how we can get this started, we can get this started in about a year. 
So we, by this time next year, we could have uh, the system in place. So our analysis did include a larger area. As you can see, the number 14 on the map here is, the, is Ottawa Street. The orange represents areas of the city census tracts that have a cycling and walking percentage that is double the city average. And that's why we concentrated in the orange areas first. But those are 2006 numbers. In 2011, we expect that the yellow area will become orange as well. So that covers wards one, two, three, and four, and the potential of the Mountain Brow in seven and eight, wards seven and eight. So as you can see, as, as uh, our culture change in Hamilton uh, obviously continues on, on this, what, what seems to be a trajectory, we'll be able to include more wards and, and of course build some revenues to expand the system. We looked at population density, short distance trip making, origin and destination data, especially when it, a trip originates and destines in the same area which is a lot of the work trips in Hamilton, and of course our existing transit routes. With it, all those other, those are our, we, we found our key variables in, 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 in totally understanding or trying to understand how the system will benefit um, our current transportation system. We project, we project in order to become a profitable, we need an 8% uptake in the area. That's to make a profit. To break even, we're probably looking at a 6% uptake in the service area that we've, uh, that we looked at. So it's a small number of people to actually get profitable, and we're also looking for the system to be, to be revenue neutral. And that's an important con uh, condition. We've been working on this also for quite, quite a while. We've worked with a variety of stakeholders, McMaster University staff and students, Mohawk staff and students, Green Venture, Cycling Groups, Hamilton Car Share, Environment Hamilton, citizens, and also other bike share uh, city staff from different uh, jurisdictions. We did a feasibility study. We did a, two workshops. We actually brought the bike share providers down to have them have people sample how they would work. Uh, we looked at the business case and market analysis and we developed a business plan. We also did a station location analysis. And that brings us to, we had another second workshop and then we developed uh, the plan in 2012, which I'm presenting to you here today. Some of the key I'm missing a slide. Uh, some of the key elements of the market, sorry. Yeah, here we are. Market analysis and business plan. Uh, compared to other North American municipalities, Hamilton's projections for 1,500 to 3,000 annual users is achievable based on our research. There's a high population density and employment density in the area that, of, of, of study. And the level of existing cycling, walking, and transit is double the city average. In terms of costs, the capital costs will be covered by Metrolinx and the operating costs will be revenue neutral. And we ensure that through a request for proposal process with a system vendor who would operate the system for us. In terms of multimodal and TDM, uh, of course this helps eliminate those first and last mile commute problems that, that commuters do face. And it complements uh, the current level of bike lanes in the city and helps create a demand for cycling. And it really builds upon Hamilton's uh, silver cycling community designation. So this is, uh, based on the current level of infrastructure, uh, we can support the use of the bike share system, especially as we're feeding um, the north and south, and we're hoping that people will then take transit east and west. And compared to our North American peer group, and when we study other North American centers with bike share systems, we actually have more uh, cycling infrastructure than they do on average. Uh, some, of course, had more than we did, uh, and that was Washington. So we, as our key guiding elements uh, in this project from the, from the outset is to really improve access to the A-line and B-line transit corridor offering transits within five kilometers, another way to get to those corridors quickly and on demand. We wanna provide access to, sorry, bicycles to households who either don't have access to bicycles or who do not wish to have um, the bicycles stored or subjected to theft. So a lot of commuters who are commuting daily, uh, while they could cycle, they don't know what to do with their bike or they don't wanna deal with their bike at the end of their, uh, at their destination. So this helps eliminate that issue for them. Of course, we talked a lot about multimodal. This project really combines all the modes together into one, pedestrian, cycling, uh, transit use, and builds on existing ridership patterns that we, that we have and feeds those corridors. It does not compete with bike lanes or transit investments. It only supports them, which is one of the outlying goals and that we set it from the outset. This needs to be both cycling and transit supportive. 
So where do we go next? Well, here's where we are. We've done the business plan, the market research. We have both HSR and Metrolink support. We have the funding secured, the systems planned, but those are subject to, of course, more review. And now we're looking for the authorization to move into the RFP process. From there, we'd want to secure the actual station locations. We want to tender a station by hardware contract, people who, that, that means to um, actually provide the hardware. Then we'd also tender an operating contract. We'd install the system and then of course promote and operate it. So that's in a really quick nutshell uh, where we are at with our, our plans and where we'd like to move forward. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Councillor Johnson, Councillor Collins, and Councillor Farr. Councillor Johnson, please. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, and thank you very much, Peter. I've seen this program a couple of times being uh, showcased at two of the transportation symposiums that I went to, one in Ottawa, one in Montreal. Um, although there was a lot of, of um, happiness around it, there was also some challenges, and I just wanted to know if we've addressed any of these. Um, some of them were run as co-ops. Some of them were run by NGOs. Uh, but the staffing the, uh, of operations, the maintenance of the bikes, that became, that posed a problem because then the revenues were eaten up by, um, uh, with all those concerns. So have we figured out how much staffing this is going to be? And as you said, you're going to be putting out a, a station bike hardware contract. But what about the staffing that oversees everything? How much, how many people? How many people? How many staffing are we looking at to look after this program? It really depends on the system and the size, but about three staff. Three staff, yeah, three full-time staff. I, and the, f the three FTEs, would they be funded under where? So that would be with, we would, in a public-private partnership, either with the NGO or with another supplier uh, or a vendor, they would operate the system for us. So we'd have a service level agreement with them. Uh, and that's what the RP would really uh, work to get. Okay, thank you for that. And through you, Deputy Mayor, um, my understanding is one of the systems that we watched, it was actually if someone could come up with their MasterCard, swipe it, get the, that unlocks the bike, and it automatically puts a charge on their MasterCard, and it would be adjusted when they return the bike. So it would be so much per hour, or if they had a membership, it'd be so, it'd be reduced. Would that, is that the type of system that we're looking at here? Through you, Deputy Mayor, yes. Pretty much the same, the same situation. If you're a casual user, you would swipe. Uh, your credit card, for instance, if you were um, a yearly or monthly user, you'd have a prearranged uh, agreement. You'd get a special key or, depending on the system, a Presto Pass, and that would uh, give you access uh, for usually a year. Okay, thank you for that. And I'm looking ahead to Peter through the winter months. These don't stay out to 24, 7, 12 months of the year, correct? Actually, in most, in most of the systems around us, yes, they stay out 20, uh, all, all year long, including Toronto. It's only in Montreal where they've taken their, because of the amount of snow that they have, they've actually taken the uh, system offline. However, they have piloted having the system year-round as well in certain locations. Thank you for that. And I, I just wanted to um, pick up on what you just said, Toronto. My understanding was Toronto was really on their bare threads because, it, because they couldn't maintain it. Uh, how are they doing right now? From my, so we, through Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, we have uh, spent some time with Montreal, Toronto, and Ottawa and discussing how they've run their system. Uh, the one issue with Toronto is that they had to take out a loan to pay for their system. And that's why, and now they're making up the operating shortfall, but it's close because they have to pay for the interest on the loan. Uh, with having all the capital costs from Metrolinx, uh, we won't have that loan, that, that loan won't exist. I think even still with that loan and, and the operation of the system, they're still remaining um, uh, profitable or at least breaking even. Okay, and thank you for that uh, through you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I understand that we do have a bike lane project that's out right now that we're trying to finalize. We're getting, some of my streets are getting to, are turning into bike lanes. It's, it's wonderful. I'm getting some pushback from people who want to park on the streets. How are we, and, and where are we at with that? Because my understanding is that this is gonna require a safe place for people to bike, obviously. So where are we with the bike lanes in these areas that you've pointed out that you wanna put um, these transfer stations? Uh, thank you for your question, through Mr. Mayor. Uh, we have really matched the locations. That's why the locations are where they are, is to be in safe cycling corridors. So that, and we're not assuming people will take uh, 
as many east-west. Obviously, we're not encouraging people to use the bike, the bike shares on perhaps Main or King Streets because they would be meeting up with the uh, rapid transit lines. But this, the feeder, the feeder streets that feed them are are either designated cycling routes, have cycling lanes, or are safe streets to cycle on. Okay, thank you for that because I, I have a lot of cyclists in my, my circle of friends and safety has always been an issue for them, uh, getting almost clipped by, by cars the whole bit. So that's what I'm really worried about is that we keep these within the, that area. Um, I think those are my questions for now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Johnson. Councillor Collins. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And through you um, to Peter. Peter. So the, the funding for this comes out of the, uh, the quick wins account and, and the funding remaining in that account is what at this point in time? We have that figure. Uh, the funding, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, if all the five quick wins project go, f go forward will be fully expended. That's the four projects I spoke about in my presentation plus this project would fully expend all of the quick wins money. And I think it's in the order of magnitude of about, about $12 million, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. For you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, at the end of December, the balance was $13.2 million. Sorry, exclu excluding any commitments as Don's identified the five that form part of his report. So as at end of December, the balance in the Quick Wins Reserve. Okay. So the question that I would have, and Peter, I'm assuming you were here for the entire debate that we had for the LRT. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the, the, um, the chart that was in the larger presentation that we had through the LRT debate, and it was the list of investments that were, um, I guess they're, eligible for the quick wins funding and many of them have to do with enhancing our transit service and I think you've emphasized through your presentation that this is part of that so is it safe to assume then that this is sort of in competition with those other investments that are listed <clears throat> excuse me on page 43 and 44 in that previous report uh, no they're not uh, our budget is tentatively would pay for all five of those projects. Uh, that's the presumption that there's enough money in the budget to fund these five projects. The, the no, Yeah, maybe I've, I've, um, I'm not relaying my question properly, Don. There are a number of um, unfunded projects that you've listed on page 43 and 44. Um, some of them are with the AODA, and they have, um, if I'm looking at them, the review and retrofit of stops and terminals to meet AODA standards. There's a price tag of 500,000. It shows, shows it as unfunded. However, there's a Metrolinx funding opportunity. H how would that then compare to this one here? The projects um, identified under quick wins must meet a couple of criteria. Mm -hmm. uh, the money must be spent on transit. It must be spent on capital. And it must uh, contribute to growing ridership on the A line and the B line. Uh, these are all, this is residual money that we received. Uh, uh, it's the balance of the 32 million we received some years ago mm -hmm. uh, from Metrolinx as a starter towards uh, the broader Metrolinx investment in, in Hamilton, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So if I wanted to enhance um, B line or A line, and if I then switch gears then to the Upper James Corridor Transit Priority Service improvements, is that something then that would be competing with or um, in the same funding envelope as, as this project here? Uh, not at all. The four projects I spoke to, plus Peter's project. Peter's was uh, an addition over and above the four projects because we felt we were going to have some room left in the budget. Uh, the only way there would be a competition, Mr. Deputy Mayor, is if the council chose to withdraw from one of those projects and insert an alternate project. We would have to have the agreement uh, of Metrolinx to do that, however. Uh, Metrolinx, so we've met with Metrolinx, and Metrolinx has pre-approved all five of these projects, but that, that's the, the alternative the committee has, is to pull back one of these projects and insert a, a higher priority project that would meet the criteria that I explained earlier. Right, and so what would those alternative projects be, Don, if I'm looking at that list? Are they included on that investment page, or would I have to look somewhere else for my alternatives? If I thought 
that I was going to get bigger bang for the buck with another enhancement, where are, where's the, the list of enhancements that I'd be looking at? Frankly, the only other alternative that would fit the criteria as we understand it would be to buy more buses. We bought buses with the first half, and really that's our plan B in the event that any of these five projects don't come to fruition, that we would reallocate the money to uh, our capital program, and I spoke earlier about upgrading from 40-foot to 60-foot conventional buses. So the only alternative that we've really discussed and have pre-approval from Metrolinx with would be to, uh, to buy more buses. And I think Peter, using his um, presentation here, the example was given, it was two, equivalent of two buses. Is that correct? Is that what I thought I heard? Yes. That's correct. A bus, a 40 foot bus is, is a little under half a million dollars. A 60 foot bus is a little under $750,000. Okay. Those are the only questions I have. Thank you, Councillor Collins. Councillor Farr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and thank you, Peter, for this report. Um, just, I'm looking at the background, the historical background in the report last night, and I'm just, way back in 2009, the city started on this uh, with a uh, bunch of those timelines shared in slide number, and I don't see the slide number, but uh, page eight on my uh, handout, regardless, where you go through the timelines 2009 until present. And uh, you clearly have done a great deal of work between 2009 and December 2011. And uh, to, to date, we have what's uh, before us and uh, what's obviously supported by, uh, by staff and uh, falling under uh, our, our quick wins uh, uh, strategy. <clears throat> Who gave the go ahead? Was it a council directive way back? It was another term I wasn't around. What, what, where did it all start, around this horseshoe? Uh, through Mr. Deputy Mayor. Through you. Uh, it really started with a McMaster research project and the, and the emphasis from a request from McMaster to have a bike share system uh, as, was, as was gained popularity and the research was showing how important bike share systems are, uh, McMaster wanted uh, more information and wanted to be, really establish their own system. Uh, and so it was a research project uh, with McMaster students which then led to uh, Mohawk students getting involved and a lot of people being very interested. And we basically coordinated those those projects and worked with those people to give them the resources they needed. And and so yeah, you mentioned that other people started jumping on board, and and throughout this span of time, we're up to over 200 cities worldwide. It's uh, uh, popular and growing even more so probably as we speak. And uh, certainly, as you showed with your map, uh, a lot of that activity is uh, is in and around the uh, southern Ontario area. Uh, or Great Lakes region anyway. So, so there's no question it's feasible through you. In fact, it's proven to be feasible. It's proven to be feasible as a system, as a mode of transportation here in the city of Hamilton, just to be clear, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Yeah, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Yes, when we compared our, our census tracts of interest in the area, in the service area we're proposing, and matched that to the uh, 12 cities that have the, uh, that are reporting in North America, plus our other peer group in in Canada, uh, we're showing that we'd be able to support it through our statistical analysis and, and using StatsCan data and Translation Tomorrow survey data. Right. Is it? Did I read somewhere that it's just verbal con confirmation right now from Metrolinx, or we actually have confirmation from Metrolinx to use this capital funding upwards of 1.6 million? On, do you want to? Our confirmation is verbal, but is approved. We added this project in anticipation we would have enough residual budget uh, after the four projects to uh, undertake this one. And uh, we, this project would only proceed uh, subject to uh, us having the residual budget uh, as a result of implementation either and, um, as Peter says, uh, finding a, uh, an operator to operate the, uh, the program on our behalf at no cost to the city. Through you, Mr. Chair, to Don, and just based on the previous questions. So just to get into your mindset, what I think I'm hearing is, Don, your, your option was you could get a few more buses, um, but you were looking at, well, we've just about spent the 29 million Metrolinks give us for quick wins for this community, and uh, here we have about one, one and a half left, and if it came down, it, did it come down to it for you particularly, Don, as the overseer, for lack of a better, exp of, of lack of a better expression? Go with the 
Bixie bikes or go with the bike share transit uh, as opposed to uh, spending the money on a couple of new buses? Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. The, the honest answer to that question, I guess, is I'm trying to wear my new broader hat. And uh, we initiated, we spent the initial 50% on buses, and I guess I'm trying to demonstrate our commitment to a full multimodal transportation program here. And as we've learned, that truly does, this, this concept does uh, fit that bill, meet that need, and um, yeah, that's uh, an important hat you're wearing now. I think, Don, and it was uh, evident that you're, you're well versed on the bigger picture from the many hours you spent up uh, before us today. So I uh, just want to be clear through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, on the profit. You said, you know, we know it's feasible, we know it's going to work here in Hamilton, and we're looking uh, today to get approval to get an outside, uh, an RFP going to get an outside operation uh, running this uh, for us. We get all the profit with the outside operation. How would that, uh, how would that model work? Who would get the, the money for, that we would raise? Through you, uh, through Mr. Deputy Chair. I, really, we'd have to work that out in the RP process, and, and it depends on the model that we end up choosing as well, because uh, most of these systems are being run through not-for-profit partners. And so I think that would change depending on if we had a not-for-profit partner and a for-profit partner. Uh, but in, mo in all those cases, once they pay their employees, the, the real profit's being, being driven back into expanding the system. So it's really a, usually a not-for-profit model that's being employed in most jurisdictions. In the uh, progressive uh, um, Canadian cities where I've seen this uh, successfully implemented, Ottawa, Montreal, I, I, I see that they're, um, they've, they've corporate sponsorship attached. That's something obviously uh, we've contemplated here and, and would that be the city working at toward that end or, or that would be part of the RFP uh, uh, the request for a proposal to have our operator uh, do that through you through you mr. deputy mayor in most cases it's been co-negotiated that the, that the that there's a commitment from the city that the, that they're putting in the system the operator has been secured it happens usually at the same time uh, and just to get the the sponsorship confidence in the system as well. So as you're basically as you're securing station capital, you need to at the same time uh, secure the sponsor that will offset any operating costs. Okay, and I heard you say we have and we are building on um, the current the bike infrastructure as we speak. In fact, we compare well to some of the best out there right now, and we're continuing to build on the bike lanes and so forth and the bike infrastructure in this city. Yes, that's that's correct. That's correct. Okay, there's just one final question I have with respect to the motion itself, and I think it was Part C, and I've lost it. Oh, here it is. Public Works and the commitment there. Sorry. Ah, there's just so much today. If you you may want to come back to me. Sorry, I don't want to uh, prolong the, uh, I'll be a second time speaker when I find the question. I think it's an important one. Thank you, Councillor Parr. Councillor Partridge, please. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, Peter, good presentation. And uh, I'm sorry I missed part of it, but uh, certainly did uh, enjoy the light reading that uh, we had for Sunday evening. So just a couple of questions. More to do with the logistics of this helmets. I'm not sure if you covered off, but we have a requirement in Ontario for helmets. Um, how is that going to be addressed? Uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, as far as I know, uh, adults aren't subject to the uh, mandatory helmet law. Right, but is there not going to be a sign attached to them? Because I thought I read that in the report, that there would be a requirement, that there would be a sign, some sort of signage on the bikes. And, and that's okay if you're not, not remembering that. That's fine. I just wondered yeah, I, if there was going to be any kind of signage saying, you know, helmets need to be worn uh, under a certain age. I think it's 18 and under, something like that. But that's okay. My next question through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. What if the bike breaks down? All, those of us who cycle, many times you get a couple of miles down the road, uh, tire blows, something happens. Chain comes off. Yes, I love it when the chain comes off. What happens then? Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, the 
most likely, and, and what's happened in the other systems, is that you're not too far from another station. So then when your bike does break down in that, in that case, you're to put it into the, into the station, there's a button that says this is broken, and someone comes and fixes it. However, if you do take it farther, uh, then, you're, then as if you had your own bike, you'll have, you would be responsible for getting that bike back to one of the, the kiosks and putting it in there and saying that it is broken. Okay, so you're not responsible for fixing it, just for getting it back to the nearest station. Okay, that's good. Um, another question is, within the Metrolink's geographic area of those of us who are being included in that for funding, are there any other municipalities around us that are putting this particular um, Big C Bike program into their plan? You, Mr. Deputy Mayor. The only one, and I think this is very early stages in contemplation it, that I've heard of, and of course I don't want to, I have no official confirmation, but is Mississauga. Um, and the idea that um, the City of Toronto was promoting to Metrolinx, at least in the earlier stages, is that there would be a regional bike share system that would connect to most of the nodes along the uh, Lakeshore uh, line, uh, Lakeshore Go line, uh, so that once you get off a go bus or go train, uh, there's a bike share available in that, in that small corridor. But I think that would be a long-term plan. Uh, the current cities that can support uh, a bike share in terms of their demographics and um, employment uh, density is really a guarantee in Hamilton, Mississauga, and Toronto. Okay, no, and that makes sense down there, certainly. Um, so another question I have here is about, um, about locations and about partners. Now you mentioned in the report certainly makes sense to partner with the universities, the colleges, where it makes sense on the campuses. And um, you did answer Councillor Farr's question on the corporate sponsors. What about tapping into any of the larger corporations for locations within, and I'm thinking Hamilton Health Sciences, I'm thinking, um, you know, AMD, um, that kind of thing. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, yes, that is, in other systems, that was thought to have been a major generator of, of income. It turns out, it, for most of the systems, some of the major companies, yes, most no. Um, so it's not something to rely on, but it is an absolute avenue that should be pursued, especially with the ones you've mentioned, the big ones where we're putting a station, hopefully, you know, close to their location because they are big. Um, they, they create a demand there, right? They have a lot of employees at that, at that, at that site. Therefore, we put a station there and work with them to have some sponsorship of that station. Thank you, and there's the magic word I wanted to hear because certainly if they're going to have a location, I think we would have uh, opportunity to negotiate some sort of sponsorship uh, in order to do that. So we're not just relying on the, the, uh, the usage coming out of it to generate revenue, but uh, that there is some, some uh, sport sponsorship as well. Um, I'm a huge supporter of, of this system. Um, I have uh, nieces and nephews who live in Ottawa and uh, certainly down in Montreal, and it's well used and just growing leaps and bounds. And uh, we did experience it ourselves when we were in Montreal. So I'm, I'm a huge supporter of this. And thank you very much for all the work that you've done and for all the folks up there as well. I appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor Partridge. Councillor Jackson. Thanks, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, Peter, thanks for the presentation. So let me understand this. Um, we want to spend $1.6 million to set up this bike share system, which will also mean providing bikes to people. Mr. Deputy Mayor, through to Peter. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, yes. And I read the background here, and this Bixie bike, by the way, I've got a six-year-old uh, Raleigh, um, still collecting some cobwebs, but once in a while I use it. Um, is it $3,000 per bike is the capital cost? I read that on page 50 of the report of the background information, Peter. It's capital costs were previously estimated at 3000 to 3200 per bike for a Bixie system. Page 50 of, of your report, Peter, under item 5.2. Unless I've got the wrong report, Peter. Bike share business plan. Yep, I'm here. Um... <clears throat> About halfway yep. down. And I think the the capital cost. That, sorry, through Mr. Deputy Mayor. Capital cost that we're looking at is a thousand dollars per bike. 
Okay, it says here capital costs previously estimated 3,000 to 3,200 with operating costs coming in at 1,500 per bike per year. How come it takes 1,500 bucks a year to, to operate the operating costs for a bike? I mean, how shiny is this bike, Peter? Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. That was the, that would be, that was taking the full operating cost and, 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 and then dividing it per bike. So that would be all the staff in the, in the, uh, Whatever whatever vendors operating, that's their staff, their their costs, basically everything, including uh, the monitoring of each bike. So not necessarily just the maintenance of the bike, but actually it's monitoring, and uh, so. Would you, so what's the capital cost then, Peter? You just said a thousand, but in the report it said three thousand. So I need to get that clear. Even at a thousand bucks a bike, I find that somewhat costly, but. Um, but Council, I'm reading three. Yeah, Mr. Councilor Jackson, I have uh, Mike Zagarik. Yes, please. please. Acting just General Manager. Through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, just to confirm Peter's number on both pages 53 of 104 and the bottom of page 54 of 104, the price per bike in 2000, in the first year, 2012, is identified at the bottom of page 54 at $1,000 per bike, and it's similarly identified. Uh, about one third down the page, uh, page 53 at $1,000 per bike. So then Mike, what was the cost then on page 50 halfway down? It said originally 3,000 to 3,200 per bike for a Bixie system. So I'm just trying to reconcile that suddenly we get it, we're gonna hopefully get a break by a certain uh, single source provider, whoever we negotiate with and we're hoping the cost will be only a thousand, but we thought originally it might be three thousand per bike. I mean, I'm just trying to understand the two different numbers. I think th through you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, that because of the um, because of the looking at the systems and trying to get an estimate in the originally, uh, that's why it's saying it was originally thought it was about three thousand dollars per bike, uh, and I think that number would have included the station uh, the station procurement as well of thirty five thousand dollars per station. But when it's broken out. Uh, the numbers in the spreadsheet are the numbers that, that we would be going with. And of course, we'd have an RFP process so that we would get the exact numbers. Uh, and of course, if those numbers didn't, didn't add up to our accounting, then we'd have to seriously consider that. But through our, through the spreadsheets that you have here are the, the correct numbers, $1,000 per bike, $35,000 per station. Okay, so we've agreed on about $1,000 per bike. Okay, so. This sounds a lot, Peter, like that car share program. I forgot who came in and presented on that. And I've heard, I've heard, I think it's been in place in this community about maybe a couple of years now. I've heard mixed results about it. One of the concerns I had about that car share was uh, insurance, risk, liability, accidents, who's gonna cover it. So similar to this. So the plan with this is I take out a membership when, when this system is set up, you buy a $1,000 bike, you give me a free $1,000 bike. Um, I can use this free $1,000 bike, and if I trip and fall and I hurt myself, I got a membership, city covers the cost. Help me understand that hypothetical scenario. Help me understand a situation like that, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I, I probably think that's a better question for, for legal and the systems that we would, again, when we're requesting the system through the, through the process, we would, part of the package would be the, the insurance and risk calculation. That hasn't been, that hasn't been done yet uh, because I, we're at a stage, I think, just before doing that. Uh, so I don't have the direct answer for you on what would happen if someone uh, were to fall and hurt themselves on one of those bikes. Also, I believe if we're tendering a contract with a system operator, then that would be the responsibility of the system operator. If I could, Mr. Deputy Mayor, yes, if I understand no. correctly, and Peter can confirm this, the city is entirely hands-free in this initiative other than a fraction of Peter's time on an annual basis. All risk is absorbed by the proponent who will ultimately operate uh, the system, and all capital is absorbed by Metrolinx. So it's essentially a hands-free operation for the city other than to manage the contract with the vendor. and. Uh, and uh, all risk would be borne by the proponent and that risk would be built into uh, their cost proposal for this package. So the only investment on behalf of the city here is a portion of Peter's time. 
it does not go forward, this initiative does not go forward unless we get a proponent that ensures the city that the city um, is uh, entirely free of any operating uh, expo and liability and all the capital coming from Metrolink. So the city's only um, involvement in this entire initiative is a portion of Peter's uh, time each year to manage the contract. So Don, if we don't get a system supplier or sponsor that's willing to take that risk or hypothetically says to the city, yeah, I'll enter into a contract with you, but I want 50, 50 uh, percent risk. I'll take 50 and the, I want the city to take 50. What do we do then? We'll come back to committee and I suggest we wouldn't go forward um, unless we can find a vendor or a contractor that's prepared to assume all risk and build that risk into uh, their uh, proposal then uh, it's in all likelihood we wouldn't proceed forward. Our expectation is, is that we will find a vendor or a contractor who will do this on our behalf uh, and assume all risk and build the cost of that risk into their cost of operations. Uh, other, anything other than that, Mr. Chairman, or Mr. Deputy Mayor, we'll come back to Council for further direction. In any event, we're going to come back to Council with uh, presuming we get a successful or a desirable respondent to the F RFP we will bring all those details back to um, uh, council before we enter into any agreements, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So, Don, I appreciate you're trying to raise my comfort level. C part of the recommendation says the GM of Public Works be given delegated authority, negotiate with potential sponsors, and to enter all the agreements for a minimum of three year period. But the B part says you're going to report back to council on the RFP. So I'm trying to understand which comes first here. If it's anything other than uh, a fully offsetting, uh, arrangement, the one I, and the, as the one I just characterized, yep. then we would come back to committee. Uh, we will not proceed unless uh, this is totally cost neutral to the city. And uh, other than that, uh, we'll, re we'll report back for further direction, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Don, I thank you for your answers, Peter. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I just don't have a comfort level today to support this. There's just a few questions out there still for me. And the optics of providing a $1,000 free bike to use to people who want to use a bike in the community. I'm not saying there aren't people who can't afford it and they would greatly appreciate it, but I just I'm not crazy about the optics of this and the 1.6 million. We just had a talk about the public transit system and everything, and I understand the global hats and everything we're all trying to wear now, but I don't know. There's just too many questions still for me unanswered in this and the overall operating maintenance of $1,500 a year on a bike, $1,000 per bike to give out a free bike. I'm just not on at this time. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Jackson. Councilor McCaddy. Thanks, uh, Mr. Dep Deputy Mayor. I, I just, just want to clarify, because what we're doing here uh, is, is not new, uh, as I understand it, Peter. Uh, uh, the City of Montreal, in terms of a Canadian perspective, has been at this for some time. And in fact, uh, they've been so successful, they're, they're marketing their approach, uh, uh, you know, elsewhere uh, in uh, Canada and, and North America. Uh, perhaps the kind of thing we should be thinking about as, as a municipality, actually, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we do some really interesting and creative things here in Hamilton, and we should probably be marketing our approaches to uh, other municipalities as well. It was quite a creative uh, approach that Montreal took with the Bixie program uh, they, they have. So. Montreal has this, uh, Toronto has it. Uh, can you outline some other cities, uh, Peter, that we would be familiar with that, that have this? Because I'm getting the sense that folks think this is a risky venture and, and uh, perhaps not something that has been tested elsewhere, whereas in reality, Hamilton is, uh, is definitely not a leader in this. Uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor to Peter. Through you, Mr. Whoever. Deputy Mayor. Uh, yeah, I, there's a variety of cities, especially Oh, yeah, no. Nope. Don wanted to so. answer that. Don? Perhaps let Peter answer that question, but I guess I could suggest some maybe uh, some amendment to the staff recommendations. And I can see where Councillor uh, um, Jackson struggling a little bit is, 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 is C seems to give staff exclusive right to proceed to contract, where B says, no, we're going to report back. And those don't seem to be in harmony with each other. I me. guess I'm wondering for the consideration of committee is that we could have the delegated authority to enter into an agreement in principle, if we were to amend C, enter into an agreement in principle, subject to the approval of council. Would that help, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor? So in, in any case, we would come back to committee. Uh, we would not enter into an agreement without uh, 
without council's authorization. And I certainly at the appropriate time, I would move that uh, amendment, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, because again, what we're doing is, is something that's been done in quite a few other places and Hamilton's no different. Uh, so I, as long as we have the, uh, the check back here at uh, committee, I, I think we should be able to move ahead on this today. Okay, thank you, Councilor McCaddy. Councilor Whitehead. Yeah, can I, uh, the first thing I have is, I, I see a slippery slope. We have something in Ontario that may not be uh, uh, in Montreal or some of those other areas, and that is the uh, whole P, OPDA, the Ontario Disability Abilities Act. <laughs> My understanding is, is that whatever service we provide to this community, we have, provide, we have to provide equity. So I need to understand is this a slippery slope and uh, uh, will people with disabilities come back and say, hang on a sec, you're providing a service that we can't take advantage of and therefore we're demanding uh, a, a similar type service for our needs. Uh, the best uh, response I can give to that, that's not contemplated anywhere in either the transportation standard or the built environment standard of the AODA. It's my impression that uh, the city would be entitled to move forward on this uh, irrespective of the AODA legislation, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, do we have uh, a legal advice on this? Because I, I need to understand if we're not, I mean, I want to know, I know absolutely for sure that uh, by uh, the city uh, initiating this, that we're not exposing ourselves to ensuring that we provide equity to uh, uh, people that can't utilize this particular service but would demand something uh, that meet their needs. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I can't give you that answer today. I'm starting to sense that Council, if it's not uh, comfortable going forward with the staff recommendations today, that you could give us some direction in terms of additional information and uh, possibly have this report referred to the next uh, Public Works Committee meeting in, in March if, uh, if the comfort level isn't there today to allow us to go to RFP to uh, collect the information that we need to report back to Council. Well, I just want to raise that, uh, I mean, we got to Council anyway, which is this Wednesday. I mean, surely we could get legal for that. I don't want to tie it up if, if we don't need to, but I think it's an important question because we've been hit on the darts. We've been hit on another, another uh, HSR, a number of fronts in regards to equity. Uh, and I just want to make sure that if we're the sponsor of this program, if this is a private sector initiative, that's one thing, and we could be saying this is great, but it's not. It's a city initiative which puts it in a whole different light. And that's what concerns me. Once the city initiates something like this, uh, you do open yourself to those kinds of challenges. Uh, in the report, it does talk about insurance and liability and risk. I think I heard through the chair uh, that you would hope that the operator would take uh, the 100% the, the risk. Again, I need legal because my understanding is if we're initiating it, we, we can't shake risk, period. We're going to have uh, uh, a d degree of risk regardless. Uh, and how do you quantify that? I guess, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, given the questions that have been raised today, I think uh, if it's agreeable to members of the committee that we would, in, under any circumstances, all circumstances, report back to committee uh, with the results of an RFP and at that time bring forward um, a legal opinion and, and the risks associated. Um, so if it's your decision to move forward to allow us to go with, forward with the RFP, it seems to make total sense that we would bring back a, the results of the RFP and get uh, further direction from council under any circumstances or option B might be to refer the report and send us away to get additional direction. But um, I'm wondering if, if uh, simply amending C to direct us to come back under any circumstances uh, with the results of the RFP and, and seek further, further direction as a result of the, what we find in the RFP might be uh, amenable to members of council. I appreciate that. Uh, I'd, I'd certainly be open to that, Don. Uh, I guess the other uh, question I have, Don, uh, through, through the chair is um, how much glass do we replace on our bus shelters currently a year? What's, what's the value? I don't know I can get that for you, but I, one of the major projects for uh, Christine's team this year is to completely refurbish all 470 odd bus shelters in the city. When we extended the agreement with CBS uh, uh, two years ago, uh, they did um, uh, provide us with funding, about $175,000 if I recall, uh, to bring as part of the, um, the renegotiation of the agreement. Um, and so we haven't done that. That's a major project for 2013. So our intention is to go throughout the existing inventory of transit shelters and replace 
uh, all of the broken and, uh, van well, there's no bro there's very little broken, but all of the vandalized glass, that's a major 2013 initiative for us, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So, so I want to highlight that because, again, I'm trying to understand from uh, that perspective, the vandalism. Um, have we counted the, the level of vandalism we experienced in our bus shelters and equated to this particular exercise and what the, how well, that might drive the cost up? Again, Peter knows a lot more about this program than I do, but the, again, the proponent would have to build uh, the cost of uh, exposure to vandalism into their, into their proposal. And I guess what we're saying, there's under no circumstances could uh, we put the city in the situation where they would be uh, financially reliable, or flat financially liable for this project. We would come back for, to committee if that should happen, if, the, if, the, if should we should get into this and the proponent finds that they can't afford it, or they didn't budget properly for it, we would come back to committee, and at that time, committee would have an opportunity to perhaps even wind down the, uh, the program and, and sell the infrastructure. Appreciate that. Now, the other the question I have is uh, the quick wins, because you're indicating this has come from the quick wins. I guess one of my concerns in, in the context of priority, I mean, we're talking about 300 bicycles here, right? So is this the biggest bang uh, for $1.6 million investment, or is there other areas that we can make investment in, the, in within our public transit network uh, that would uh, impact uh, much more uh, greater citizenry in this community. This was the the best five projects that we could come up with that would fit within the specific criteria that we got from Metrolinx. That they were quick wins. That the they had to be substantially uh, funded and completed in uh, by the end of 2013. That they were transit specific and they were only for capital. So when we moved these initiatives forward, those were the best five uh, initiatives we could come up with, Mr. Deputy Mayor, over and above uh, the purchase of buses. We did use the first about first 50% of the money towards purchase of buses. So it, it, one of the biggest complaints, uh, Mr. Chair, I get uh, from public transit users on the mountain is we don't have enough sheltered uh, bus shelters, period. We got, in fact, we probably have equal amount of uh, bus stops that do not have uh, a bus shelter at all. So I, from my perspective, that's a capital expenditure. Is that not something that makes sense in regards to uh, make, if I really want to improve the experience of the, uh, the public transit rider and give them the protection from the elements, if there's, if there's a, a funding envelope that can expand on what we're already doing on that front, wouldn't that make sense? It does, Mr. Chairman, uh, Deputy Mayor, we actually have a, concurrent initiative underway. It was heard at the last Public Works Committee. It's coming back to the next Public Works Committee uh, because we had to provide some additional uh, information to committee. Uh, and that's a separate report, separate money, and it does uh, uh, recommend the expansion of the existing shelter program by some 50 shelters. So we plan to do both, uh, quite frankly, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So what money are we doing that with through the chair? That would be coming out of the uh, provincial gas tax capital reserve, I believe, Mr. Deputy Mayor. That was one of the uh, uh, the points of clarification. I sent out an information update uh, just last week to clarify the source of that funding, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So uh, I guess here's my dilemma then. So uh, the gas tax, my understanding, could be used for operating as well. Is that correct, to the chair? Well, the gas tax is now uh, fully committed. And so once we've implemented Council's uh, service enhancement plan, uh, which was a three-year enhancement plan to be completed by uh, the end of 2013, and we will finish at the end of 2013. All of the gas tax will be fully committed to the operating budget. What's in the interim, though, we actually, because we haven't implemented all that service, uh, we have an account that's, a uh, capital account that's growing uh, that we haven't had to tap into yet because all the services haven't been implemented. So the funding for these initiatives would come from that reserve that's been accumulating over the last two or three years. But once, we can spend that money once, but that money has to be available going into 2014 because all uh, 11 million that flows to the city has to go into the operating budget. 100% uh, of it will be in the operating budget in, in, in January 2014. So we have an interim opportunity here to uh, use those monies on a one-time basis for capital projects. So part of it, uh, we're, we're, we're recommending uh, an expansion of the bus shelter program by 50 buses or 50 shelters over the next 12 to 18 months, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And uh, I guess the, the question then on the, on the bus shelters, is 50 enough? Well, the IBI uh, report, I think, uh, recommends more than 50. I think it's... 
I think it's it's about 40% of all stop locations. So it doesn't get us there, but it, it, it is um, a pretty substantive exp expansion. Uh, we'll, we'll have, um, how many shelters? About 550? Currently have 550, we'll be going to 600 if the report passes in uh, the end of March, and that's uh, uh, at, I think we have about 2,200 bus stops in the city, Mr. De Deputy Mayor. So, so the, one, the one, 1. 1.6 would get us there, would it not, through the chair? Uh, yes, we wouldn't propose to put a bus shelter at every bus stop in the city, but the, certainly the 1.6 would uh, bring us up to the recommendation in the, uh, in the IBI report. Um, I guess those are my questions. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I've forgotten. Uh, not, is, is the criteria. The, the, the monies under quick wins must be spent in the A line and the B line quarters. I, I forgot that for a second. Christine just reminded me. Okay, so we can obviously, uh, uh, in fact, that's where I got most of the problems is on the uh, A line corridor. So I have no issue with the fact that we take 1.6 and start making appropriate investments on bus shelters in the A corridor as opposed to uh, using up the gas tax, which we might have more flexibility on. Is that possible? What, what we propose to do is use the transit capital reserve for anything that's not eligible for uh, one-time funding through the provincial gas tax capital reserve, the residual amount. At some point, we'll use all that capital up uh, after January 1, 2014, it'll all be committed to the operating budget. So what we we're trying to do, what we have to do is, 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 is any monies that can be, any capital monies that can be applied to the A line and B line, we use the provincial gas tax reserve for that. Any infrastructure enhancements anywhere else in the city, we'd use the transit capital reserve for that. So we're just trying to make the best use of the uh, capital reserve that has been provided through the Metrolinx agreement and must be used on the A line and the B line. So the transit hub through the chair, the transit hub at Mohawk College, uh, uh, how has that been funded? That's one of the five quick wins project and uh, ideally would be funded 100% by Metrolinx. 100%? Yeah, well, uh, just my comments, uh, Mr. Chair. I, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, I would prefer an NGO coming forward and proposing something, initiating it. For the city to initiate it concerns me because I think it opens us up to liability. It opens us up to, uh, like I said, possible uh, uh, challenges under the Disability Act. Uh, those are the two concerns I have. Um, if I understand the merit, I just don't know if the city should be the one initiating it, if this is a private sector uh, opportunity. Uh, also in the report, it does talk about the fact that we have rental shops in, uh, in, uh, in Hamilton that rent, rent bicycles out. Uh, I don't know. Uh, if we want to be in competition with rental shops. So can you kind of get a response on that? Yeah. Through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. The, the rental shops are renting out bikes on a long, for more of a long-term basis, right? So you rent that out for hours. Uh, you rent it by the hour. The bike share system is, is meant for, for commuter traffic and it's rented, it's rented by uh, the half, the, basically you get first half hour free. So in any city where, in, in fact, Hamilton doesn't have a very large rental market uh, for bicycles right now, whereas a city like Vancouver or Montreal has a very high rental market, and that bike rental market versus the bike share market don't compete with each other because they're, they're targeting different people uh, and, and they're being used for different uses. One's more of a transit integration multimodal approach, and the other one is really for long-term bike rental. And so both of those models coexist and, and support each other very well. And the other thing is that in terms of um, some of the things that the bike share, in terms of getting more people uh, physically active through active transportation, uh, the bike share is there usually on your commute for a very quick pick-me-up versus having to take your car. So there's an added bonus and, and, and a difference between the bike share system and renting a bike for most likely long-term use or going to do something athletic or recreational over long term, running the around the bay route, for instance, on your bike, would be a rental, but getting to the corner store would be a bike share uh, use. So they're very different uses, and the bike shares are at different 35 different locations. Whereas your bike share shop, you have to somehow get to the bike share shop, get your bike, and then use it how you ever you're going to use it and bring it back there. So they're very different models, and they both uh, it really support each other very well. I appreciate it. I see the target group here is. Uh, uh primarily the students attending uh, university and college, uh, and as suggested by the locations that you've identified. Uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, 
most actually the, the, the way the system has been designed is really for commuter commuters even yes to accommodate the needs of students as well in the corridor closer to McMaster but really is used by commuter commuter traffic uh, as your number one uh, group and then number two of course is people in the area running errands and your third group is students I, I would appreciate uh, I certainly uh, won't uh, cast judgment I wouldn't mind getting the answers to those questions before I, uh, I take a decision thank you Councillor Duvall. Yeah, Mr. Chair, just a quick question, Peter. Um, or maybe actually Don can actually this. Uh, Don, did, uh, I understand this will be no cost to the city, correct? Correct, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And going down the road in the next two or three years, if seven or eight, 10, 12 bicycles get wrecked, we're not be asked to replace them who replaces those bicycles that's entirely the responsibility of the contractor mr. deputy mayor so if if, he, if we front the uh, that contract of 300 bicycles we must get 300 bicycles back Is that what I'm hearing we 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 will own that infrastructure at the end of the day mr. deputy mayor that will be the city's infrastructure funded with by Metrolinx at the end of the day if the contractor if, if things didn't work out for the contractor all that infrastructure would return to the city the city could dispose of that infrastructure they could sell it off um, but again um, my understanding unless Peter uh, corrects me the city's only investment in all of this is a portion of Peter's time every year to manage the contract anything beyond that we'd have to report back to council and seek further direction okay and then through um to Peter, Peter, there's no public employees. These are all employees that are done by the contractor. And what would are these full-time employees or are these seasonal employees? And what would the cost for for labor be? Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, the the I think it's three full-time employees, uh, based on the model that we were looking at, and based on other other models that we had had investigated. I don't know what the salary. It's I could look it up for you, but essentially they would be responsible for paying those employees. Uh, and so the, the, the intent is that the, the, the revenues generated at the, uh, at the kiosk uh, would then go to pay those employees and, and also uh, pay for the bikes. We, we factored in about $20,000 per year for, for bike replacement due to theft or uh, vandalism. Uh, and so they, they would, that would be the responsibility of the vendor. Okay. And then just one more question to Don. Don, would the contract be for uh, a period of time of say three to five years? I mean, we just don't buy the infrastructure and then after a year we find out or this contractor finds out that it's not working out in, in Hamilton like it is in the other cities. Can he opt out? Well, that would be, yeah, Peter, if you don't mind, I assume that would be subject to the agreement between the city and the vendor. Uh, the most important thing is if the contractor did walk away, the city, the city retains the infrastructure and could dispose of the infrastructure as they see fit, but I'll let Peter to add to that. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. If we go with a, a vendor that has bikes in the area, we could then sell those bikes to a neighboring municipality because they will always need bikes as well. So uh, there's a good market for the purchase of the vehicles if for, for, for whatever reason the vendor walks away and, and we're left with bikes, uh, we could then recoup our losses from selling those bikes to neighboring municipalities depending on the system that we choose okay okay thank you Councillor Pearson could you take the chair please just a few questions so through you uh, madam chairman Peter at the beginning you mentioned we talked about city employees being involved FTEs and you'd indicated that and I'm putting words in your mouth two to three maybe to operate this system through you madam chair it wouldn't be uh, city employees it would be the employees of the vendor that we go with okay thank you for that um, I have some concerns about liability we're saying that we're not the ones that are putting the bikes in place putting the system in place and yet at the end of the day I hate that term but if something should happen to the operator we get the bikes back if it falls onto us to me that tells me that we have some liability here I've been involved in different uh, issues and, we, and with the farm and everything we've got to make sure we're covered all the land we're on and all the roads and that it seems it's going to come back t to us in some way and, and I know uh, through madam chair that the majority of people are responsible things happen with car drivers truck drivers uh, bicycles the same way I see bicycle operators in town and in the country that are responsible 
I also see the ones in town down here that go through the red light. You're making a right hand turn and you're watching for pedestrians and all of a sudden the bike comes past you. When a car hits, when a car would be hitting one of those bike operators, but going back to the point, the fact is that at some point in time, should the operator not succeed, we retain ownership of these bicycles. I'm still seeing we're reliable, whether there's an accident or whether there's uh, anything that could happen with them. And I'm not so sure if we should be jumping on this until we get some clarification through legal. If I could, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, what we are suggesting is to allow us to go to the RFP to find out if there is an interested vendor out there and then amend the recommendation C so that we're absolutely obligated to come back to council with the answers that you're seeking today. Uh, we won't, we're not uh, inventing the wheel here. We would presumably draw on operating agreements from other municipalities that already have these programs in place. So the objective uh, for today would be, first of all, let us uh, test the market with the RFP. And then before any decision is made by committee, we come back and, and, and most specifically address your uh, legal concerns and have legal here uh, when we report back on the results of the RFP, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So, through Madam Chairman then, so we go ahead with this. We're not committing to, to any of that funding. That would be my suggestion, Mr. Deputy Mayor, if that uh, works for committee is to um, amend recommendation C to enter into and add the words agreement and principle subject to the approval of council. And that would obligate staff to uh, stop at the, um, at the conclusion of the RFP process and report back to council and address all of the uh, outstanding concerns that we have uh, at that time and particularly the legal, uh, presuming that we get a, uh, a willing, uh, a willing um, uh, proponent, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Okay, thank you, Don. I'll give the chair back to you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and I'd like to put myself on the speaker's list. Councilor Pearson, and I have no other speakers this time, so Councilor Pearson, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and you raised some, uh, some valid points and certainly concerns in hearing the, around the table. First and foremost, I, you know, I, everybody's always apprehensive with going with something new. We did have Big, I think it was Big C was here last summer, and we had a display that was out in front of City Hall, and it was, it was quite... Um, interesting to see what options and what um, different sort of venues are available for the public. Um, I'm, I'm not closing the door on this, but I'm just wondering and understanding and that maybe there's a possibility, and first and foremost for you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, there is a cost, though, to go through an RFP process. It's very costly for a proponent, and it's also costly for the municipality, correct? The uh, cost of the municipality would be the cost of Peter Stein to prepare and issue the RFP and any support he needs in issuing the RFP. We'd need the support of, for example, purchasing and legal so that when we issued the RFP, it contained the information we required to allow council to make an informed decision. So yes, there would be staff time involved and uh, uh, perhaps Peter could buy, provide an estimate of just how much staff time it would take to get uh, the uh, RFP issued and, 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 uh, and responded to. Best guess, Peter? <clears throat> Through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, you know, I, I, we have, uh, we, to be honest, we, we had on my regular work plan to do the RFP, so we weren't expecting it to be uh, a large amount of time. We, we've done RFPs before as well. Uh, we've worked on other contracts, so uh, we're expecting it to be similar. And we've got a lot of North American experience out there with RFPs. So, in fact, we don't expect it to be over and above my regular work commitment. Thank you, and uh, thank you, and I appreciate that. Mr. Deputy, um, what I'm getting at is I'm just wondering, because of the concerns and the comments that I'm hearing around the table, maybe it would be more appropriate that we went to the communities that had this and did a report of how their systems work, what they're doing, if they're independent companies, whether the municipalities are running it, and answer the questions that have been raised around the table with regards to liability, with regards to uh, safety, et cetera, before we go through the whole process, because I would hate to say let's do an RFP, and, and then it's for naught, and that's a lot of, uh, I'm not going to say it's so much staff time, but I mean, we hear it all the time around the table on, on uh, tendering processes, et cetera, the costing involved from the outside sources. So I'm just wondering if we had that comfort level of information before us. So that might be a direction, Mr. Deputy Mayor, that I wouldn't mind putting forward at the appropriate time. But secondly, um, is there a timeline to using this money with the quick wins? There is, Mr. Mr. Deputy Mayor. Ideally, the monies are all supposed to be expended by the end of 2013, so we do have timeline constraints. Our 
depending on how we proceed on any of these projects, we're in regular communication with Metrolinx and we are at risk of asking for an extension on a couple of the projects already, but certainly the agreement uh, literally interpret it means uh, that we have to have expended all of these uh, monies by the end of 2013. Okay, so uh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I, I think that as part of the offer free process, and we, we've done our research on various models uh, and cities out there, and I think through the, before we actually issue the RFP, we would also complete that research and make sure that we have the RFP that, uh, and, and have the model, ma match the model that we're looking for before we actually issue the RFP. So it would be part of that process. So I think that in, in engaging that process, we would have, we have our data from different cities and we were just basically finalizing, making sure the legal components are there and we wouldn't issue before that. So I think it would be part of that process. Deputy Mayor, if the, if the information on the other cities is already available, maybe they can provide us with a report and we can do this in a timely manner, uh, maybe before public works or, um, you know, within the next month and get that uh, resolved. When we had Big C here last summer, last question, Mr. Deputy Mayor, when we had Big C here last summer, was there any interest at that time who brought the, uh, the, the bikes and the, and the lock system uh, here? Was there any indication of anyone there at that time interested in... Um, pursuing operation in Hamilton? Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Yes, both both vendors were interested and there are two others. So, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I mean, that would be a suggestion I would have just to, just to answer these questions because I think we're all going into this without clear understanding of, of what's involved. I hear it that there's no liability in this valley, but let's just see what's happened out there in the, in the world and uh, we can take it from there. But I don't want to close the door on it. Thank you. If I could, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we serve at the Willow Council. If it's your preference to refer this back for additional information, uh, could I just perhaps get some direction whether or not it might be referred back to Public Works Committee uh, and whether that be sufficient or whether you want it to come back to GIC. But uh, we could certainly, in, in fact, we can even take a presentation of Public Works Committee uh, from the potential uh, vendors and we could bring uh, legal in as to address some of the legal questions. So if, if I'm sensing that council needs uh, a higher comfort level here and, and uh, we, we're certainly comfortable with you referring it, if you, if you are going to refer it, maybe give, perhaps give consideration to referring it to Public Works Committee, give us some direction to bring back some additional legal information, some experience with some of the other uh, municipalities and perhaps even invite the uh, vendors in to give a, the potential vendors in to give a presentation. So Mr. Deputy Mayor, if I can, I know I spoke to this, but at the appropriate time, I'll, I'll refer it back for the information. And uh, I don't have a problem with the coming to Public Works because I think it would be faster than if it comes to the next GIC with regards to in our cycling of, of our meetings. So, uh, and then at Public Works, everybody can be invited to the I'm not on it, but I would certainly attend. So with that, if I can, I'd, I'd uh, move to refer it with direction to staff to provide all that information to have the legal, uh, historical background of other communities, et cetera. Just as Don said, thank you. Referring it back, there's, there's no other. Okay, all right, all right, then, all right. So I've got Councillor Ferguson the first time, I've got Councillor Farr, I've got Councillor Whitehead, Back. I was, Ferguson? I, I, as first I speaker, I, I, I was going to refer it back, and I think I can do that under protest because uh, I know Council Pearson had spoken to it, so I, I think okay. I'd, I'd be happy to speed this thing up to refer it. Okay, Council Whitehead. Can I just ask part of the direction then? Um, because we, we, we were told that the 1.6 is this is the priority uh, that you picked, and I, I was just concerned that, and I mentioned bus shelters, and you indicated that uh, reasonably that we've already going off with 50 under the gas tax model. One of the biggest uh, uh, issues uh, that I'm, I'm receiving is, I know, but it's part of the direction. Can we look at? Uh, but l listen, because I, I want something to come back. On a public uh, works committee, do we have an adequate system in providing notification for cancellation of buses, where a bus is broken down or, or does, uh, can't show up? Because that's Com one of the way we're, we're dealing with the bikes. And, and we well, hang on. This is where I'm going, uh, Mister. I want to make sure that there's not any alternative uh, areas that we can take a 1.6 million dollar capital expenditure and, and improve on a system. Uh, as opposed to, as an alternative to this particular process. So it is, uh, um, it is 
correct for me to ask about it, see if that could be part of the direction in that committee meeting. Uh, the monies um, must be used for capital and concurrent with both the shelter expansion and this initiative, uh, subject to um, the approvals of Jerry and, and Chris, it is our intention to do some minor restructuring within transit division to take a, a current vacancy and create a new position that would uh, be responsible for our social media uh, development and our, our real-time uh, data initiative. So, in fact, we, we plan to work on all three initiatives. Uh, Appreciate that. That's, I was looking to see if there's a capital need there or not. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Whitehead. So, Don, we refer back to Public Works. When we, could we get it back? Any idea? I'm hoping I can commit Peter to the March 28th meeting. Peter, would you be able to turn something around in that time, given what you've heard today? Uh, I, I believe so. Can we take that as direction then, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Okay. March 28th. So, referred back, Councillor Barr? Yeah, thank you. No, just briefly, I, I, I would appreciate it coming back to all of us, to General Issues Committee, instead of Public works committee which I completely understand um, given that's where Don and Peter would report to but uh, it's a quick turnaround and my general issues committees are, are logged um, my public your public works committees are not and it's where it originated it's where I'd like it to uh, wrap up so we could have a fulsome discussion uh, respectfully I would ask that it come back to GIC and not public works Back to GIC's committee, okay with GIC? Yes? Okay, when would that be then? Any idea we could have that back to GIC? Don? I believe our next opportunity is late March, Mr. Deputy uh, Mayor, which is roughly the same timeline as Public Works. Okay, thanks, Don. The referral moved by Councillor Ferguson, second by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? Mary. Thank you. If I could, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, we need a resolution on the That's first right. staff report yeah. before. Uh, uh, Chair, one. Chair uh, if we could also get a motion to receive Peter's presentation. Okay. Moved by Councilor Pearson, second by Councilor Marula to receive Peter's presentation. All in favor? Mary. Okay, we're back to 5.1, and we need the resolution on that. So. All, all in favor of the referral? Back? Okay, thank you. <laughs> so we need to maintain quorum here, please. So we're back to 5.1. I need to maintain it, though. The problem is we have a tendency to leave. So where are we at on the motion now here? Councillor Collins. I have a, uh, an amendment, Mr. Chairman. It's to replace A1 with the following, 100% capital and any upset net operating levy impact for light rail transit. Add item D, that the request is outlined to Mr. John Howe, Metrolinx, from Mr. Don Hall, Director of Transportation, City of Hamilton, dated May 3rd, 2012, as directed by Council, General Issues Committee via Report 11-030, as amended on October 26th, 2011 be resubmitted and a formal response be requested uh, for Metrolinx or from that's the 5.1 and add item E that the medical officer of health be directed to consult with health care institutions to obtain their input on Hamilton specific health impacts for purposes of supporting the city's public transportation program as outlined in PW 13014 Council Council that's an amendment to our recommendation here before us in 5.1 you have a seconder on that? Jackson? Discussion? Five, yes, yes. Any discussion on that? All in favor of the amendment? Jerry. All in favor of the recommendation is amended? Jerry. Thank you. Yes. Don't leave. May I have a motion to adjourn? Councillor Pearson, Councillor Johnson. Thank you. Thank you for sticking it out today.